Introduction The following short book discusses some lessons from the life of the great companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The second rightly guided Caliph of Islam, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. Implementing the lessons discussed will aid a Muslim to achieve noble character. According to the narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2003, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised that the heaviest thing in the scales of Judgment Day will be noble character. It is one of the qualities of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which Allah, the Exalted, complimented in Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 of the Holy Quran. And indeed you are of a great moral character. Therefore, it is a duty on all Muslims to gain and act on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in order to achieve noble character. Life in Mecca before accepting Islam Importance of Education Even during the pre-Islamic days of ignorance, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, learned to read Arabic, which was very rare at that time. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 44. His attitude clearly indicates the importance of gaining and acting on knowledge. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2645, that when Allah, the Exalted, desires to give someone good, he provides them with Islamic knowledge. There is no doubt that every Muslim, irrespective of the strength of their faith, desires good in both worlds. Even though many Muslims incorrectly believe that this good which they desire lies in fame, wealth, authority, companionship, and their career, this narration makes it crystal clear that true lasting good lies in gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. It is important to note a branch of religious knowledge is useful, worldly knowledge, whereby one earns lawful provision in order to fulfill their necessities and the necessities of their dependents. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has pointed out where good lies, yet it is a shame how many Muslims do not place much value in this. They in most cases only strive to obtain the bare minimum of Islamic knowledge in order to fulfill their obligatory duties, and fail to acquire and act on more such as the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Instead they dedicate their efforts on worldly things believing true good is found there. Many Muslims fail to appreciate that the righteous predecessors had to journey for weeks on end just to learn a single verse or narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, whereas today one can study Islamic teachings without leaving their home. Yet, many fail to make use of this blessing given to the modern-day Muslims. Out of His infinite mercy Allah, the Exalted, through His Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has not only pointed out where true good lies, but He has also placed this good at one's fingertips. Allah, the Exalted, has informed mankind of where an eternal buried treasure is located, which can solve all the problems they may encounter in both worlds. But Muslims will only obtain this good once they struggle to acquire and act on it. Under your care Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, had a harsh childhood. He would tend to the camels of his father, Al-Khattab, who would exhaust him and beat him if he failed to complete his chores. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn Al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 45. The harsh treatment of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, during his childhood had a negative impact on him as he became a harsh adult during the pre-Islamic days of ignorance. Muslims must strive to avoid treating those under their care in this manner and instead fulfill the duty of raising them in the correct way, according to the teachings of Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2409, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advise that each person is a guardian and responsible for the things under their care. The greatest thing a Muslim is a guardian of is their faith. Therefore, they must strive to fulfill its responsibility by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. 
This guardianship also includes every blessing one has been granted by Allah, the Exalted, which includes external things such as wealth and internal things such as one's body. A Muslim must fulfill the responsibility of these things by using them in the way prescribed by Islam. For example, a Muslim should only use their eyes to look at lawful things and their tongue to utter only lawful and useful words. This guardianship also extends to others within one's life, such as relatives and friends. A Muslim must fulfill this responsibility by fulfilling their rights, such as providing for them and gently commanding good and forbidding evil, according to the teachings of Islam. One should not cut off from others, especially over worldly issues. Instead, they should continue to treat them kindly, hoping they will change for the better. This guardianship includes one's children. A Muslim must guide them by leading by example, as this by far is the most effective way in guiding children. They must obey Allah, the Exalted, practically as discussed earlier, and teach their children to do the same. To conclude, according to this narration, everyone has some sort of responsibility they have been entrusted with. So they should gain and act on the relevant knowledge in order to fulfill them, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. Ease after difficulties. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, had a harsh childhood. He would tend to the camels of his father, al Khattab, who would exhaust him and beat him if he failed to complete his chores. During his caliphate, he once mentioned his rough childhood and then commented that even though he faced that he was eventually taken to a stage where there was no person between him and Allah, the exalted, meaning no one had authority over him as he was the caliph. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 45. In a narration found in Musnad Ahmad, number 2803, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the importance of understanding that every difficulty a person faces will be followed by ease. This reality has also been mentioned in the Holy Quran for example, chapter 65 at Talak verse 7. Allah will bring about, after hardship, ease, i.e. relief. It is important for Muslims to understand this reality, as it gives rise to patience and even contentment. Being uncertain over the changes in circumstances, can lead one to impatience, ingratitude, and even towards unlawful things, such as unlawful provision. But the one who firmly believes all difficulties will eventually be replaced with ease, will patiently wait for this change, fully trusting in the teachings of Islam. This patience is much loved by Allah, the Exalted, and greatly rewarded. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 146 And Allah loves the steadfast. This is the reason Allah, the Exalted, has mentioned numerous examples within the Holy Quran when difficult situations were followed by ease and blessings. For example, the following verse of the Holy Quran mentions the great difficulty the Holy Prophet Na, peace be upon him, faced from his people and how Allah, the Exalted, saved him from the great flood. Chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verse 76 And mention Noah, when he called to Allah before that time, so we responded to him and saved him and his family from the great affliction, i.e. the flood. Another example is found in chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, Verse 69 We, i.e., Allah said, O fire be coolness and safety upon Abraham. The holy prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, faced a great difficulty in the form of a great fire, but Allah, the exalted, made it cool and peaceful for him. These examples and many more have been mentioned in the holy Quran and the narrations of the holy prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him so that Muslims understand that a moment of difficulty will eventually be followed by ease for those who obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Therefore, it is important for Muslims to study these Islamic teachings in order to observe the countless cases where Allah, the Exalted, granted ease to His obedient servants after they faced difficulties. If Allah, the Exalted, has saved his obedient servants from great difficulties mentioned in the divine teachings, then he can and will save the obedient Muslims facing smaller difficulties also. Importance of Earning 
During his childhood, Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, worked as a shepherd for his father and his aunts. Later on, he became a trader who undertook many business trips. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 45 to 47. This indicates the importance of earning one's lawful provision. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2072, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that no one has eaten anything better than from the earnings of their own hands. It is important for Muslims not to confuse laziness for trusting in Allah, the Exalted. Unfortunately, many Muslims turn away from working a lawful occupation, go on social benefits and inhabit the mosques claiming to trust in Allah, the Exalted, to provide for them. This is not trusting in Allah, the Exalted, at all. It is only laziness which contradicts the teachings of Islam. True trust in Allah, the Exalted, in respect to gaining wealth is to use the means Allah, the Exalted, provided a person, such as their physical strength, in order to obtain lawful wealth according to the teachings of Islam and then trust that Allah, the Exalted, will provide lawful wealth to them through these means. The aim of trusting in Allah, the Exalted, is not to cause one to give up using the means he has created, as this would make them useless, and Allah, the Exalted, does not create useless things. The purpose of trusting in Allah, the Exalted, is to prevent one from earning wealth through doubtful or unlawful means. As a Muslim should firmly believe their provision, which includes wealth, was allocated to them over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. This allocation cannot change under any circumstances. A Muslim's duty is to strive in obtaining this through lawful means which is the tradition of the Holy Prophets, peace be upon him. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2072. Using the means provided by Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of trusting in Allah, the Exalted, as he created them for this very purpose. A Muslim should therefore not be lazy while claiming trust in Allah, the Exalted, by going on social benefits when they have the means to earn lawful wealth through their own efforts and the means created and provided to them by Allah, the Exalted. Judging with Justice As Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was always eager to learn about the life, circumstances and customs of the Arabs, people would come to him to resolve their disputes. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al khattab His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 47. Judging between people is an important matter in Islam, therefore, one must always strive to be just in all their decisions. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4721, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that those who acted with justice will be sitting on thrones of light close to Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This includes those who are just in their decisions, in respect to their families and those under their care and authority. It is important for Muslims to always act with justice in all occasions. One must show justice to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must use all the blessings they have been granted, in the correct way, according to the teachings of Islam. This includes being just to their own body and mind, by fulfilling their rights of food and rest, as well as using each limb according to its true purpose. Islam does not teach Muslims to push their body and minds beyond their limits, thereby causing them self-harm. One should be just in respect to people, by treating them how they wish to be treated by others. They should never compromise on the teachings of Islam by committing injustice to people in order to obtain worldly things. This will be a major cause of people entering hell, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. They should remain just even if it contradicts their desires and the desires of their loved ones. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. Point one, so follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. 
one must be just towards their dependents by fulfilling their rights and necessities according to the teachings of Islam, which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. They should not be neglected nor handed over to others such as school and mosque teachers. A person should not take on this responsibility if they are too lazy to act with justice in regards to them. To conclude, no person is free of acting with justice, as the minimum is acting with justice in respect to Allah, the exalted, and oneself. Ambassadors of Islam As Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was wise, eloquent, well-spoken, strong, noble, and clear in speech. He was selected as the ambassador for the ruling tribe of Mecca, the Quraysh. If there was a dispute between the tribe of Quraysh and someone else, they would send Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to discuss the situation on their behalf. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 47 to 48. This should remind Muslims of their role as the ambassadors of Islam. It is extremely important for Muslims to fulfill this duty according to their potential. The best way to achieve this is by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and being patient with His choices. Islam spread across the entire globe because the righteous predecessors took this duty very seriously. When they gained and acted on beneficial knowledge, the outside world recognized the truthfulness of Islam through their behavior. This caused countless people to enter the fold of Islam. Unfortunately, many Muslims today believe that showing others about Islam is merely in one's appearance, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf. This is only an aspect of representing Islam. The greatest part is by adopting the characteristics of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed in the Holy Quran and his traditions. Only with this attitude will the outside world observe the true nature of Islam. A Muslim should always remember that adopting an Islamic appearance while possessing characteristics which oppose the teachings of Islam only causes the outside world to disrespect Islam. They will be held accountable for this disrespect as they are the cause of it. A Muslim should therefore behave as a true ambassador of Islam by adopting the inward teachings of Islam as well as the outer appearance of Islam. In addition, this important position should remind Muslims that they will be held accountable and questioned whether they fulfilled this role or not on Judgment Day. The same way a king would become angry at their diplomat and representative if they failed to fulfill their duty, so will Allah, the Exalted, become angry with the Muslim who fails to fulfill their duty as an ambassador of Islam. Worshipping Desires as Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was brought up in a harsh manner, and as he possessed a great love for the ways and customs of his people, he initially strongly opposed Islam. He feared Islam would disrupt the system that was established in Mecca, a system which gave Mecca its superiority amongst the Arab people. This system ensured the Meccans were treated with respect and was the reason for their prosperity. This is one of the main reasons why the rich and influential from the non-Muslims of Mecca opposed Islam the most. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 48. The truth is that each worshipper of false gods only worships their own desires. Their deities are just a physical manifestation of their desires which they worship. This is obvious as a person who worships a deity in the form of an idol knows that the lifeless idol cannot command them to live their life a certain way, so the worshipper themselves decides how they imagine their lifeless idol would like them to live. And this code of conduct is based on nothing but their own desires. Therefore, their worship of their desires is the root of their worship. The influential and rich are more drowned in this mentality as they are aware that accepting the truth meaning, Islam, will force them to live according to a specific code of conduct, which will prevent them from acting on their misguided desires. They advise others to follow them, as they do not wish to lose their influence and authority. This is why history has shown they were the first to reject and oppose the holy prophets, peace be upon them. Feeling Empathy 
As the violence of the non-Muslims of Mecca against the socially weak companions, may Allah be pleased with them, increased. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised some of them to migrate to Ethiopia. He advised them that their king was a just man and they would not face persecution there. Several companions, may Allah be pleased with them, departed, leaving behind their families, businesses and homes all for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 1 to 2. When a group from the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were heading out of Mecca, Umar Ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, questioned their activities. They told him they were leaving Mecca, as they were fed up of him and the other non-Muslims who constantly persecuted them. Instead of showing his typical harshness, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, spoke some kind words which gave them the impression he would miss them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 49 to 50. Even though Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was harsh with them, yet his harshness was not rooted in evil, rather, it was rooted in a misplaced loyalty to the non-Muslims of Mecca and their misguided ways. It seems he only behaved the way he did as he desired his people to be united, as they were before the coming of Islam. Generally speaking, having this type of empathy for others is an important aspect of Islam. It was most likely the first emotion which encouraged Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to rethink his attitude towards Islam, as his behavior was driving away his own people from their homes. Whereas many of the other non-Muslims of Mecca were only concerned about protecting their way of life out of greed for wealth and authority, and therefore they rejoiced over the departing companions, may Allah be pleased with them. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that the Muslim nation is like one body. If any part of the body suffers pain, the rest of the body shares in its pain. This narration, like many others, indicates the importance of not becoming so self-absorbed into one's own life, thereby behaving as if the universe revolves around them and their problems. The devil inspires a Muslim to focus so much on their own life and their problems, that they lose focus on the bigger picture, which leads to impatience and causes them to become heedless of others, thereby failing their duty in supporting others according to their means. A Muslim should always bear this in mind and strive to aid others as much as they can. This extends to beyond financial help and includes all verbal and physical help such as good and sincere advice. Muslims should regularly observe the news and those who are in difficult situations all over the world. This will inspire them to avoid becoming self-centered and instead aid others. In reality, the one who only cares about themselves is lower in rank than an animal, as even they care about their offspring. In fact, a Muslim should be better than animals by practically caring for others beyond their own family. Even though a Muslim cannot remove all the problems of the world, but they can play their part and help others according to their means, as this is what Allah, the Exalted, commands and expects. Supporting Islam Shortly before Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, accepted Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, supplicated to Allah, the Exalted, to support Islam through whoever out of the following two men was dearer to him, Abu Jahl or Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. The most dearer to him was Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3681. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, supported Islam as he adopted sincerity. Muslims must follow in his footsteps. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, his book, meaning the Holy Quran, to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to the leaders of society and to the general public. Sincerity towards Allah, the Exalted, includes fulfilling all the duties given by him in the form of commands and prohibitions solely for his pleasure. As confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one, all will be judged by their intention. 
So if one is not sincere towards Allah, the exalted, when performing good deeds they will gain no reward in this world or in the next. In fact, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154, those who performed insincere deeds will be told on Judgment Day to seek their reward from those who they acted for, which will not be possible. Chapter 98 al bayna verse 5 And they were not commanded except to worship Allah, being sincere to him in religion. If one is lax in fulfilling their duties towards Allah, the exalted, it proves a lack of sincerity. Therefore, they should sincerely repent and struggle to fulfill them all. It is important to bear in mind Allah, the exalted, never burdens one with duties they cannot perform or handle. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 286 Allah does not charge a soul, except with that within its capacity. Being sincere towards Allah, the exalted, means that one should always choose his pleasure over the pleasure of themselves and others. A Muslim should always give priority to those actions which are for the sake of Allah, the exalted, over all else. One should love others and dislike their sins for the sake of Allah, the exalted, and not for the sake of their own desires. When they help others or refuse to take part in sins, it should be for the sake of Allah, the exalted. The one who adopts this mentality has perfected their faith. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. Sincerity towards the Holy Quran includes having deep respect and love for the words of Allah, the Exalted. This sincerity is proven when one fulfills the three aspects of the Holy Quran. The first is to recite it correctly and regularly. The second is to understand its teachings through a reliable source and teacher. The final aspect is to act on the teachings of the Holy Quran with the aim of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. The sincere Muslim gives priority to acting on its teachings over acting on their desires which contradict the Holy Quran. Modeling one's character on the Holy Quran is the sign of true sincerity towards the Book of Allah, the Exalted. This is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1342. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship, and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 And indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 al hash verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31 Say, if you should love Allah then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is being sincere to the leaders of the community. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, narration number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. 
Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. The final thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is sincerity towards the general public. This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people that one is pleased when they are happy and sad whenever they are grieved as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better, even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra verse 53 Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77 And do good as Allah has done good to you. Steadfastness in faith Prior to accepting Islam, Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was encouraged to kill the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by the leaders of the non-Muslims of Mecca. When he left their meeting with his sword, searching for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he met Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, who attempted to direct his attention away from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He rebuked Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, by informing him that members of his own family had accepted Islam, his sister, brother-in-law and cousin. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then headed for his sister's house. He overheard them reciting the Holy Quran, and after entering her house, they initially denied what they were doing. Eventually, they defiantly declared their Islam, 
Even though it led to them being beaten by Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 51 to 53. Even in the face of violence and oppression, the sister of Umar, Fatima bint al-Khattab, and her husband Said, may Allah be pleased with them, remained firm on their faith. In life, a Muslim will always face either times of ease or times of difficulty. No one only experiences times of ease without experiencing some difficulties. But the thing to note is that even though difficulties by definition are hard to deal with, they are in fact a means to obtain and demonstrate one's true greatness and servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, in the majority of cases people learn more important life lessons when they face difficulties than when they face times of ease. And people often change for the better after experiencing times of difficulty than times of ease. One only needs to reflect on this in order to understand this truth. In fact, if one studies the Holy Quran, they will realize the majority of the events discussed involve difficulties. This indicates that true greatness does not lie in always experiencing times of ease. It in fact lies in experiencing difficulties while remaining obedient to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is proven by the fact that each of the great difficulties discussed in Islamic teachings end with ultimate success for those who obeyed Allah, the Exalted. So a Muslim should not be bothered about facing difficulties, as these are just moments for them to shine while acknowledging their true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, through sincere obedience. This is the key to ultimate success in both worlds. Avoiding Stubbornness Prior to accepting Islam, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was encouraged to kill the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by the leaders of the non-Muslims of Mecca. When he left their meeting with his sword, searching for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he met Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, who attempted to direct his attention away from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He rebuked Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, by informing him that members of his own family had accepted Islam, his sister, brother-in-law and cousin. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then headed for his sister's house. He overheard them reciting the Holy Quran, and after entering her house, they initially denied what they were doing. Eventually, they defiantly declared their Islam, even though it led to them being beaten by Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. Eventually, Umar, may be pleased with him, calmed down and requested his sister to show him what they were reciting. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 51 to 53. After witnessing the steadfastness of his relatives, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, put aside his stubbornness and decided to properly investigate their belief. Some adopt stubbornness in worldly matters, and as a result they do not change their character for the better. Instead, they remain steadfast on their attitude, believing this is somehow a sign of their great strength and wisdom. Steadfastness in matters of faith is a praiseworthy attitude, but in most worldly matters it is only called stubbornness, which is blameworthy. Unfortunately, some believe if they change their attitude it demonstrates weakness, or it shows that they are admitting their fault, and because of this, they stubbornly fail to change for the better. Adults behave like immature children by believing that if they change their behavior, it means they have lost, while others who remain steadfast on their attitude have won. This is simply childish. In reality, an intelligent person will remain steadfast on matters of faith, but in worldly matters they will change their attitude as long as it is not sinful, in order to make their life easier. So changing to improve one's life is not a sign of weakness, it is in fact a sign of intelligence. In many cases, a person refuses to change their attitude and expects others in their life to change theirs, such as their relatives. But what often occurs is that due to stubbornness, all remain in the same state, which only leads to regular disagreements and arguments. A wise person understands that if the people around them do not change for the better than they should, this change will improve the quality of their life and their relationship with others, which is much better than going around in circular arguments with people. 
This positive attitude will eventually cause others to respect them, as it takes real strength to change one's character for the better. Those who remain stubborn will always find something to be annoyed about which will remove peace from their life. This will cause further difficulties in all aspects of their life, such as their mental health. But those who adapt and change for the better will always move from one station of peace to another. If one achieves this peace, does it really matter if others believe they only changed because they were wrong? To conclude, to remain steadfast on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is praiseworthy. But in worldly matters and in cases where no sin is committed, a person should learn to adapt and change their attitude so that they find some peace in this world. True Belief Prior to accepting Islam, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was encouraged to kill the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by the leaders of the non-Muslims of Mecca. When he left their meeting with his sword, searching for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he met Nu'aym ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, who attempted to direct his attention away from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He rebuked Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, by informing him that members of his own family had accepted Islam, his sister, brother-in-law and cousin. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then headed for his sister's house. He overheard them reciting the Holy Quran, and after entering her house, they initially denied what they were doing. Eventually, they defiantly declared their Islam, even though it led to them being beaten by Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. Eventually, Umar, may be pleased with him, calmed down and requested his sister to show him what they were reciting. She commanded him to first wash himself, as he was unclean. After doing that, he took the paper that they were reciting and began to recite chapter 20 Taha of the Holy Quran. During his recitation, the light of faith penetrated his spiritual heart. He then asked about the whereabouts of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Kabab, may Allah be pleased with him, was hiding within their home and after witnessing the truth penetrating the spiritual heart of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he revealed himself and told him about the supplication of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, made for his guidance or the guidance of Abu Jahl. This supplication has been discussed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3681. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then headed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who was with his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. When he reached the place, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were initially scared but let him in. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, seized him desiring to protect the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but the latter commanded them to let him go. Then the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, inquired about his intention, at which point Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, declared his Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 51 to 56. It is obvious from the life of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that when he accepted Islam, he not only verbally declared faith in it, but practically followed and obeyed its teachings. This must be the attitude of every Muslim. Disbelief can be a literal rejecting of Islam or through actions, which involves disobeying Allah, the Exalted, even though one believes in Him. This can be clearly understood by an example. If an unaware person is warned by another of an approaching lion, and the unaware person takes practical steps to obtain safety, they will be considered someone who believed in the warning given to them as they adapted their behavior based on the warning. Whereas, if the unaware person does not practically change their behavior after being warned, people will suspect that they do not believe in the warning given to them, even if the unaware person verbally claims belief in the warning given to them. Some people claim that their belief and obedience to their God is in their hearts, and they therefore do not need to demonstrate it practically. Unfortunately, this foolish mentality has infected many Muslims who believe they possess a pure faithful heart, even though they fail to fulfill the obligatory duties of Islam. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
peace and blessings be upon him, has clearly declared in a narration found in Sunan ibn Rajah, number 3984, that when one's heart is pure, the body becomes pure, which means their actions become correct. But if one's heart is corrupt, the body becomes corrupt, which means their actions will be corrupt and incorrect. Therefore, the one who does not obey Allah, the exalted, by fulfilling their duties practically, can never have a pure heart. In addition, demonstrating one's faith in Allah, the exalted, practically is their proof and evidence which is required on judgment day in order to be granted paradise. Not having this practical evidence is as silly as a student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming their knowledge is in their mind, so they therefore do not need to write it down by answering the exam questions. The same way this student would undoubtedly fail, so will a person who reaches judgment day without the obedience of Allah, the exalted, in the form of fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience, even if they possess faith in their heart. Recognizing good from evil. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, fully understood the ways and customs of the pre-Islamic days of ignorance and out of love for them and the worldly benefits they brought, he defended them with all his strength. But after accepting Islam, he understood its beauty and true nature and therefore recognized the clear difference between good and evil, guidance and misguidance, and truth and falsehood. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 48. This indicates the importance of gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge, as ignorance prevents one from recognizing good from evil and truth from falsehood. A great distraction which prevents one from submitting to the obedience of Allah, the exalted, is ignorance. It can be argued that it is the origin of every sin, as the one who truly knows the consequences of sins would never commit them. This refers to true beneficial knowledge, which is knowledge that is acted upon. In reality, all knowledge which is not acted on is not beneficial knowledge. The example of the one who behaves in this manner is described in the Holy Quran as a donkey which carries books of knowledge which do not benefit it. Chapter 62 Al-Jumu'ah, verse 5 And then did not take it on, did not act upon knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. A person who ACTS on their knowledge rarely slips up and commits sins intentionally. In fact, when this occurs it is only caused by a moment of ignorance where a person forgets to act on their knowledge which results in them sinning. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once highlighted the seriousness of ignorance in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2322. He declared that everything in the material world is cursed except for the remembrance of Allah, the exalted, whatever is connected to this remembrance, the scholar and the student of knowledge. This means that all the blessings in the material world will become a curse for the one who is ignorant, as they will misuse them thereby committing sins. In fact, ignorance can be considered a person's worst enemy as it prevents them from protecting themselves from harm and gaining benefit, all of which can only be achieved through acting on knowledge. The ignorant commits sins without being aware of them. How can one avoid a sin if they do not know what is considered a sin? Ignorance causes one to neglect their obligatory duties. How can one fulfill their duties if they are unaware of what their duties are? It is therefore a duty on all Muslims to gain enough knowledge to fulfill all their obligatory duties and avoid sins. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 224. Life in Mecca after accepting Islam Choosing a different path After accepting Islam, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, visited his maternal uncle Abu Jal. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, told him that he had accepted Islam. Abu Jal angrily returned into his home and slammed the door in his face. The same thing happened when he visited another nobleman from amongst the non-Muslims of Mecca. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 57. It is important to understand that generally when one chooses a path which is different from the path of others, such as their relatives and friends, they will face criticism and resistance from them. 
In fact, the majority of criticism comes from a person's relatives. For example, when a Muslim decides to concentrate more on acting on the teachings of Islam, and if it is something their family have not pursued themselves, then they will face criticism from them. They will be labeled foolish and extreme by those who they believe would support them on their path. It is important for Muslims to remain steadfast on the lawful path they choose and trust in the help of Allah, the Exalted, through sincere obedience by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience in order to overcome these difficulties. This is a common reaction from people, for when a person chooses a different path in life from others, it makes them feel as if their path is bad or evil, and this is the reason the person has chosen a different path. Even though the person does not believe this, but only chooses a different path believing it is better for them, yet they will still face criticism. It is the same reason all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, were criticized by their people as they chose and passively invited others to a different better path. To conclude, as long as one's path in life is lawful, they should remain steadfast and not be deterred by the criticism of others. But this does not mean they should not try to improve their situation and character. It means they should not be deterred from pursuing their lawful choice according to the teachings of Islam. Minding your business. After accepting Islam, Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, went around the gatherings of the non-Muslims, which were close to the house of Allah, the exalted, the Kaaba, announcing his conversion to Islam. Each time he would announce to a group his conversion to Islam, they would attack him, but he would repel them, as he was a strong man. This went on for some time, and eventually a nobleman from the non-Muslims of Mecca, Al-As ibn Wa'i as Sami, inquired about what was going on. He was told Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, had accepted Islam. He replied that they should leave him alone, as a person should be free to choose their own religion. He added that if they killed Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, his tribe, the Banu Adi, would take revenge on his behalf. So as a result, the non-Muslims left him alone. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 57 to 58. Al-As might have been a non-Muslim, yet he spoke the truth. Minding one's business is a key branch of Islam. In a narration found in Jami at Termidi, number 2317, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a Muslim cannot make their Islam excellent until they avoid the things which do not concern them. This narration contains an all-encompassing advice which should be applied to every aspect of one's life. It includes a person's speech as well as their other physical actions. It means that a Muslim who desires to perfect their faith must avoid those things through speech and actions which do not concern them. And instead they must occupy themselves with those things that do. One should take the things that concern them very seriously and strive to fulfill the responsibilities which accompany them according to the teachings of Islam solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. It is important to note that one would not be perfecting their faith if they avoided things according to their own thinking or desires. But the one who perfects their faith avoids the things which Islam has advised to avoid. Meaning, one should strive to fulfill all their duties, avoid all sins and the things which are disliked in Islam, and even avoid the excess use of unnecessary lawful things. Achieving this excellence is a characteristic of the excellence of faith, mentioned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 99. This is when one ACTS and worships Allah, the Exalted, as if they can observe Him, or they at least become fully aware of Allah, the Exalted, observing their every thought and action. Being aware of this divine surveillance will encourage a Muslim to always abstain from sins and hasten towards righteous deeds. The one who does not avoid the things which do not concern them will not reach this level of excellence. A major aspect of avoiding the things which do not concern a person is linked to speech. The majority of sins occur when a person utters words which do not concern them, such as backbiting and slander. The definition of vain talk is when a person utters words which may not be sinful but are useless and therefore not their concern. As confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2408, vain speech is hated by Allah, the Exalted. 
Countless arguments, fights and even physical harm have occurred simply because someone spoke about something which did not concern them. Many families have become divided. Many marriages have ended because someone did not mind their business. It is why Allah, the Exalted, has advised in the Holy Quran the different types of useful speech which people should concern themselves with. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 114. No good is there in much of their private conversation, except for those who enjoin charity or that which is right or conciliation between people. And whoever does that seeking means to the approval of Allah, then we are going to give him a great reward. In fact, uttering words which are not a person's concern will be the main reason people enter hell. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2616. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2412, that all speech will be counted against a person unless it is connected to advising good, forbidding evil, or the remembrance of Allah, the Exalted. This means that all other forms of speech are not a person's concern, as they will not benefit them. It is important to note that advising good encompasses anything which is beneficial in one's worldly and religious life, such as their occupation. Therefore, Muslims should strive to avoid the things which do not concern them through words and actions, so that they can perfect their faith. Put simply, the one who dedicates time to the things which do not concern them will fail in the things which do concern them. And the one who occupies themselves with the things which do concern them will not find time to spend on the things which do not concern them. Meaning they will achieve success through the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. Acting on the Truth When Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, accepted Islam, he convinced the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to pray openly at the house of Allah, the Exalted, the Kaaba, in Mecca, with the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. This was not possible to do before, as their numbers, social power and influence was too small and weak. The non-Muslims of Mecca dared not to attack them when they saw Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, with them. After this the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave the title of Al-Faruq to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, meaning the one who distinguishes between truth and falsehood. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hiliyat al awliya number 63. Muslims must strive to follow in his footsteps by adopting truthfulness in all aspects of their lives. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, 
according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Protecting yourself. As the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were socially weak, they could not pray at the house of Allah, the Exalted, the Kaaba, until Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, became Muslim. When he became Muslim, he defended the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, from harm, and kept fighting the non-Muslims of Mecca, until they left the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, alone. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 59. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1931, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever protects the honor of another will be protected from hellfire by Allah, the Exalted. Just like a Muslim would desire others to protect their honor in their presence or absence, they should protect the honor of others in their presence or absence also. In fact, Loving for others what one desires for themselves is the characteristic of a true believer, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. A Muslim should protect the honor of others when anyone else speaks ill about them, such as backbiting or slander, irrespective of if what they are saying is true or not. This is an aspect of concealing the faults of others which leads to Allah, the Exalted, concealing their faults in both worlds. This is advised in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 225. Behaving in such a manner is a clear proof of one's love for others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, which is a characteristic which leads to paradise, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2688. The main narration under discussion clearly shows that a Muslim benefits from supporting others, so even if they are too preoccupied from caring about others, they should at least act in this manner, for their own sake. But the one who fails to defend the honor of others when they have the opportunity and strength to do so, without fear of harm, should fear that Allah, the Exalted, will not protect their honor in a time and place where it is being violated by others and especially on the day of resurrection. Finally, as the main narration under discussion advises protecting the honor of others, it indirectly indicates the importance of not violating the honor of others. This is in fact the very sign of a true Muslim and believer, according to a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4998. Specifically, it advises that a true Muslim and believer keeps their verbal and physical harm away from the self and possessions of others. The Migration After the violence against the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Escalated further, he gave the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, permission to migrate to Medina. Covertly, they began to migrate to Medina, leaving behind everything they owned and knew. The only person who did not migrate in secret was Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. When he decided to migrate, he put on his sword, put his bow over his shoulder, picked up his arrows and carried his stick by his side. He went out to the house of Allah, the Exalted, the Kaaba, where the non-Muslims were sitting, and circumambulated the Kaaba, and prayed behind the station of Ibrahim, peace be upon him. Then he went to each of the gatherings of the non-Muslims, and told them he was migrating, and whoever desired to make their mother bereft of himself, his child an orphan, and his wife a widow, should meet him behind a valley. No one dared to challenge him to a fight. Instead, a few weak and oppressed people followed him, and he taught them about Islam, and then left Mecca and headed for Medina, with a handful of companions, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 60. It is important for Muslims to understand that Allah, the Exalted, does not demand Muslims to overcome the difficulties which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, endured. For example, they migrated from Mecca to Medina, whereby they left behind their families, homes, businesses, and migrated to a strange land all for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In comparison, the difficulties Muslims face now are not as difficult as those the righteous predecessors faced. 
Muslims should therefore be grateful that they are only required to make a few small sacrifices, such as sacrificing some sleep to offer the obligatory dawn prayer and some wealth to donate the obligatory charity. Allah, the Exalted, is not commanding them to leave their homes and families for His sake. This gratitude must be shown practically by using the blessings one possesses in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, when a Muslim faces difficulties, they should remember the difficulties the righteous predecessors faced and how they overcame them through steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This knowledge can provide a Muslim the strength to overcome their difficulties, as they know the righteous predecessors were more beloved to Allah, the Exalted, yet they endured more severe difficulties with patience. In fact, a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4023, advises that the holy prophets, peace be upon them, endured the most difficult of tests, and they are undoubtedly the most beloved to Allah, the Exalted. If a Muslim follows the steadfast attitude of the righteous predecessors, it is hoped they will end up with them in the hereafter. Life in Medina, during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Sincerity to others After migrating to Medina, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed that two non-Muslims from Mecca, Abu Jahl ibn Hisham and Al-Harith ibn Hisham, visited Medina in order to convince their Muslim half-brother, Ayash ibn Abi Rabia, may Allah be pleased to him, to return to Mecca with them. They promised him they did not desire to harm him, and only wanted him to return to Mecca to visit their mother, who had sworn not to look after herself until she saw him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was perceptive and understood the two non-Muslims were plotting a scheme against Ayash, may Allah be pleased with him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, told him not to go with them. Out of love for his mother, Ayash, may Allah be pleased with him, desired to go to Mecca and commented that he would also bring some of his wealth back from Mecca to Medina after seeing his mother. In order to discourage him, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, offered him half his wealth. But Ayash, may Allah be pleased with him, still refused to stay in Medina. Finally, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, gave him his own fast camel and warned him to immediately flee from the non-Muslims of Mecca if he suspected them of treachery. On the way back to Mecca, Ayash, may Allah be pleased with him, was betrayed and kidnapped. They tortured him until he gave up Islam and returned to his former religion. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that Allah, the Exalted, would never accept the repentance of a person who apostatized. Later on, after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the following verses were revealed about those who apostatized. Chapter 39 as Zuma, verses 53 to 55. Say, O my servants who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is He who is the forgiving, the merciful. And return in repentance to your Lord and submit to Him before the punishment comes upon you, then you will not be helped. And follow the best of what was revealed to you from your Lord, i.e., the Quran, before the punishment comes upon you suddenly while you do not perceive. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him then wrote these verses down and sent them to those who were tortured and forced to apostatize. They sincerely repented and eventually managed to migrate to Medina to join their Muslim brothers. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 61 to 64. In every step, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, showed complete sincerity to his Muslim brothers. He first warned Ayash, may Allah be pleased with him, not to go with the two non-Muslims back to Mecca, and even offered half his wealth to keep him in Medina. He even gave him his own camel to travel on. Finally, he sent these verses of the Holy Quran to them, in order to encourage them to sincerely repent and re-enter the fold of Islam. This sincerity to others is a key aspect of Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the general public. 
This includes desiring the best for them at all times and showing this through one's words and actions. It includes advising others to do good, forbidding them from evil, to be merciful and kind to others at all times. This can be summed up by a single narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 170. It warns that one cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they desire for themselves. Being sincere to people is so important that according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 57, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, placed this duty next to establishing the obligatory prayer and donating the obligatory charity. From this narration alone, one can understand its importance as it has been placed with two vital obligatory duties. It is a part of sincerity towards people that one is pleased when they are happy and sad, whenever they are grieved, as long as their attitude does not contradict the teachings of Islam. A high level of sincerity includes one going to extreme limits to make the lives of others better, even if this puts themselves in difficulty. For example, one may sacrifice purchasing certain things in order to donate the wealth to the needy. Desiring and striving to always unite people on good is a part of sincerity towards others. Whereas, dividing others is a characteristic of the devil. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 53. Satan certainly seeks to sow discord among them. One way of uniting people is to veil the faults of others and advise them privately against sins. The one who ACTS in this way will have their sins veiled by Allah, the Exalted. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1426. Whenever possible, one should advise and teach the aspects of religion and the important aspects of the world to others so that both their worldly and religious lives improve. A proof of one's sincerity to others is that they support them in their absence for example, from the slander of others. Turning away from others and only worrying about oneself is not the attitude of a Muslim. In fact, this is how most animals behave. Even if one cannot change the whole society, they can still be sincere in helping those in their life, such as their relatives and friends. Simply put, one must treat others how they desire people to treat them. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 77 And do good as Allah has done good to you. Brotherhood The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, established brotherhood between his fellow emigrants, the Mahajirin, and the helpers, the answers, may Allah be pleased with them all. He advised them to become brothers in the cause of Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 215. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, established a bond of brotherhood between Umar ibn Khattab and three other companions, Uwaym ibn Sa'ada, Utban ibn Malik and Mu'ad ibn Afra, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 66. With the passing of time, people become divided and lose the strong connection they once had with one another. There are many causes of this, but a major cause is the foundation on which their connection was formed by their parents and relatives. It is commonly known that when the foundation of a building is weak, the building will either get damaged over time or even collapse. Similarly, when the foundation of bonds connecting people are not correct, the bonds between them will eventually weaken or even break. When the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, brought the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, Together he formed the bonds between them for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, most Muslims today bring people together for the sake of tribalism, brotherhood and to show off to other families. Even though the majority of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were not related, but as the foundation of the bonds connecting them was correct namely, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, their bonds grew from strength to strength. Whereas, many Muslims nowadays are related by blood yet, with the passing of time, become separated, as the foundation of their bonds was based on falsehood namely, tribalism and similar things. Muslims must understand that if desire for their bonds to endure and to earn reward for fulfilling the important duty of upholding the ties of kinship and the rights of non-relatives, 
then they must only forge bonds for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The foundation of this is that people only connect with one another and act together in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This has been commanded in the Holy Quran. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Sensible questions Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was not shy of expressing his opinion and asking the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, questions when he was unsure about matters. But he always observed the right manners when doing so and asked sensible questions and expressed sensible opinions which were rooted in Islamic knowledge. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 75. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 3257, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned against asking too many questions as this led to the destruction of the past nations. Muslims should instead do what they have been commanded according to their capacity and refrain from what they have been prohibited from. Muslims should not adopt this mentality as people who have a habit of asking too many questions often fail in fulfilling their duties and acquiring beneficial knowledge as they are too busy asking and researching about less important and sometimes irrelevant information. This mentality can inspire a person to argue and debate over these types of issues also. Unfortunately, this attitude is quite widespread amongst Muslims today, as they often argue about non-obligatory and less important issues instead of concentrating on fulfilling their obligatory duties and the established traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, correctly meaning fulfilling them with their full etiquettes and conditions. A Muslim should instead research and query about topics which are relevant and important to understand for both worldly and religious matters. Otherwise, they will follow in the footsteps of the people mentioned in this narration and only make their own lives more difficult. Deep Understanding As Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, strive to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, he was granted a deep understanding of Islam, an understanding matched only by a few. He reached such a level that his opinions and statements were often confirmed through divine revelation. It is why Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that there was an angel who spoke with the tongue of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al Aulia, number 64. In a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 402, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that three of his opinions were confirmed through divine revelation. The first was his desire to take the station of the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, at Mecca, as a place of offering prayer. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verses 125. And take, O believers, from the standing place of Abraham a place of prayer. The second was his advice to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, desired the wives of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the mother of the believers, may Allah be pleased with them, to veil themselves from men, as both good and bad men would visit the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and would therefore inevitability interact with his wives. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed chapter 24 and Nur, verse 31. And tell the believing women to reduce some of their vision and guard their private parts and not expose their adornment except that which necessarily appears there of three, and to wrap a portion of their head covers over their chests and not expose their adornment, i.e. beauty except to their husbands, their fathers, their husbands' fathers, their sons, their husbands' sons, their brothers, their brothers' sons, their sisters' sons, their women, that which their right hands possess, i.e. slaves, or those male attendants having no physical desire, or children who are not yet aware of the private aspects of women. And let them not stamp their feet to make known what they conceal of their adornment. And turn to Allah in repentance all of you, O believers, that you might succeed. And chapter 33 Al-Azab, verse 59. O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to bring down over themselves part of their outer garments. 
The third time is when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was facing some stress from his wives. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, warned them that perhaps he would divorce them all, and Allah, the Exalted, would give him wives better than them. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed chapter 66 at Tarim, verse 5. Perhaps his Lord, if he divorced you all, would substitute for him wives better than you, submitting to Allah believing, devoutly obedient, repentant, worshipping and travelling ones previously married and virgins. Muslims must strive to emulate the zeal of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, by gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge in order to obtain a deep understanding of Islam. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever follows a path seeking knowledge, Allah, the Exalted, will make the path to paradise easy for them. This indicates both a physical path someone takes seeking knowledge, such as attending lectures and classes, and a path whereby someone seeks knowledge without a physical journey. It encompasses all forms of knowledge, such as listening, reading, studying and writing about knowledge. The path to paradise has many obstacles, preventing a Muslim from reaching it. Only the one who possesses knowledge of them, and how to overcome them, will reach paradise safely. In addition, it easily understood that a person cannot reach a city in this world without knowledge of its location and the route which leads to it. Similarly, paradise cannot be obtained without knowing these things about it, such as the path leading to it. But the important thing to note is that a Muslim's intention to seek and act on knowledge must be to please Allah, the Exalted. Whoever seeks religious knowledge for a worldly reason, such as showing off, will end up in hell if they fail to sincerely repent. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 253. In addition, a Muslim must strive to act on their knowledge as knowledge without action is of no value or benefit. This is like the one who possesses knowledge of a path to safety, but does not take it and instead remains in an area full of dangers. This is why knowledge can be split into two categories. The first is when one ACTS on their knowledge, which leads to piety and an increase in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The second is when one fails to act on their knowledge. This type will not increase one's obedience to Allah, the Exalted. In fact, it will only increase them in arrogance, believing they are superior to others, even though they are like donkeys which carry books that do not benefit it. Chapter 62 al Jumu'ah, verse 5 and then did not take it on, did not act on their knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. Just punishment. As Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, strived to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, he was granted a deep understanding of Islam, an understanding matched only by a few. He reached such a level that his opinions and statements were often confirmed through divine revelation. It is why Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that there was an angel who spoke with the tongue of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's, Hiliyat al Aulia, number 64. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, consulted his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, on what to do with their prisoners of war. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, advised to execute them for their many crimes and ACTS of war. But the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, disliked this suggestion. Then, Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, suggested to pardon them from execution and instead allow them to purchase their own freedom. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was pleased with this advice and acted on it. The next day, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, found the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, weeping. When he questioned their behavior, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commented that Allah, the Exalted, had shown him the punishment that would have afflicted them for taking ransom for the prisoners instead of executing them. 
Then Allah, the Exalted, revealed chapter 8 Al-Anval, verses 67 to 68. It is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah's enemies in the land. You, i.e., some Muslims desire the commodities of this world, but Allah desires for you the hereafter. And Allah is exalted in might and wise. If not for a decree from Allah that proceeded, you would have been touched for what you took by a great punishment. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 305 and in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4588. Executing the prisoners was a just punishment for their crimes and would have acted as a strong deterrent against the violent behavior of the non-Muslims of Mecca. This deterrent in the long run might have prevented further battles thereby saving lives. Generally speaking, it is important to learn that no matter how much physical or social strength a person has, a day will certainly come when they face the consequences of their actions. In most cases, this occurs during their life where the actions of a person leads them to trouble, such as prison, and eventually they will face the consequences of their actions in the hereafter, as well. This applies to all people not just leaders. A Muslim should therefore never mistreat others, such as their relatives. They should learn a lesson from the tyrannical leaders of history who were greater in strength than them yet. A day certainly came when their strength did not benefit them and they faced the consequences of their evil deeds. Social influence and strength are fickle things as they quickly pass from person to person thereby, never remaining with anyone for long. Therefore, a Muslim who possesses such strength should use it in a way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, by benefiting themselves and others. But if they abuse their authority, then they will eventually face a punishment which no one can protect them from. In addition, it is important not to abuse one's authority as it may cause them to be hurled into hell on judgment day. Every oppressor will have to give their righteous deeds to their victims and if necessary take the sins of their victims until justice is established. This will cause many oppressors to be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should never forget to hold themselves accountable for their deeds. Those who do will avoid disobeying Allah, the Exalted, and harming others. But those who do not judge themselves will continue disobeying Allah, the Exalted, and harming others heedlessly, not knowing that in actual fact they are only harming themselves. But when they realize this fact, it will be too late for them to escape punishment. Perfecting Faith as Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, strive to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, he was granted a deep understanding of Islam, an understanding matched only by a few. He reached such a level that his opinions and statements were often confirmed through divine revelation. It is why Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that there was an angel who spoke with the tongue of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya number 64. In the ninth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Ubay, died. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, regularly visited him during his final illness in the hope he would sincerely repent and become a true Muslim. He however did not repent and died a hypocrite. His son Abdullah bin Abdullah bin Ubay, may Allah be pleased with him, requested the shirt of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so he could wrap his father's body with it. In addition, he requested him to lead the funeral prayer for his father. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave his shirt and rose to lead the funeral prayer. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, took hold of his gown and urged him not to lead the funeral prayer of the man who stopped at nothing in trying to destroy Islam and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, even reminded the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, of the verse which clearly states that even if he sought forgiveness for the hypocrites 70 times Allah, the Exalted, would not forgive them. Chapter 9 at Torbah, verse 80. 
ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them. If you should ask forgiveness for them seventy times, never will Allah forgive them. That is because they disbelieved in Allah and his messenger, and Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that he would seek forgiveness for him more than seventy times. He then led his funeral prayer. Allah, the Exalted, then forbade him from doing this in the future. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 84. And do not pray the funeral prayer over any of them who has died ever or stand at his grave. Indeed, they disbelieved in Allah and his messenger and died while they were defiantly disobedient. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, pages 46 to 47, and in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3097. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, behaved in such a manner out of love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and due to his perfect faith. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the characteristics which perfect a Muslim's faith. The first is to love for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This includes desiring what is best for others in both worldly and religious matters. This must be practically shown through one's actions meaning supporting others financially, emotionally and physically within one's means. Counting one's favors to others not only cancels the reward, but also proves their lack of love for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, as this person only loves gaining praise and other forms of compensation from people. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264 O you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. Any type of negative feelings towards others over worldly reasons, such as envy, contradicts loving others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and must be avoided. To sum up, this noble quality includes loving for others what one loves for themselves through actions not just words. This is an aspect of being a true believer, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. The next characteristic mentioned in the main narration under discussion is to hate for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This means one should dislike the things Allah, the Exalted, dislikes such as his disobedience. It is important to note, this does not mean one should hate others as people can sincerely repent to Allah, the Exalted. Instead, a Muslim should dislike the sin itself, which is proven by them avoiding it and warning others against it also. Muslims should continue to advise others instead of breaking ties with them, as this act of kindness may well cause them to sincerely repent. This includes not disliking things based on one's own feelings, such as an action which is lawful. Finally, the proof of one disliking for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is that when they show their dislike through their words and actions, it will never be in a way which contradicts the teachings of Islam. Meaning, their dislike for something will never cause them to commit a sin, as this would prove that their dislike for something is for their own sake. Visiting others As Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, strive to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, he was granted a deep understanding of Islam, an understanding matched only by a few. He reached such a level that his opinions and statements were often confirmed through divine revelation. It is why Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that there was an angel who spoke with the tongue of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al Aulia, number 64. Once the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sent a slave to Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. The slave entered his house without permission, while Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was sleeping, and part of his body was uncovered. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him expressed his desire to receive commands and prohibitions from Allah, the Exalted, regarding visiting each other. Then Allah, the Exalted, revealed chapter 24 and Nur, verse 58. O you who have believed, let those whom your right hands possess and those who have not yet reached puberty among you ask permission of you before entering at three times, 
before the dawn prayer and when you put aside your clothing for rest at noon and after the night prayer. These are three times of privacy for you. Generally speaking, it is important for a Muslim to fulfill the etiquettes and conditions of visiting others according to the teachings of Islam in order to obtain their reward. They should not stay long, thereby causing trouble to the host and their relatives. In this day and age, it is easy to contact the host and their family beforehand in order to ensure they visit them at the appropriate time. They should control their actions and speech so that they avoid all types of sins such as gossiping, backbiting and slandering others. They should discuss beneficial matters in respect to the world and the hereafter. Only when one behaves in this manner will they obtain the reward outlined in the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If they fail in this, they will either gain no reward or they may well be left with sins depending on how they behaved. Unfortunately, many Muslims enjoy performing this righteous deed, but fail to fulfill its conditions correctly. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 114. No good is there in much of their private conversation, except for those who enjoin charity or that which is right or conciliation between people. And whoever does that seeking means to the approval of Allah, then we are going to give him a great reward. Key to all evil. As Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, strive to gain and act on Islamic knowledge, he was granted a deep understanding of Islam, an understanding matched only by a few. He reached such a level that his opinions and statements were often confirmed through divine revelation. It is why Ali bin Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, believed that there was an angel who spoke with the tongue of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya number 64. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once supplicated for Allah, the Exalted, to make his verdict concerning alcohol clear to everyone. Allah, the Exalted, then revealed Chapter 2 al-Baqarah, verse 219. They ask you about wine and gambling. Say, in them is great sin and yet some benefit for people but their sin is greater than their benefit. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, repeated his supplication, and then Allah, the Exalted, eventually revealed Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 43. O you who have believed, do not approach prayer while you are intoxicated until you know what you are saying. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, again repeated his supplication, and then Allah, the Exalted, eventually revealed Chapter 5 al maidah Verses 90 to 91. O oh, you who have believed, indeed, intoxicants, gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid one it that you may be successful. Satan only wants to cause between you animosity and hatred through intoxicants and gambling, and to avert you from the remembrance of Allah and from prayer. So will you not desist? After hearing this Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, commented that they would abstain. This has been discussed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3049. Abrogation is the process by which one command or prohibition, after some time, is replaced by another command or prohibition. Allah, the Exalted, employed this technique in order to make the transition from a non-Muslim to a strong Muslim easier for a person. If all the final commands and prohibitions were put into full affect in one go, this process becomes difficult. This is the reason why alcohol was not forbidden immediately in Islam, as giving it up in one instant would have been difficult for most people who drank it. Instead, it was prohibited in stages, through the verses quoted earlier. This process is also adopted by medical doctors, who do not prescribe the full doses of medicine straightway and instead build up the dose over time so that they patients adapt to them in a positive way. This strategy was in fact a great blessing and mercy from Allah, the Exalted, as countless people who accepted Islam would have rejected it if all the final commands and prohibitions were revealed in one go at the beginning of Revelation. As indicated by the final part of this verse, even though Allah, the Exalted, undoubtedly has the authority to do this, 
yet he chose the path of ease and mercy for the people. In addition, the prohibitions and commands of Allah, the Exalted, do not exist to make people's life harder. They only exist in order to benefit people in both this world and in the next, even if these benefits are not apparent to people. For example, the negative effects of alcohol, which science has proven, was not always apparent, such as its negative effect on the organs of the body. It only became unlawful in Islam to protect people from this and other harms. In addition, it is an aspect of faith to accept something without understanding its wisdoms. If all the wisdoms of the commands and prohibitions were made apparent, then it would not allow Muslims to possess complete faith. Allah, the Exalted, does not benefit from these commands and prohibitions only people do. This process of abrogation is in fact an aspect of the protection and help of Allah, the Exalted, so that one can succeed in both worlds with ease. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah number 3371, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a Muslim must never consume alcohol as it is the key to all evil. Unfortunately, this major sin has increased amongst the Muslims over time. This is the key to all evil as it gives rise to other sins. This is quite obvious as a drunk loses control over their tongue and physical actions. One only needs to look at the news to observe how much crime is committed due to drinking alcohol. Even those who drink moderately only cause damage to their bodies, which science has proven. The physical and mental diseases associated with alcohol are numerous and cause a heavy burden on the National Health Service and the taxpayers. It is the key to all evil as it negatively affects all three aspects of a person, namely their body, mind and soul. Chapter 5 al maida verse 90 O you who have believed indeed intoxicants gambling, sacrificing on stone altars to other than Allah, and divining arrows are but defilement from the work of Satan, so avoid it that you may be successful. The fact that drinking alcohol has been placed next to things which are associated with polytheism in this verse highlights how important it is to avoid. It is such a serious sin that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3376, that the one who drinks alcohol regularly will not enter paradise. Spreading the Islamic greeting of peace is a key to obtaining paradise, according to a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 68. Yet, a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrat, number 1017, advises Muslims not to greet someone who regularly drinks alcohol. Alcohol is a unique major sin as it has been cursed from 10 different ways in a single narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3380. These include the alcohol itself, the one who produces it, the one it is produced for, the one who sells it, the one who buys it, the one who carries it, the one to whom it is carried to, the one who uses the wealth obtained through selling it, the one who drinks it and the one who pours it. The one who deals with something that has been cursed like this will not obtain true success unless they sincerely repent. Adhering to true guidance. When questioned about the Holy Quran, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, avoided giving his own opinions and instead adhered to the guidance given by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. For example, once he was questioned about some verses of the Holy Quran, he commented on them but added that he heard the interpretations from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, otherwise he would not have commented on them. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 84. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4606, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that any matter which is not based on Islam will be rejected. If Muslims desire lasting success in both worldly and religious matters, they must strictly adhere to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Even though certain actions which are not directly taken from these two sources of guidance can still be considered a righteous deed, it is important to prioritize these two sources of guidance over all else.
Because the fact is that the more one ACTS on things which are not taken from these two sources, even if it is a righteous deed, the less they will act on these two sources of guidance. An obvious example is how many Muslims have adopted cultural practices into their lives which do not have a foundation in these two sources of guidance. Even if these cultural practices are not sins, they have preoccupied Muslims from learning and acting on these two sources of guidance as they feel satisfied with their behavior. This leads to ignorance of the two sources of guidance which in turn will only lead to misguidance. This is why a Muslim must learn and act on these two sources of guidance which have been established by the leaders of guidance and only then act on other voluntary righteous deeds if they have the time and energy to do so. But if they choose ignorance and made up practices, even if they are not sins over learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, they will not achieve success. Striving for knowledge. While living in Medina, Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, ensured his other responsibilities would not hinder him from seeking knowledge from the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He and his neighbor had an arrangement whereby one of them would go to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to gain knowledge on one day and teach it to other. And on the next day, the other one would go to seek knowledge and then teach it to the former. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 87 to 88. The deep level of knowledge Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, possessed, is further highlighted in a dream the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had. One should bear in mind, the dreams of the holy prophets, peace be upon them, are a form of divine revelation. In his dream, milk was brought to the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He drank it until he could see its wetness emerging from his fingertips. He then gave the leftovers to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. When interpreting this dream, the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commented that the milk referred to knowledge. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3681. In a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 219, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that learning one verse of the Holy Quran is better than offering 100 cycles of voluntary prayer. And learning a topic of Islamic knowledge, even if one does not act on it, is better than offering 1000 cycles of voluntary prayer. Learning a verse includes studying and more importantly, practically implementing its teachings in one's life. And it is important to note, a Muslim will only gain this reward when they sincerely strive to act on the topic of knowledge they have learned and practically implement it when the opportunity presents itself. Only when one does not gain the opportunity to act on their topic of Islamic knowledge will they gain the reward of offering 1000 cycles of prayer, even if they do not actually act on it. This is because Allah, the Exalted, judges and rewards people based on their intention and will therefore grant reward to those who would sincerely act when given the opportunity. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. Finally, as indicated by the main narration under discussion, gaining and acting on knowledge is far superior to voluntary worship. This is because the majority do not understand the Arabic language and are therefore less likely to change their behavior and obedience to Allah, the Exalted, in a positive way, as they do not understand the language they use to worship Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, learning and acting on knowledge is much more likely to inspire one to change for the better. This is the reason why some Muslims spend decades performing voluntary worship yet, do not improve their behavior towards Allah, the Exalted, or people in the slightest. This by far is not the best course of action. A true believer. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once told the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that he was more dearer to him than everyone else except himself. The holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated that he would not be a true believer until he was more dearer to him than even his own self. Then Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, responded by declaring that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had become more dearer to him than himself. 
Finally, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated that he was now a true believer. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6632. The first thing to note is the honesty of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. Secondly, true belief involves sincerity. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 And indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 Al-Hash verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran verse 31 Say, if you should love Allah then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. Detachment from the world. Once Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, observed the extreme poverty the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was living in and as a result he wept. When questioned about his weeping, he replied that while the worldly kings were enjoying the luxuries of the world, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was living in extreme poverty. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then asked him whether he was satisfied that the worldly kings enjoyed the material world while they received the pleasures of the hereafter. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 3691. Throughout his life, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, emulated the simple lifestyle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even during his caliphate when the world was placed at his feet. It is important to note, the material world which one should detach from actually refers to one's desires. It does not refer to the physical world, such as the mountains. This is indicated by Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 14. Beautified for people is the love of that which they desire, of women and sons, heaped up sums of gold and silver, fine branded horses and cattle and tilled land. That is the enjoyment of worldly life, but Allah has with him the best return, i.e. paradise. These things are connected to the desires of people, and by them one becomes distracted from preparing for the hereafter. When one abstains from their desires, they are in fact detaching from the material world. This is why a Muslim who does not possess worldly things can still be regarded a worldly person because of their inner desire and love for it. Whereas, a Muslim who possesses worldly things, like some of the righteous predecessors, can be considered detached from the material world as they do not desire and occupy their minds, hearts and actions with them. Instead they desire lies in the eternal hereafter. The first level of abstinence is turning away from unlawful and vain desires which are not connected to the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. This person busies themselves in fulfilling their duties and responsibilities, all the while focusing on the hereafter. They turn away from things and people who prevent them from fulfilling this important deed. 
The next stage of abstinence is when one takes only the things they need from the material world in order to fulfill their necessities and responsibilities. They do not occupy their time on things which will not derive them benefit in the next world. This is the advice given by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6416. He advised a Muslim to live in this material world as a stranger or a traveler. Both types of people will only take what they need from the material world in order to reach their destination meaning the hereafter safely. A Muslim can achieve this by understanding how close their death and departure to the hereafter is. Not only can death pounce on a person at any time, but even if one lives a long life it seems as though it passed in a moment. By realizing this reality, one sacrifices the moment for the sake of the eternal hereafter. Shortening one's hope for a long life in this material world will encourage them to perform righteous deeds, sincerely repent from their sins and prioritize preparing for the hereafter over all else. The one who hopes for a long life will be inspired to behave in the opposite manner. The one who is truly abstinent in the material world neither blames it nor praises it. They do not rejoice when they gain it, nor do they grieve when it passes them by. The mind of this pious Muslim is too focused on the eternal hereafter to greedily notice the small material world. Abstinence consists of several different levels. Some Muslims abstain in order to free their hearts of every vain and useless occupation so that they can fully concentrate on obeying Allah, the exalted, and fulfill their responsibilities towards people. According to the narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 257, the one who behaves in such a manner will find that Allah, the exalted, will suffice them by taking care of their worldly issues. But the one who is only concerned with worldly things will be left to their devices and will find nothing but destruction. This is why it is being said that the one who pursues the excess of this material world, such as excess wealth, will find that the minimal effect it has on them is that it distracts them from the remembrance and obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is still true even if a person commits no sins in their pursuit of the excess aspects of the material world. Some abstain from the world in order to lighten their accountability on the Day of Judgment. The more one possesses, the more they will be held accountable. In fact, whoever has their deeds scrutinized by Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day will be punished. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6536. The lighter one's accountability, the less likely this will occur. It is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6444, that those who possess plenty in the world will possess very little good on the day of rising, except for those who dedicated their belongings and wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, but these are a few in number. This long accountability is the reason why each person, rich or poor, will wish on the day of judgment, that they were only given their daily provision during their lives on earth. This has been confirmed in narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4140. Some Muslims abstain from the excess of this material world out of desire for paradise, which will make up for losing out on the pleasures of this material world. Some abstain from the excess of the material world out of fear of hell. They rightfully believe that the more one indulges in the excess of this material world, the closer they are to the unlawful, which leads to hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205. In fact, it is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4215, that a Muslim will not become pious until they abstain from something which is not a sin, out of fear it may lead to a sin. The highest degree of abstinence is to understand and act on what Allah, the Exalted, desires from His servants, which has been mentioned throughout the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Namely, to abstain from the excess of the material world out of servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, knowing that their Lord does not like the material world. Allah, the Exalted, has condemned the excess of this material world and has belittled its worth. 
These pious servants were embarrassed that their Lord should see them inclining towards something which he dislikes. These are the greatest servants, as they only act according to the wishes of their Lord, even when they are given an opportunity to enjoy the lawful luxuries of this world. This is the very reason why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, chose poverty even though he was offered the treasuries of the earth. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6590. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, chose this as he knew it was what Allah, the Exalted, desired for his servants. As Allah, the Exalted, disliked the material world, the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, rejected it out of love for his Lord. How can a true servant love and indulge in what their Lord dislikes? The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did set an example for the poor by choosing poverty and taught the rich how to live through his words and actions. He could have easily chosen the alternative and practically showed the rich how to live by taking the treasuries of the world which were offered to him, and he could have taught the poor how to live correctly through his words and actions. But he chose poverty for a specific reason which was out of servanthood to his Lord, Allah, the Exalted. This abstinence was adopted by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. For example, the first rightly guided Caliph of Islam, Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, once cried when water sweetened with honey was given to him. He explained that he once observed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, pushing away an invisible object. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, told him the material world had come to him and he commanded it to leave him alone. The material world replied that he had escaped the material world, but those after him would not. Because of this, Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, wept when seeing the water sweetened with honey, believing the material world had come to misguide him. This incident is recorded in Imam Ashfayani's Hilyat al Aulia, number 47. In reality, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, never ate or dressed to gain pleasure, but only took what they needed from the material world while focusing on preparing for the hereafter. They disliked when the material world was placed at their feet, being fearful that perhaps their reward had been given to them in this world instead of in the hereafter. Anyone who is truly abstinent will follow in their footsteps. Muslims should not fool themselves by indulging in the unnecessary luxuries of this material world while claiming their heart is attached to Allah, the Exalted. If a person's heart is purified it manifests on their limbs and in their actions, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4094. Whoever's heart is attached to Allah, the Exalted, follows in the footsteps of the righteous predecessors by taking what they need from the material world spending only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and turning away from the excess of the material world while striving to prepare for the hereafter. This is true abstinence. Caring for others. Talah ibn Ubaidullah once observed Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, leaving his house secretly at night. He then followed him and observed that Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, entered the house and shortly after left it. Talah, may Allah be pleased with him, visited the house the next day and found that Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, had been secretly aiding a poor and old blind woman with her daily chores. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al aulia number 71. Generally speaking, this indicates the importance of aiding the needy. This includes all types of aiding others, not just financial aid. Any type of lawful need of others should be fulfilled according to one's strength, and if a Muslim finds they cannot provide this aid, then they should direct the needy person to someone who can help them. This will ensure they gain the same reward as the one who aids the needy person. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2671. Muslims must sincerely aid others in ways which benefit them solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, without desiring any payback from people, as this only leads to their reward being cancelled. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264 O you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. Simply put, 
If a Muslim desires the aid of Allah, the Exalted, in their moment of need, then they must strive to aid others when they are in need. This has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4893. But those who turn away from helping others may well be left stranded in their time of need. If Muslims desire to demonstrate true gratitude to Allah, the Exalted, so that they receive an increase in blessings, then they must use the blessings they already possess correctly, as prescribed by Islam. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. An aspect of this is helping the needy with whatever one possesses, such as good advice. One should understand a vital point which will prevent them from becoming proud. Namely, the help they offer the needy is not innately theirs. It was created and therefore belongs to Allah, the Exalted, and they must therefore use it according to the wishes of the true owner by helping the needy. In reality, the needy are doing their helper a favor as they will receive reward from Allah, the Exalted. If there was no one in need, people would lose out on this method of gaining much reward. Prioritizing correctly once, during a Friday sermon, some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, left the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, while he was preaching, in order to tend to a trade caravan which arrived in Medina. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was amongst those who remained with him. Then chapter 62 al Jumu'ah, verse 11, was revealed. But, on one occasion, when they saw a transaction or a diversion, they rushed to it and left you standing. Say, what is with Allah is better than diversion and than a transaction, and Allah is the best of providers. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2000. Even though this was not a sin nonetheless, it contradicted the correct manners one must show the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 62. The believers are only those who believe in Allah and his messenger, and when they are meeting with him for a matter of common interest, do not depart until they have asked his permission. Indeed, those who ask your prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him permission, those are the ones who believe in Allah and his messenger. So when they ask your permission due to something of their affairs, then give permission to whom you will among them. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him understood that remaining with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would lead to an increase in useful knowledge. This is better than trade and diversion. This does not mean one should abandon their lawful livelihood, rather, they should strike a balance between the two, while leaning towards gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. Behaving in this manner leads to peace and success in both worlds. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2465, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever prioritizes the hereafter over this material world will be granted contentment, their affairs will be corrected for them, and they will receive their destined provision in an easy way. This half of the narration means that whoever correctly fulfills their duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and to the creation, such as providing for their family in a lawful manner, while avoiding the excess of this material world, will be granted contentment. This is when one is pleased with what they possess, without being greedy, and actively striving to obtain more worldly things. In reality, the one who is content with what they possess, is a truly rich person, even if they possess little wealth, as they become independent of things. Independence of anything makes one rich in respect to it. In addition, this attitude will allow one to comfortably deal with any worldly issues which may arise during their life. This is because the less one interacts with the material world and focuses on the hereafter, the less worldly issues they will face. The less worldly issues a person faces, the more comfortable their life will become. For example, the one who possesses one house will have fewer issues to deal with in respect to it, such as a broken cooker than the one who possesses ten houses. Finally, this person will easily and pleasantly obtain their lawful provision. Not only this but Allah, the Exalted, 
will place such grace in their provision, that it will cover all their responsibilities and necessities meaning, it will satisfy them and their dependents. But as mentioned in the other half of this narration, the one who prioritizes the material world over the hereafter meaning, by neglecting their duties or striving for the unnecessary and excess of this material world, will find that their need, meaning greed, for worldly things is never satisfied, which by definition makes them poor, even if they possess much wealth. These people will go from one worldly issue to another, throughout the day, failing to achieve contentment, as they have opened too many worldly doors. And they will receive their destined provision with difficulty, and it will not give them satisfaction, and never seem enough to fill their greed. This may even push them towards the unlawful, which only leads to a loss in both worlds. Leading by example. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once commented that he did not know how long he would continue to live amongst the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Then he commanded them to follow the two who came after him, and then pointed towards Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 97. They were both suited for leadership, as they both led by example. It is important for all Muslims, especially parents, to act on what they advise to others. It is obvious if one turns the pages of history, that those who acted on what they preached, had a much more positive effect on others, compared to those who did not lead by example. The best example being the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who not only practiced what he preached, but adhered to those teachings more strictly than anyone else. Only with this attitude, will Muslims especially, parents have a positive impact on others. For example, if a mother warns her children not to lie, as it is a sin, but often lies in front of them, her children are unlikely to act on her advice. A person's actions will always have more of an impact on others than their speech. It is important to note that this does not mean one needs to be perfect before advising others. It means they should sincerely strive to act on their own advice before advising others. The Holy Quran has made it clear in the following verse that Allah, the Exalted, hates this behavior. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, that the a person who commanded good but refrained from it themselves and prohibited evil yet acted on it themselves will be punished in severely hell. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3. Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. So it is vital for all Muslims to strive to act on their advice themselves, then advise others to do the same. Leading by example is the tradition of all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, and is the best way to affect others in a positive way. Strong faith. It is important to note that the dream of the holy prophets, peace be upon them, is a type of divine revelation. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once had a dream where he observed a group of people wearing garments of different lengths. Some of them were wearing garments which reached their chests and others lower than that. Then he observed Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, who was wearing such a long garment that it was dragging behind him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, interpreted the dream and indicated that the garments represented one's faith. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6189. This dream indicated the certainty of faith Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, possessed. All Muslims have faith in Islam, but the strength of their faith varies from person to person. For example, the one who follows the teachings of Islam because their family told them to, is not the same as the one who believes in it through evidence. A person who has heard about something will not believe in it in the same way as the one who has witnessed the thing with their own eyes. As confirmed in a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 224, gaining useful knowledge is a duty on all Muslims. One of the reasons for this is that it is the best way a Muslim can strengthen their faith in Islam. This is important to pursue, as the stronger one's certainty of faith, the greater the chance they will remain steadfast on the correct path, especially when facing difficulties. In addition, 
Having certainty of faith has been described as one of the best things one can possess in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3849. This knowledge should be obtained by studying the Holy Quran and the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through a reliable source. Allah, the Exalted, did not only declare a truth in the Holy Quran, but he also provided evidence for it through examples. Not only examples which are to be found in the past nations, but examples which have been placed in one's very own life. For example, in the Holy Quran Allah, the Exalted, advises that sometimes a person loves a thing, even though it will cause them trouble if they obtained it. Similarly, they might hate a thing while there is much hidden good in it for them. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. There are many examples of this truth in history, such as the Pact of Hudaybah. Some Muslims believe this pact, which was made with the non-Muslims of Mecca, would completely favor the latter group. Yet, history clearly shows that it favored Islam and the Muslims. This event is discussed in the narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 2731 and 2732. If one reflects on their own life, they will find many examples when they believed something was good, when it was actually bad for them, and vice versa. These examples prove the authenticity of this verse and help one's faith strengthen. Another example is found in chapter 79 and Nazir, verse 46. It will be, on the day they see it, judgment day, as though they had not remained in the world, except for an afternoon or a morning thereof. If one turns the pages of history, they will clearly observe how great empires came and went. But when they left they passed away, in such a way, as if they were only on earth for a moment. All but a few of their signs have faded away, as if they were never present on earth in the first place. Similarly, when one reflects on their own life, they will realize that no matter how old they are, and no matter how slow certain days might have felt overall their life so far has passed in a flash. Understanding the truthfulness of this verse strengthens one's certainty of faith, and this inspires them to prepare for the hereafter, before their time runs out. The Holy Quran and the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, are full of such examples. Therefore, one should strive to learn and act on these divine teachings, so that they adopt certainty of faith. The one who achieves this, will not be shaken by any difficulty they face, and will remain steadfast on the path which leads to the gates of paradise. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53 We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Key to Paradise The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once told Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, to give the glad tidings of paradise to anyone who bears witness with certainty in their heart, that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah, the Exalted. When Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, heard this, he advised the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, not to spread this, as people might become lazy and rely on their verbal declaration of faith, instead of striving hard in the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, agreed with his opinion. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 147. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, understood that the narration actually makes it clear that one cannot believe in Islam with certainty of faith without learning and acting on Islamic teachings, but he was concerned people would misinterpret the narration to mean that one can simply claim faith in Islam without sincerely obeying Allah, the Exalted. There are many narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, which advise mankind that whoever testifies that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, the Exalted, and that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant and final messenger of Allah, the Exalted, will be saved from the fire of hell. One such example is found in Sahih Bukhari, number 128. The meaning of these narrations is that whoever dies while believing in this testimony will either enter paradise and escape hell, or they will enter hell to the extent of their sins, 
and then eventually be allowed into paradise, where they will dwell forever. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7510. It is important to note, that those who desire to enter paradise without entering hell first, must not only declare their belief in Islam verbally, but they must also fulfill its conditions and obligations. The testimony of faith is undoubtedly the key to paradise, but a key needs teeth in order to unlock a specific door. The teeth of the key to paradise are its obligations and duties. Without M meaning, the key without its teeth will not open the door to paradise. This is proven through many narrations which indicate entry into paradise requires one to fulfill the conditions and duties of Islam. For example, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1397, indicates that the testimony must be supported by actions in the form of the pillars of Islam, such as establishing the obligatory prayers. The first part of the testimony namely, there is none worthy of worship save Allah, the Exalted, means that Allah, the Exalted, is the only one who must be obeyed and never disobeyed. When one accepts Allah, the Exalted, as their God, they must not obey anything which leads to his disobedience as Allah, the Exalted, alone is their master and they are only his slaves. But the moment one obeys anything which leads to the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted, then they have corrupted their belief in his oneness which has been indicated in chapter 45 al jatiya verse 23. Have you seen he who has taken as his God his own desire? The Holy Quran has warned Muslims that whoever commits sins is in reality worshipping the devil, as they have obeyed him over the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 36 Yasin verse 60. Did I not enjoin upon you, O children of Adam, that you not worship Satan, for indeed he is to you a clear enemy? The Muslims who reject their desires, the desires of others, and the commands of the devil, and instead only obey Allah, the Exalted, have truly taken Allah, the Exalted, as their God. These Muslims have been granted the protection of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. These Muslims have practically actualized the testimony of Islam as they supported their verbal and internal claim with sincere actions according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. When one ACTS according to his traditions, they have fulfilled the second aspect of the testimony namely, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant and final messenger of Allah, the Exalted. These Muslims are the ones referred to in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 128. It advises they will be saved from the hellfire by Allah, the Exalted. The person who declares Islam with the tongue and internally accepts it is undoubtedly a Muslim, but their true sincere belief in the oneness of Allah, the Exalted, is diminished according to their sins. An aspect of truly acting on the testimony is sincerely loving Allah, the Exalted. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has indicated this in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. It advises that this is an aspect of perfecting one's faith. This is when one loves what Allah, the Exalted, loves and hates what he hates. As this was the characteristic of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him according to a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 2333, Muslims have been commanded to follow him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31. Say, if you should love Allah, then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. It is clear from Islamic teachings that loving what Allah, the Exalted, hates and disliking what Allah, the Exalted, loves is a clear indication of a person following their own desires and obeying them over Allah, the Exalted. This attitude reduces one's belief in the oneness of Allah, the Exalted. The following verse makes it clear that adopting this mentality is a deviation from true belief in the testimony of Islam. Chapter 9 at Tawbah, verse 24. Say, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your relatives, wealth which you have obtained, commerce wherein you fear decline, and dwellings with which you are pleased are more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and striving in his cause, then wait until Allah executes his command. And Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. 
the one who worships Allah, the exalted, according to their own desires, worships him on the edge. Meaning, when they face times of ease they become pleased, but when they encounter difficulties, they turn away from his obedience in anger. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6502, informs Muslims how to correctly believe and act on the testimony of faith, which prevents one being harmed by the fire of hell in the next world. This is to first complete the obligatory duties correctly, while fulfilling all their conditions and etiquettes. Then one must add to this by performing voluntary righteous deeds, the best of which are the established traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This leads to the love of Allah, the Exalted, and causes Allah, the Exalted, to empower every organ of their body so that they only obey Him. This true and sincere obedience is the fulfillment of the testimony of faith. This is the sound heart which contains only the love of Allah, the Exalted, and is free of worldly desires and the love of the material world. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verses 88-89 the day when there will not benefit anyone well for children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. It is important to note, this does not mean a Muslim becomes free from committing sins, but it means they sincerely repent from them whenever they are rarely committed. To conclude, it is vital for Muslims to not only declare the testimony of Islam internally and verbally, but they must also show it in their actions, as this is the only way to achieve true success in this world and completely escape punishment in the next world also. Reducing Evil Influences A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3294, advises that whichever path the second rightly guided Caliph of Islam, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, took the devil, would take a different path, meaning, out of fear of him. One of the reasons why the devil acted in this way was because he had little influence over Umar ibn Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him. The devil cannot physically force someone to commit sins. He instead encourages them to do so through whisperings. But in order for them to be effective, he requires a person to possess some sort of worldly desire. Then through his whisperings he encourages the growth of this worldly desire until it drives the person to act on it, thereby committing a sin. The reason the devil had little effect on Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was because he had removed worldly desires from his heart. His only desires were connected to pleasing Allah, the exalted. Therefore, if Muslims desire to minimize the effect the devil has on them, they should remove unnecessary desires from their heart. This only occurs when one refrains from indulging in the excess and unnecessary aspects of this material world. The more they do this, the more these worldly desires will leave their heart until they reach a point where they only desire to please Allah, the exalted, in all their actions. The devil will flee from this person, as he knows he will have little effect on them. But the more one indulges in the unnecessary aspects of this material world, the more worldly desires they will possess and therefore, the more influence the devil will have over them. Loving for Allah, the Exalted The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was once asked who the most beloved person to him was, to which he named his wife, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Then he was asked which of the men was the most beloved to him, and he named her father, Abu Bakr, and after him, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3662. Unlike most people nowadays, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, loved Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, because of their sincerity and obedience to Allah, the Exalted. Meaning, his love was for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and not for the sake of worldly reasons. In a divine narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6548, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
declared that Allah, the Exalted, will shade the two people who loved each other for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. Allah, the Exalted, will grant shade to these two people on a day when the sun will be brought within two miles of the creation. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2421. If people struggle to cope with the heat of the sun during summer, can one imagine the intensity of the heat on Judgment Day? Loving for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, leads to such a reward as this emotion is extremely difficult to control. And whoever is blessed with controlling it will find fulfilling the duties of Islam straightforward. These duties involve fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. It is because of this reason, loving for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, has been declared an aspect of perfecting one's faith in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. Loving others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, includes desiring what is best for others in both worldly and religious matters. This must be practically shown through one's actions meaning, supporting others financially, emotionally and physically according to one's means. Counting the favors one does for others not only cancels the reward, but also proves their insincerity as they only love gaining praise and other forms of compensation from people. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264 O you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. Any type of negative feeling towards others over worldly reasons, such as envy, contradicts loving others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and must be avoided. To conclude, this noble quality includes loving for others what one loves for themselves, through actions not just words. This is in fact an aspect of being a true believer, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. Embodying Truthfulness The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once declared that Allah, the Exalted, had put the truth on the tongue and in the heart of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3682. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding Greed 
The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once gave Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, some wealth as a gift. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, requested him to instead give it to someone who was poorer than him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told him to take it, and added that if someone gave him something he did not ask for, nor hoped for, he should take it. And anything which does not come to him, he should not seek it. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2405. This incident encourages one to avoid greed. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2511, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned Muslims against greed. This can lead one to withholding the obligatory charity, which only leads to destruction in both worlds. For example, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1403, warns that the person who does not donate their obligatory charity will encounter a large poisonous snake, which will continuously bite them on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 180 And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty, ever think that it is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled by what they withheld on the Day of Resurrection. If one's greed prevents them from donating voluntary charity, it may not be unlawful, but it is highly undesirable, as this contradicts the characteristic of a true believer. Put simply, the stingy person is far from Allah, the exalted, far from paradise, far from people and close to hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1961. Standing firm. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. On the way to raiding a caravan of the non-Muslims of Mecca, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed that the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca had organized an army to confront the Muslims. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, asked his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, for their opinion on what to do. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 259 to 260. At this time, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, rose up and comforted the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, by pledging his support to him under all circumstances and encouraged the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to do the same. Then Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, rose up and did the same thing. He pledged his support to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and encouraged the others to do the same. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al Qatar, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 93 to 94. This incident reminds Muslims the importance of remaining steadfast whenever they are attacked by their enemies, namely, the devil, their inner devil, and those who invite them towards the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. A Muslim should not turn their back on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, whenever they are tempted by these enemies. They should instead remain steadfast on the obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is achieved by avoiding the places, things and people who invite and tempt them towards sins and the disobedience of Allah, the Exalted. Avoiding the traps of the devil is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. The same way traps on a path are only avoided by possessing knowledge of them similarly. Islamic knowledge is required to avoid the traps of the devil. For example, a Muslim might spend much time reciting the Holy Quran, but because of their ignorance, they might destroy their righteous deeds without realizing it through sins such as backbiting. A Muslim is bound to face these attacks, so they should therefore prepare for them through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and in return gain an uncountable reward. Allah, the Exalted, has guaranteed right guidance for those who struggle in this way for his sake. Chapter 29 al ankaba verse 69 And those who strive for us, we will surely guide them to our ways. Whereas facing these attacks with ignorance and disobedience will only lead one to difficulties and disgrace in both worlds. 
The same way a solider that possesses no weapons to defend themselves would be defeated. An ignorant Muslim will have no weapon to defend themselves when facing these attacks which will result in their defeat. Whereas, the knowledgeable Muslim is provided with the most powerful weapon which cannot be overcome or beaten, namely, sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. This is only achieved through sincerely gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. In addition, an aspect of hypocrisy is when one verbally shows support for others and their good projects, such as building a mosque, but when the time comes to take part in the project such as donating wealth, they seem to disappear. Similarly, when people are facing good times, they verbally support them, reminding others of their loyalty to them. But the moment the people face difficulties, these hypocrites offer no emotional or physical support. Instead, they criticize them. This was the attitude of the hypocrites in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 62. So how will it be when disaster strikes them because of what their hands have put forth, and then they come to you swearing by Allah, we intended nothing but good conduct and accommodation? Uncompromising in faith. In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After the battle was over and the non-Muslims were defeated, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered the bodies of the non-Muslims to be placed in an old well. After this was done he called out to them, enumerating those in the well, and asked if they had found what Allah, the Exalted, promised them, as he was given exactly what Allah, the Exalted, promised him. When he was questioned about calling out to the dead, he replied that they could hear his words, but they could not reply. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, page 300. In this battle, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, confronted and killed his maternal uncle, Al-As ibn Hashim. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn Al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 93 to 94. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, did not allow any relationship to overcome his sincerity and loyalty to Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet, Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Muslims must adopt this uncompromising attitude if they desire success in both worlds. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away, and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided Caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later, they become a difficulty for its bearer. 
One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. True Love In the second year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the first battle of Islam, the Battle of Badr, took place. After victory was given to the Muslims, some prisoners of war were taken, including the uncle of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Al Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, who later became Muslim. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, encouraged Al Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, to accept Islam and commented, that him accepting Islam would please him more than if his own father accepted Islam, as this would greatly please the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Kathir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 2, pages 307 to 308. A sign of truly loving Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him is that one will prefer the commands and prohibitions delivered in the Holy Quran and the narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, over their own desires and opinions. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 24. Say, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your relatives, wealth which you have obtained, commerce wherein you fear decline, and dwellings with which you are pleased are more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger and striving in his cause, then wait until Allah executes his command. And Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. A person only inclines towards the things mentioned in this verse out of love for them. But when one chooses the obedience to Islam over these things, it proves their love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. A true lover only desires to obey their beloved and keep them pleased at all times. This is only possible when a Muslim obeys the teachings of Islam. A suitable spouse. When the daughter of Umar ibn Khattab, Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with them, became a widow, he discussed a possible marriage proposal with Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him. The latter respectively declined the offer, as he was not in the right position to get married. Umar then discussed a marriage proposal with Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them who did not give an immediate response. Later on, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, proposed and married Hafsa, may Allah be pleased with her. Abu Bakr then explained to Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, that he did not initially reply, as he was aware that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated a desire to marry her. Instead of divulging this information, he decided not to reply immediately. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 3261. Umar, may Allah be pleased be him, took steps to ensure his daughter married a suitable Muslim who would strive to fulfill her rights. Muslims must follow in his footsteps when searching for a spouse for themselves or those under their care. A suitable spouse is only obtained when one follows the guidance of Islam. For example, in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5090, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person is married for four reasons, their wealth, lineage, beauty, or for their piety. He concluded by warning that a person should marry for the sake of piety, otherwise they will be a loser. It is important to understand that the first three things mentioned in this narration are very transient and imperfect. They may give someone temporary happiness, but ultimately these things will become a burden for them, as they are linked to the material world, and not to the thing which grants ultimate and permanent success, namely, faith. One only needs to observe the rich and famous, in order to understand that wealth does not bring happiness. In fact, the rich are the most unsatisfied and unhappy people on earth. Marrying someone for the sake of their lineage is foolish, as it does not guarantee the person will make a good spouse. In fact, if the marriage does not work out it destroys the family bond the two families possessed before the marriage. Marrying only for the sake of beauty meaning, love is not wise, as this is a fickle emotion which changes with the passing of time and with one's mood. 
How many couples, supposedly drowned in love, ended up hating each other? But it is important to note, that this narration does not mean one should find a spouse who is poor, as it is important to get married to someone who can financially support a family. Neither does it mean one should not be attracted to their spouse, as this is an important aspect of a healthy marriage. But this narration means that these things should not be the main or ultimate reason someone gets married. The main and ultimate quality a Muslim should look for in a spouse is piety. This is when a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience. Put simply, the one who fears Allah, the Exalted, will treat their spouse well in both times of happiness and difficulty. On the other hand, those who are irreligious will mistreat their spouse whenever they are upset. This is one of the main reasons why domestic violence has increased amongst Muslims in recent years. Finally, if a Muslim desires to get married, they should firstly obtain the knowledge associated with it, such as the rights they owe their spouse, the rights they are owed from their spouse, and how to correctly deal with one's spouse in different situations. Unfortunately, ignorance of this leads to many arguments and divorces as people demand things which their spouse is not obliged to fulfill. Knowledge is the foundation of a healthy and successful marriage. Supporting the truth. In the sixth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, set out towards Mecca, intending to perform the visitation, Umrah, and not to engage in warfare with the non-Muslims of Mecca. During the journey, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was warned that the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca dispatched a force to prevent them from entering Mecca. After setting up camp in Hudaybiyah, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca sent different people to talk to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and ascertain his motives for coming to Mecca. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told each of them he only desired to perform the visitation, Umrah, in peace. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, desired to dispatch Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, as his ambassador to the non-Muslims of Mecca, in order to avoid confrontation and make his peaceful intention clear. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised him to send Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, instead, as the non-Muslims were angry with him because of his very harsh attitude towards them since he became Muslim. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, accepted his recommendation. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 227. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, could have accepted this important role as the ambassador of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which would have clearly indicated his superiority. But out of loyalty and sincerity to the truth, he recommended someone more suitable for the role. Since the passing of the righteous predecessors, the strength of the Muslim nation has weakened dramatically. It is logical that the greater the number of people in a group, the stronger the group will become, yet Muslims have somehow defied this logic. The strength of the Muslim nation has only decreased as the number of Muslims have increased. One of the main reasons this has occurred is connected to Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 of the Holy Quran and cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. Allah, the Exalted, clearly commands Muslims to aid each other in any matter which is good and not support each other in any matter which is bad. This is what the righteous predecessors acted on, but many Muslims have failed to follow in their footsteps. Many Muslims now observe who is doing an action instead of observing what they are doing. If the person is linked to them, for example, a relative, they support them even if the thing is not good. Similarly, if the person has no relationship with them, they turn away from supporting them, even if the thing is good. This attitude completely contradicts the traditions of the righteous predecessors. They would support others in good irrespective of who was doing it. In fact, they went so far on acting on this verse of the Holy Quran that they would even support those they did not get on with, as long as it was a good thing. The other thing connected to this 
is that many Muslims fail to support each other in good as they believe the person they are supporting will gain more prominence than them. This condition has even affected scholars and Islamic educational institutes. They make lame excuses not to aid others in good as they do not have a relationship with them and they fear their own institution will be forgotten and those they help will gain further respect in society. But this is completely wrong as one only needs to turn the pages of history to observe the truth. As long as one's intention is to please Allah, the exalted, supporting others in good will increase their respect within society. Allah, the exalted, will cause the hearts of the people to turn to them, even if their support is for another organization, institution or person. For example, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, departed this world Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, could have easily challenged for the caliphate and would have found plenty of support in his favor. But he knew the right thing to do was to nominate Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, as the first caliph of Islam. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, did not worry about being forgotten by society if he supported another person. He instead obeyed the command in the verse mentioned earlier and supported what was right. This is confirmed in the narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 3667 and 3668. The honor and respect of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, within society, only increased by this action. This is obvious to those who are aware of Islamic history. Muslims must reflect on this deeply, change their mentality and strive to aid others in good irrespective of who is doing it and not hold back, fearing their support will cause them to be forgotten within society. Those who obey Allah, the exalted, will never be forgotten in both this world and the next. In fact, their respect and honor will only grow in both worlds. Remaining firm. In the sixth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them, set out towards Mecca, intending to perform the visitation, Umrah, and not to engage in warfare with the non-Muslims of Mecca. During the journey, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was warned that the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca dispatched a force to prevent them from entering Mecca. After setting up camp in Hudaybiyah, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca sent different people to talk to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and ascertain his motives for coming to Mecca. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told each of them he only desired to perform the visitation, Umrah, in peace. After a few incidences, eventually the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca dispatched Suhail bin Amra to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in order to make peace with him but set some conditions. One of which was that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would not perform the visitation, Umrah, that year, and instead he would return the following year. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, like many of the other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were not pleased with these conditions, as they seemed outwardly to favor the non-Muslims of Mecca. So he spoke to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, about this, and he reminded him to remain firm on the obedience of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then discussed this matter with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the latter declared that he would not oppose the command of Allah the Exalted, and he would never let his mission fail. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave the same exact reply to Umar as Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, did. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 228 to 229. Even though Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, expressed his opinion, yet he did not behave stubbornly and instead submitted to the choice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 159, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gave a short but far-reaching piece of advice. He advised people to sincerely declare their belief in Allah, the Exalted, and then remain steadfast on it. 
Remaining steadfast on one's faith means that they must strive in the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in all aspects of their life. It consists of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, which relate to Him, such as the obligatory fasts and those which relate to people, such as treating others kindly. It includes refraining from all the prohibitions of Islam, which are between a person and Allah, the Exalted, and those involving others. A Muslim must also face destiny, with patience truly believing Allah, the Exalted, chooses what is best for his servants. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Steadfastness can include refraining from both types of polytheism. The major type is when one worships something other than Allah, the Exalted. The minor type is when one shows off their good deeds to others. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3989. Therefore, an aspect of steadfastness is to always act for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. It includes obeying Allah, the Exalted, at all times instead of obeying and pleasing oneself or others. If a Muslim disobeys Allah, the Exalted, by pleasing themselves or others, they should know neither their desires nor people will protect them from Allah, the Exalted. On the other hand, the one who is sincerely obedient to Allah, the Exalted, will be protected from all things by him, even if this protection is not apparent to them. Remaining steadfast on one's faith includes following the path set out by the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and not adopting a path which deviates from this. The one who strives to adopt this path will not need anything else, as this is enough to keep them steadfast on their faith. As people are not perfect, they will undoubtedly make mistakes and commit sins. So being steadfast in matters of faith does not mean one has to be perfect, but it means they must strive to adhere strictly to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, as outlined earlier, and to sincerely repent if they commit a sin. This has been indicated in chapter 41 Fusila, verse 6. So take a straight course to him and seek his forgiveness. This is further supported by a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1987, which advises to fear Allah, the Exalted, and to erase a minor sin which has occurred by performing a righteous deed. In another narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, Book 2, narration number 37, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims to try their best to remain steadfast on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, even though they will not be able to do it perfectly. Therefore, a Muslim's duty is to fulfill the potential they have been given through their intention and physical actions in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted. They have not been commanded to achieve perfection, as this is not possible. It is important to note that one cannot remain steadfast in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, through their physical actions without purifying their heart first. As indicated in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 3984, the limbs of the body will only act in a pure way if the spiritual heart is pure. Purity of heart is only achieved by gaining and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Steadfast obedience requires one to control their tongue as it expresses the heart. Without controlling the tongue, steadfast obedience to Allah, the Exalted, is not possible. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2407. Finally, if any deficiency in the steadfast obedience of Allah, the Exalted, occurs, one must make sincere repentance to Allah, the Exalted, and seek the forgiveness of people if it involves their rights. Chapter 46 Al-Akaf, verse 13. Indeed those who have said, Our Lord is Allah, and then remained on a right course, there will be no fear concerning them, nor will they grieve. Your Legacy In the seventh year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, he was commanded to strive against a non-Muslim tribe who lived in Kaaba, close to Medina. The command was given, as they persistently broke the peace treaty they had with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him 
by constantly plotting against him with the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca. When reaching their forts, he declared that the next day he was going to give his banner to someone who loved Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and that this man was also a beloved of Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He concluded that this man would conquer Kaaba. The next day he called for Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, and entrusted him with the banner, and Kaaba was then conquered. This has been discussed in Imam ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 251. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, received some land from this conquest and asked the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, on how best to utilize it. He advised him to set it up as a charitable endowment. The yield from the property was continuously donated to the poor. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2773. First of all, it is important to understand worldly legacies come and go. How many rich and powerful people have built massive empires, only for them to be torn apart and forgotten shortly after their death? The few signs left behind from some of these legacies only endure in order to warn people not to follow in their footsteps. An example is the great empire of Pharaoh. Islam not only teaches Muslims to send blessings ahead of them to the hereafter in the form of righteous deeds, but it also teaches them to leave a lovely legacy behind from which people can benefit from. In fact, when a Muslim passes away and leaves behind anything which is useful, such as an ongoing charity in the form of a water well, they will be rewarded for it. This is confirmed in narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4223. So a Muslim should strive to perform righteous deeds and send forward as much good as possible, but they should also try leaving a good legacy behind which will benefit them after they pass away. Unfortunately, many Muslims are so concerned about their wealth and properties, that they only end up leaving them behind, which does not benefit them in the least. Each Muslim should not be fooled into believing they have plenty of time for creating a legacy for themselves, as the moment of death is unknown and often pounces on people unexpectedly. Today is the day a Muslim should truly reflect on the legacy they will leave behind. If this legacy is good and beneficial, they should praise Allah, the Exalted, for granting them the strength to do so. But if it is something which will not benefit them, then they should prepare something which will, so that they not only send forward good to the hereafter, but also leave good behind. It is hoped that the one who is surrounded by good in this way, will be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted. So each Muslim should ask themselves what is their legacy. Sincerity to Islam first. In the eighth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca, broke their agreement of peace made in Hudaybiyah by supporting another tribe who attacked a tribe who were allied with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. After the non-Muslim leaders of Mecca became aware that this news reached the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, they dispatched one of their leaders to Medina, Abu Sufyan, in order to reaffirm and extend the pact, as they became extremely worried about the consequences of their treachery. Abu Sufyan spoke to many of the senior companions, including Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with them, urging them to intercede on his behalf to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He listed the different affiliations he had with them in order to win them over, such as tribal and kinship affiliations, but they all replied in the same way. They refused to compromise on their faith in order to please him, and did not desire to convince the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to renew the pact or not to renew it. They instead left the decision to their leader, trusting in his divinely guided choice. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 381 to 382. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would support and withhold their support for others based on their sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, and not for any other reason. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
advise the characteristics which perfect a Muslim's faith. One of these characteristics is giving for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This refers to every blessing one can give to others, such as physical and emotional support, not just wealth. When one gives they will do so according to the teachings of Islam meaning, in matters pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, such as giving sincere advice. In fact, this is an aspect of being sincere to others which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. It includes giving and sharing these blessings with others without counting one's favors, as this proves they gave in order to receive something from others. Chapter 76 Al-Insan, verse 9 Saying, We feed you only for the face, i.e. approval of Allah. We wish not from you reward or gratitude. The final characteristic mentioned in the main narration under discussion is withholding for the sake of Allah, the exalted. This includes withholding the blessings one possesses, such as wealth, from others in matters which are displeasing to Allah, the exalted. This Muslim will not observe who is requesting something from them, instead they only assess the reason behind the request. If the reason contradicts the teachings of Islam, they will withhold the blessing and not take part in the activity. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. This includes withholding one's speech and actions in matters which are not pleasing to Allah, the Exalted, such as backbiting or manifesting one's anger. This Muslim will not speak and act according to their desires and only proceed in a situation when it pleases Allah, the Exalted. Otherwise, they will withhold and refrain from proceeding forward. Steadfast in Difficulty in the eighth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the city of Mecca was conquered. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed of a non-Muslim tribe, the Hoazan, which had gathered to attack him. This eventually led to the Battle of Hunayn. During the battle the Muslim army was overwhelmed and some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, temporarily retreated from the battlefield. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was one of those who stood his ground and remained with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Eventually, after they were summoned at the command of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, all of them pushed forward until Allah, the Exalted, granted them victory. This has been discussed in Imam ibn Qatir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, page 451, and in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 109-110. In life a Muslim will always face either times of ease or times of difficulty. No one only experiences times of ease without experiencing some difficulties. But the thing to note is that even though difficulties by definition are hard to deal with, they are in fact a means to obtain and demonstrate one's true greatness and servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. In addition, in the majority of cases people learn more important life lessons when they face difficulties than when they face times of ease. And people often change for the better after experiencing times of difficulty than times of ease. One only needs to reflect on this in order to understand this truth. In fact, if one studies the Holy Quran they will realize the majority of the events discussed involve difficulties. This indicates that true greatness does not lie in always experiencing times of ease. It in fact lies in experiencing difficulties while remaining obedient to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is proven by the fact that each of the great difficulties discussed in Islamic teachings end with ultimate success for those who obeyed Allah, the Exalted. So a Muslim should not be bothered about facing difficulties, as these are just moments for them to shine while acknowledging their true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, through sincere obedience. This is the key to ultimate success in both worlds. Objecting to Evil In the eighth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the city of Mecca was conquered. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was informed of a non-Muslim tribe, the Hoazan, which had gathered to attack him. 
This eventually led to the Battle of Hunain. After the victory at Hunain, some of the non-Muslim enemies retreated to the city of Taif. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then led an expedition to Taif. After this expedition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, returned to Mecca. While distributing the spoils of war a hypocrite named Du al Kuwaisara commented that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was not acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, grew angry and replied that if he did not act with justice, then who would? When Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, sought permission to kill this obvious hypocrite, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, refused him and commented that this man would eventually lead a rebellious faction who will enter and exit the faith of Islam, just like an arrow enters and emerges from its target. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 3, pages 492 to 493. The punishment for this type of clear blasphemy is death, which Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, understood. In addition, his reaction indicates the importance of objecting to evil. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised the importance of objecting to evil things in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4340. This narration clearly shows that it is a duty on all Muslims to object to all forms of evil, according to their strength and means. The lowest level, as mentioned in this narration, is rejecting the evil with one's heart. This shows internally approving evil actions is one of the ugliest of those things which are forbidden. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4345, that the one who is present when an evil is committed and denounces it is like the one who was not present. But the one who was absent and approved the evil deed is like the one who was present when it was committed. The first two aspects of objecting to evil, mentioned in the main narration under discussion, are through one's physical actions and speech. This is only a duty on a Muslim who has the strength to do so, for example, they will not be harmed by their actions or words. It is important to note, objecting to evil with one's hand does not refer to fighting. It refers to correcting the evil actions of others, such as returning the rights of someone which have been unlawfully violated. The one who is in a position to do so yet, refrains from doing so, has been warned of a punishment in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4338. The Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, has advised Muslims in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2191, that they should not fear the creation in respect to speaking the truth. In fact, the one who allows the fear of the creation to prevent them from objecting to evil things has been described as the one who hates themselves and will be criticized by Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 4008. It is important to note, this does not refer to the one who remains silent out of fear of being harmed, as this is an acceptable excuse, but it refers to the person who remains silent because of the status people hold in their eyes. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4341, advises that a person can give up objecting to evil things through their actions and speech when others obey their greed, follow their incorrect opinions and desires, and when they prefer the material world over the hereafter. It does not take a scholar to conclude this time has arrived. Chapter 5 al maida verse 105. O you who have believed, upon you is responsibility for yourselves. Those who have gone astray will not harm you when you have been guided. But it is important to note, a Muslim should continue with this important duty in respect to their dependents, as this is a duty on them according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928, and in respect to those they feel physically and verbally safe from, as this is the superior attitude. Objecting to evil things which are apparent, is what the main narration under discussion refers to. Meaning, it does not grant permission to Muslims to spy on others in order to find evil things to object to. Spying and anything associated with it in this respect, are forbidden. 
Chapter 49 al Hujurat, verse 12. O oh, you who have believed, do not spy. It is important to note that a Muslim must object to evil according to the teachings of Islam and not their own desires. A Muslim may believe they are acting for sake of Allah, the Exalted, when they are not. This is proven when they object to evil in a way which contradicts the teachings of Islam. In fact, what is considered a good deed may well become a sin because of this negative attitude. A Muslim must object to evil in a gentle and fair way, preferably in private, in accordance to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. The opposite of these characteristics will only push people away from sincerely repenting and may lead to further sins as a result of angering them. True Devotion In the ninth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina Allah, the Exalted, commanded the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to firstly preach Islam and if necessary fight against the great Byzantine Empire. This led to the Battle of Tabak. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to make preparations for the Battle of Tabak during a period of extreme heat and discomfort. In addition, the journey would be long and extremely difficult. A total of 30,000 soldiers joined him for this expedition, but some held back out of negligence or hypocrisy. Allah, the Exalted, revealed many verses of the Holy Quran criticizing them. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, Page 1. Before departing for this great expedition, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, encouraged the people of Medina to contribute financially towards it. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, offered half his wealth in charity. Whereas Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, donated all his wealth. When he was asked about what he left for his family, he replied that he left Allah, the Exalted, and his Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, for them. This has been discussed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3675. This event indicates their zeal for sacrificing for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This incident is connected to Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 92. Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. And whatever you spend, indeed Allah is knowing of it. This verse makes it clear that a person cannot be a true believer, meaning they will possess a defect in their faith until they are willing to dedicate the things they love for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Even though many believe this verse applies to wealth, but it in fact means much more. It includes every blessing which a Muslim likes and loves. For example, Muslims are happy to dedicate their precious time on the things which please them. But they refuse to dedicate time to pleasing Allah, the Exalted, beyond the obligatory duties which barely takes an hour or two in one's day. Countless Muslims are happy to dedicate their physical strength in different pleasurable activities, yet, Many of them refuse to dedicate it to the things which please Allah, the Exalted, such as voluntary fasting. More commonly, people are happy to strive in things which they desire, like obtaining excess wealth which they do not need, even if it means they have to do overtime and give up their sleep. Yet how many strive in this way in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience? How many give up their precious sleep in order to offer voluntary prayers? It is strange that Muslims desire lawful, worldly and religious blessings yet overlook a simple fact. That they will only gain these things when they dedicate the blessings they possess in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. How can they dedicate minimal things to Him and still expect to achieve all their dreams? This attitude is truly strange. Patience and Contentment in the ninth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina Allah, the Exalted, commanded the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to firstly preach Islam and if necessary fight against the great Byzantine Empire. This led to the Battle of Tabak. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, commanded the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, 
to make preparations for the Battle of Tabuk during a period of extreme heat and discomfort. In addition, the journey would be long and extremely difficult. A total of 30,000 soldiers joined him for this expedition, but some held back out of negligence or hypocrisy. During the journey the army suffered great hunger and thirst. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, requested permission to slaughter and eat their water transport camels. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, granted them permission to do so, but before they could Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised that this would lead to a shortage of transport. He advised the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to gather all the food available and supplicate to Allah, the Exalted, for blessings in it. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, again agreed to this suggestion, and miraculously a small amount of food filled all their containers and they all ate to satisfaction. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, pages 11 to 12. One of the things to note is that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, could have easily suggested to supplicate instead of slaughtering their camels himself. One of the wisdoms behind his behavior is to teach the importance of contentment with the choices and decrees of Allah, the Exalted. The difference between patience and contentment is that the one who is patient does not complain about a situation but desires and even supplicates for the situation to change. Whereas, the one who is content prefers the choice of Allah, the Exalted, over their own choice and therefore does not desire things to change. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, could have easily supplicated to Allah, the Exalted, instead of giving permission to slaughter the camels. But he did not desire to potentially contradict the will of Allah, the Exalted, as Allah, the Exalted, may have wanted him to remain content. Even though a supplication would have been lawful, yet he desired to perfect servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, and therefore remained silent, trusting in the choice of Allah, the Exalted. Only after being requested to do so, did he supplicate. The lesson to learn, is that even though some situations appear and feel distressing in the long run, the things which occur are better for a Muslim than what they desire, even if they do not immediately observe the wisdom behind them. Perhaps experiencing a difficulty may well be the reason a Muslim is admitted into paradise. So it is important to at least be patient if one cannot be content with the decree of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 but perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. A Muslim should also remember that the one who chose the situation for them, namely Allah, the Exalted, is the only one who can take them safely out of it. This is only achieved through obedience to him by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Chapter 65 at Talik verse 2 and whoever fears Allah, he will make for him a way out. Most knowledgeable. Umar ibn Qatab, like all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, was devoted to learning and acting on Islamic knowledge. But it is obvious he surpassed many of them in this and many other blessed things. For example, Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that no one except Abu Bakr and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, would issue legal rulings during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al-Kulafa, page 18. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2645, that when Allah, the Exalted, desires to give someone good, He provides them with Islamic knowledge. There is no doubt that every Muslim, irrespective of the strength of their faith, desires good in both worlds. Even though many Muslims incorrectly believe that this good which they desire lies in fame, wealth, authority, companionship, and their career, this narration makes it crystal clear that true lasting good lies in gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge. It is important to note a branch of religious knowledge is useful, worldly knowledge, whereby one earns lawful provision in order to fulfill their necessities and the necessities of their dependents. Even though the Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
peace and blessings be upon him, has pointed out where good lies, yet it is a shame how many Muslims do not place much value in this. They in most cases only strive to obtain the bare minimum of Islamic knowledge in order to fulfill their obligatory duties, and fail to acquire and act on more such as the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Instead they dedicate their efforts on worldly things believing true good is found there. Many Muslims fail to appreciate that the righteous predecessors had to journey for weeks on end just to learn a single verse or narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, whereas today one can study Islamic teachings without leaving their home. Yet, many fail to make use of this blessing given to the modern-day Muslims. Out of his infinite mercy Allah, the Exalted, through his Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has not only pointed out where true good lies, but he has also placed this good at one's fingertips. Allah, the Exalted, has informed mankind of where an eternal buried treasure is located, which can solve all the problems they may encounter in both worlds. But Muslims will only obtain this good once they struggle to acquire and act on it. Mutual Consultation Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that the following verse specifically refers to Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Qatab. May Allah be pleased with them, and generally to others. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 159 So by mercy from Allah, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, you were lenient with them, and consult them in the matter. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al kulafa page 28. Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Guarding Prophethood Abdullah bin Umar and Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with them, have both said that the following verse was specifically revealed about Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Khattab. May Allah be pleased with them, and generally for others. Chapter 66 at Tarim, verse 4 But if you cooperate against him, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then indeed Allah is his protector, and Gabriel and the righteous of the believers. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al kulafa pages 28 to 29. The essence of defending the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is sincerity. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes striving to acquire knowledge in order to act on his traditions. These traditions include the ones related to Allah, the Exalted, in the form of worship and his blessed noble character towards the creation. Chapter 68 al kalam verse 4 And indeed you are of a great moral character. It includes to accept his commands and prohibitions at all times. This has been made a duty by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 59 Al-Hash, verse 7 And whatever the Messenger has given you, take and what he has forbidden you, refrain from. Sincerity includes to give priority to his traditions over the actions of anyone else, as all paths to Allah, the Exalted, are closed except the path of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 31 
Say, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. If you should love Allah then follow me, so Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. One must love all those who supported him during his life and after his passing, whether they are from his family or his companions. May Allah be pleased with them all. Supporting those who walk on his path and teach his traditions is a duty on those who desire to be sincere to him. Sincerity also includes loving those who love him and disliking those who criticize him irrespective of one's relationship with these people. This is all summarized in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 16. It advises that a person cannot have true faith until they love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, more than the entire creation. This love must be shown through actions not just words. Practical Role Models In the eleventh year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the symptoms of his final illness began to appear. When his illness grew intense, he ordered a companion, Abdullah bin Zamah, may Allah be pleased with him, to tell Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, to lead the congregational prayer. When Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, entered the mosque who could not find Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, and as he did not desire for the prayer to be delayed, he told Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, to lead the prayer instead. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, began the prayer, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, overheard his voice and declared that Allah, the Exalted, and the Muslims refuse anyone except Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, then arrived and prayed with the people. Later on Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, criticized Abdullah bin Zama, may Allah be pleased with him, as he believed the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, ordered him to lead the prayer otherwise he would never have done so. Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, apologized but added that as Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was absent from the mosque at that time. He believed that no one was more worthy of leading the prayer after Abu Bakr than Umar, may Allah be pleased with them. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, pages 332 to 333. First of all this incident, like many others, clearly indicates that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was the desired choice of being the first Caliph of Islam. In addition, this particular incident played out in such a way that it even indicated that the second Caliph of Islam should be Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. The important thing to note is that these pious souls were chosen for leadership as they possessed the qualities of a good leader the greatest of which is leading by example. This quality all Muslims should strive to adopt, as every Muslim is a representative of Islam for other Muslims and non-Muslims. In the early days of Islam, to attend a gathering of Islamic knowledge one had to journey for days, but now countless lectures can be found online. Yet, ignorance of the correct path has only increased since the passing of the righteous predecessors. This is because some have acquired knowledge by memorizing verses of the Holy Quran and narrations of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but have not used them to purify their character. Meaning, they did not act on their knowledge. Those who act like this will lose the power to affect the hearts of others through their advice. Some lecturers are like news bulletins that only provide information without stimulating others to act thereby failing in their duty to guide others through their God-given knowledge. Non-Muslims are mainly accepting Islam through their own research of Islam, instead of observing a practical example of a successful Muslim. One who desires to spread Islam must make it their priority to purify their character through knowledge. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3 Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. When one ACTS in this way, then a little correct knowledge will have a massive impact on themselves and others. Whereas, those who reject this correct attitude may possess more knowledge, but it will have no positive effect on anybody. This type of person has been described in the Holy Quran. Chapter 62 al Jumu'ah, verse 5 And then did not take it on, did not act on their knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. Devotion to Allah, the Exalted. 
In the eleventh year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the symptoms of his final illness began to appear. Before his illness the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised that no Holy Prophet, peace be upon them, would be taken by death until he saw his resting place in paradise and had been asked to make a choice between life and death. During his final moments he raised his sight to the sky and declared to the highest companion meaning to Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, page 343. It is important for Muslims to recognize why they worship Allah, the Exalted, as this reason can be a cause for an increase in obedience to Allah, the Exalted, or in some cases it can lead to disobedience. When one worships Allah, the Exalted, in order to gain lawful worldly things from Him, they run the risk of becoming disobedient to Him. This type of person has been mentioned in the Holy Quran. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 And of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge. If he is touched by good he is reassured by it, but if he is struck by trial he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. As they obey Allah, the Exalted, in order to receive worldly blessings the moment they fail to receive them or encounter a difficulty, they often become angered which turns them away from the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. These people often obey and disobey Allah, the Exalted, according to the situation they are facing, which in reality contradicts true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. Even though, desiring lawful worldly things from Allah, the Exalted, is acceptable in Islam yet, if one persists with this attitude, they may become like those mentioned in this verse. It is far better to worship Allah, the Exalted, in order to be saved in the hereafter and obtain paradise. This person is unlikely to alter their behavior when encountering difficulties. But the highest and best reason is to obey Allah, the Exalted, simply because He is their Lord and the Lord of the universe. This Muslim, if sincere, will remain steadfast in all situations, and through this obedience they will be granted both worldly and religious blessings which outstrip the worldly blessings the first type of person would ever receive. It is important for Muslims to reflect on their intention and if necessary, correct it, so that it encourages them to remain firm on the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience in all situations. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was transported by Allah, the Exalted, from this transient abode away into eternal ease in an elevated place on high, the most exalted and most splendid level of paradise. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 79 It is expected that your Lord will resurrect you to a praise station. And chapter 93 ad duha verses 4-5 and the hereafter is better for you than the first life. And your Lord is going to give you, and you will be satisfied. That was after he had completed his mission that Allah, the Exalted, entrusted him with. He had given advice to his nation, and had directed them to the very best in both worlds. He had warned them and restrained them from what would have harmed them here on earth and in the hereafter. Peace and blessings be upon him, the final messenger of Allah, the Exalted, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Life after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Remaining obedient. In the eleventh year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the symptoms of his final illness began to appear. After the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, passed away, the people of Medina fell into great anxiety and confusion. Due to their intense sadness, each person reacted differently to the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, initially refused to believe it and claimed that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had gone to visit Allah, the Exalted, and would return just like the Holy Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, had an appointment with Allah, the Exalted, and as a result left his people for 40 days. 
When Abu Bakr Sadiq, may Allah be pleased with him, arrived, he addressed the people in the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. He recited Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 144. Muhammad is not but a messenger. Other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die or be killed, would you turn back on your heels to unbelief? And he who turns back on his heels will never harm Allah at all. And then said the following, Allah, the Exalted, gave life to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and kept him alive until he had established the religion of Allah, the Exalted, made the orders of Allah, the Exalted plain, delivered his message and fought in his cause. Day after Allah, the Exalted, took him to himself and left you upon the path. And none shall perish except after clear signs and pain. Those whose Lord is Allah, the Exalted, should know that Allah, the Exalted, is alive and will never die. And those who worshipped the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, should know that he has died. Fear Allah, the Exalted People. Hold fast to your religion and put your trust in your Lord. The religion of Allah, the Exalted, is established. The word of Allah, the Exalted, is complete. Allah, the Exalted, will help those who support Him and who revere His religion. The Book of Allah, the Exalted, is amongst us. It is both the light and the cure. By it Allah, the Exalted, guided the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. In it states what Allah, the Exalted, considers lawful and what is unlawful. We will not care who out of the creation descends upon us to attack us. We will fight vigorously against those who oppose us, just as we fought alongside the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. After Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, addressed the people, they all accepted the truth. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, felt dizzy and fell to the ground and finally accepted that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, had in fact died. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, pages 348 to 349, and in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 139 to 141. Supporting the Truth In the eleventh year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, the symptoms of his final illness began to appear. After the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, passed away, the people of Medina fell into great anxiety and confusion. At this time the companions from Mecca and Medina, may Allah be pleased with them, agreed to elect Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, as the first Caliph of Islam. This has been discussed in the narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, Numbers 3667 and 3668. An important lesson to learn from this event is the importance of supporting others in matters of good. It is clear from this and other narrations that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people to choose someone else as their caliph. In fact, he even named Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him. This was the perfect opportunity for Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, to take the important role as the first representative of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, without any arguments or problems. But Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, chose to do the right thing and help the Muslim nation by appointing the best person for the role. He did not worry that if he supported someone else, his rank and social status would be reduced or he would be forgotten. In fact, his honor and social status only grew after this right choice. Unfortunately, Many Muslims and even Islamic institutions do not behave in this manner. They often only support those they have a relationship with, instead of helping anyone who does something good. They behave as if their social status will be reduced if they support others in good things. Some have fallen even lower and support their friends and relatives in bad things and fail to support strangers who are doing good. This is a major reason why the Islamic community has weakened over time. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were small in number, but always fulfilled their duty by supporting each other in matters of good without worrying about anything else. 
Muslims must change their attitude and follow in their footsteps if they desire strength and respect in both worlds. Chapter 5 Al-Maidah, verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. In addition, even though it was clear Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was the preferred choice by even the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, yet he did not nominate him explicitly. One of the reasons for this is that the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and nominating a new leader was a test from Allah, the Exalted. A test to see whether the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would argue and fight for leadership or submit sincerely to Allah, the Exalted, and nominate the best person for the role. As history clearly shows, they passed this test with flying colors. Therefore, it was a test for them, and a lesson for the future Muslims, to always strive to aid others in what is good. In addition, if he was appointed explicitly by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then some people in the future would have stated the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were never unanimously pleased with his appointment, and they only accepted it because they were commanded to do so. Therefore, avoiding an explicit command allowed prevented this false belief, as the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were left to choose their leader under the implicit indications that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, should be the first caliph of Islam. This further enhanced the right of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, as caliph, as he was implicitly indicated by the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and independently appointed by the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Concentrating on more relevant issues. The nomination of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, as the first caliph of Islam and Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, as the second caliph, have always been a topic of much debate. Rightly guided scholars have often abundantly discussed the overwhelming evidence of their right to be the first and second caliph of Islam in order to unite the two groups on the truth, the Sunnis and the Shia. Even though this is a worthy aim, nonetheless the average Muslim should not delve into these discussions or other similar discussions, such as the disagreements amongst the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, as these are issues Allah, the Exalted, will not ask them about on the Day of Judgment. These issues are between Allah, the Exalted, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 141 That is a nation which has passed on. It will have the consequence of what it earned, and you will have what you have earned. And you will not be asked about what they used to do. A Muslim must firmly believe that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were rightly guided, and that Allah, the Exalted, was pleased with all of them. This has been proven by the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. For example, chapter 9 at Tawbah, verse 100. And the first forerunners in the faith among the Mahajirin, migrants from Mecca, and the Ansar, residents of Medina, and those who followed them with good conduct, Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him, and he has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow wherein they will abide forever. That is the great attainment. As these issues will not be asked about on Judgment Day, a Muslim must instead concentrate on the things which will be asked about on Judgment Day. Only after a Muslim has fully understood and acted upon the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, do they have a right to address other issues. As virtually no one has reached this level, one must ensure they concentrate on the issues that are relevant, meaning the issues which will determine whether they will go to paradise or hell. A fine sermon. The day after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, died, Abu Bakr sat on the pulpit while Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them, gave a sermon. He said, O oh people, yesterday I said things to you that were not appropriate. I did not find that in the Book of Allah, the Exalted, and that was not something the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told me. But I thought that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would continue to lead us until he would be the last one of us to die. But Allah, the Exalted, has left amongst you his book in which is the guidance of Allah, the Exalted, and his Holy Prophet, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. 
If you adhere to it, Allah, the Exalted, will guide you to that to which He guided him. Allah, the Exalted, has united you under the leadership of the best among you, the companion of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the second of two when they were in the cave. So get up and swear your allegiance to him. Umar encouraged the people to unite under the one who was most worthy of leading them, without showing any signs of envy. His actions avoided divisions and tribulations for the people, and strengthened the Muslims for the oncoming difficulties they were destined to face. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 143. Muslims must emulate him by adopting the characteristics which help unify the Muslims. A narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6541, discusses some aspects of creating unity within society. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, firstly advised Muslims not to envy each other. This is when a person desires to obtain the very blessing someone else possesses meaning. They desire for the owner to lose the blessing. And it involves disliking the fact that the owner was given the blessing by Allah, the Exalted, instead of them. Some only desire this to occur in their hearts without showing it through their actions or speech. If they dislike their thought and feeling, it is hoped that they will not be held accountable for their envy. Some exert efforts through their speech and actions in order to confiscate the blessing from the other person, which is undoubtedly a sin. The worst kind is when a person strives to remove the blessing from the owner, even if the envier does not obtain the blessing. Envy is only lawful when a person does not act on their feelings, dislikes their feeling, and if they strive to obtain a similar blessing without the owner losing the blessing they possess. Even though this type is not sinful yet, it is disliked if the envy is over a worldly blessing and only praiseworthy if it involves a religious blessing. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned two examples of the praiseworthy type in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The first is when a person envies the one who acquires and spends lawful wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. The second is when a person envies the one who uses their wisdom and knowledge in the correct way and teaches it to others. The evil type of envy, as mentioned earlier, directly challenges the choice of Allah, the Exalted. The envious person behaves as if Allah, the Exalted, made a mistake giving a particular blessing to someone else instead of them. This is why it is a major sin. In fact, as warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903, envy destroys good deeds just like fire consumes wood. An envious Muslim must strive to act on the narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. It advises that a person cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. An envious Muslim should therefore strive to remove this feeling from their heart by showing good character and kindness towards the person they envy, such as praising their good qualities and supplicating for them until their envy becomes love for them. Another thing advised in the main narration quoted at the beginning is that Muslims should not hate each other. This means one should only dislike something if Allah, the Exalted, dislikes it. This has been described as an aspect of perfecting one's faith in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. A Muslim should therefore not dislike things or people according to their own desires. If one dislikes another according to their own desires, they should never allow it to affect their speech or actions, as it is sinful. A Muslim should strive to remove the feeling by treating the other according to the teachings of Islam meaning, with respect and kindness. A Muslim should remember that other people are not perfect, just like they are not perfect. And if others possess a bad characteristic, they will undoubtedly possess good qualities also. Therefore, a Muslim should advise others to abandon their bad characteristics, but continue to love the good qualities they possess. Another point must be made on this topic. A Muslim who follows a particular scholar who advocates a specific belief should not act like a fanatic and believe their scholar is always right thereby hating those who oppose their scholar's opinion. 
This behavior is not disliking something someone for the sake of Allah, the exalted. As long as there is a legitimate difference of opinion amongst the scholars, a Muslim following a particular scholar should respect this and not dislike others who differ from what the scholar they follow believes. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Muslims should not turn away from each other. This means they should not sever ties with other Muslims over worldly issues, thereby refusing to support them according to the teachings of Islam. According to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6077, it is unlawful for a Muslim to sever ties with another Muslim over a worldly issue for more than three days. In fact, the one who severs ties for more than a year over a worldly issue is considered like the one who has killed another Muslim. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4915. Severing ties with others is only lawful in matters of faith. But even then, a Muslim should continue to advise the other Muslim to sincerely repent and only avoid their company if they refuse to change for the better. They should still support them on lawful things when they are requested to do so, as this act of kindness may inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins. Another thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Muslims are commanded to be like brothers to one another. This is only achievable if they obey the previous advice given in this narration and strive to fulfill their duty towards other Muslims according to the teachings of Islam, such as helping others in matters of good and warning them from evil matters. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1240, advises that a Muslim should fulfill the following rights of other Muslims. They are to return the Islamic greeting of peace, to visit the sick, to take part in their funeral prayers, and to reply to the sneezer who praises Allah, the exalted. A Muslim must learn and fulfill all the rights other people, especially other Muslims, have over them. Another thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that a Muslim should not wrong, forsake or hate another Muslim. The sins a person commits should be hated, but the sinner should not be as they may sincerely repent at any time. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4884, that whoever humiliates another Muslim Allah, the exalted, will humiliate them. And whoever protects a Muslim from humiliation will be protected by Allah, the Exalted. The negative characteristics mentioned in the main narration quoted at the beginning can develop when one adopts pride. According to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, pride is when one looks down on others in contempt. The proud person sees themselves as perfect while seeing others as imperfect. This prevents them from fulfilling the rights of others and encourages them to dislike others. Another thing mentioned in the main narration is that true piety is not in one's physical appearance, such as wearing beautiful clothes, but it is an internal characteristic. This internal characteristic manifests outwardly in the form of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4094, that when the spiritual heart is purified the whole body becomes purified, but when the spiritual heart is corrupt the whole body becomes corrupt. It is important to note that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge based on outward appearances such as wealth, but He considers the intentions and actions of people. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6542. Therefore, a Muslim must strive to adopt internal piety through learning and acting on the teachings of Islam, so that it manifests outwardly in the way they interact with Allah, the Exalted, and the Creation. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that it is a sin for a Muslim to hate another Muslim. This hatred applies to worldly things and not disliking others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, loving and hating for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of perfecting one's faith. 
This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. But even then, a Muslim must show respect to others in all cases, and dislike only their sins without actually hating the person. In addition, their dislike must never cause them to act against the teachings of Islam, as this would prove their hatred is based on their own desires and not for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The root cause of despising others for worldly reasons is pride. It is vital to understand that an atom's worth of pride is enough to take one to hell. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265. The next thing mentioned in the main narration is that a Muslim's life, property and honor are all sacred. A Muslim must not violate any of these rights without a just reason. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan and Nasa, number 4998, that a person cannot be a true Muslim until they protect other people, including non-Muslims, from their harmful speech and actions. And a true believer is the one who keeps their evil away from the lives and property of others. Whoever violates these rights will not be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted, until their victim forgives them first. If they do not, then justice will be established on Judgment Day, whereby the good deeds of the oppressor will be given to the victim, and if necessary, the sins of the victim will be given to the oppressor. This may cause the oppressor to be hurled into hell. This is warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should treat others exactly how they want people to treat them. This will lead to much blessings for an individual and create unity within their society. Leaving Stubbornness Many Arab tribes apostatized after the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Some of them began to follow false prophets, and others refused to donate the obligatory charity. These Arab tribes only accepted Islam when it became the dominant force in the region, and so therefore, their faith was always weak and based on blind imitation instead of certainty of faith. The false prophets took advantage of this weakness of faith, and the people's greed for worldly things overcame their weak faith. In addition, even though the vast majority initially advised Abu Bakr, such as Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with them, not to fight against the Arab tribes who had refused to pay the obligatory charity, he rejected their advice. He understood that rejecting that pillar of Islam was disbelief and therefore a clear reason to fight. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 314 to 317, and in narrations found in Sahih Bukhari, numbers 1399 to 1400. In reality, if Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, compromised on the obligatory charity, then misguided and ignorant Muslims till the end of time would have used him as an excuse to openly compromise on the teachings of Islam. Islam would have then lost its essence and only an empty shell would have remained, where people call themselves Muslims, yet fail to practice on any of its teachings. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was endowed with far-reaching perception and understood this when others failed to. This protection of the essence of Islam is why he fought those who refused to donate the obligatory charity. This perception is reflected in the short statement he gave to those who urged him not to fight, those who refused to give the obligatory charity. He said, Revelation has ceased to descend and the religion is complete. Shall I now allow it to decrease, to be changed or modified, while I am alive? This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 361. The other companions, may Allah be pleased with them, then understood fighting was the correct choice. The companions, may Allah be pleased with them, avoided adopting a stubborn attitude and instead submitted to the truth when it was made clear to them. Some adopt stubbornness in worldly matters, and as a result they do not change their character for the better. Instead, they remain steadfast on their attitude, believing this is somehow a sign of their great strength and wisdom. Steadfastness in matters of faith is a praiseworthy attitude, but in most worldly matters it is only called stubbornness, which is blameworthy. Unfortunately, 
Some believe if they change their attitude, it demonstrates weakness, or it shows that they are admitting their fault, and because of this, they stubbornly fail to change for the better. Adults behave like immature children by believing that if they change their behavior, it means they have lost, while others who remain steadfast on their attitude have won. This is simply childish. In reality, an intelligent person will remain steadfast on matters of faith, but in worldly matters they will change their attitude as long as it is not sinful in order to make their life easier. So changing to improve one's life is not a sign of weakness, it is in fact a sign of intelligence. In many cases, a person refuses to change their attitude and expects others in their life to change theirs, such as their relatives. But what often occurs is that due to stubbornness, all remain in the same state, which only leads to regular disagreements and arguments. A wise person understands that if the people around them do not change for the better than they should, this change will improve the quality of their life and their relationship with others, which is much better than going around in circular arguments with people. This positive attitude will eventually cause others to respect them, as it takes real strength to change one's character for the better. Those who remain stubborn will always find something to be annoyed about which will remove peace from their life. This will cause further difficulties in all aspects of their life, such as their mental health. But those who adapt and change for the better will always move from one station of peace to another. If one achieves this peace, does it really matter if others believe they only changed because they were wrong? To conclude, to remain steadfast on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is praiseworthy. But in worldly matters and in cases where no sin is committed, a person should learn to adapt and change their attitude so that they find some peace in this world. A worthy leader. During his final illness, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, dispatched an army under the leadership of Usama bin Zayed, may Allah be pleased with him, to al balqa and Palestine, in order to fight the Romans. This army remained camped three miles from Medina when they heard that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was sick. When he passed away, they returned to Medina for further instructions. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, decided to order the army to continue with their mission. Some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, showed some dislike for Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, leading the army, as he was extremely young and inexperienced, and was even appointed as leader over many senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them. Before his passing, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even criticized those who felt this way by declaring that he was worthy of leadership, just like his father, Zaid bin Haritha, may Allah be pleased with him, was worthy of leadership before him, even though people criticized his appointment to leadership also. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4469. After the passing of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and after Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, re-dispatched the army headed by Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, some of the companions encouraged Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with them, who was part of that army, to request Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, to reassign the leadership of the army to someone who was older and more experienced. After hearing this request, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, out of anger, seized the beard of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, and commented that how could he dismiss him when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, personally appointed him and made it clear that he was worthy of leadership. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 325 to 326. It is important to note that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who had an issue with the appointment of Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, were not displeased with the choice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. They only had an issue with his leadership, as he was extremely young and inexperienced in warfare. Having an experienced and awe-inspiring leader is an extremely important aspect of leadership during a battle. The leader who lacks these qualities may well cause hesitation within the hearts of the soldiers when he issues his commands. This hesitation is often the difference between life and death on the battlefield. 
This is why some of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, questioned his appointment as leader. In addition, Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, was worthy of leadership as he led by example. It is important for all Muslims, especially parents, to act on what they advise to others. It is obvious if one turns the pages of history, that those who acted on what they preached, had a much more positive effect on others, compared to those who did not lead by example. The best example being the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who not only practiced what he preached, but adhered to those teachings more strictly than anyone else. Only with this attitude will Muslims especially, parents have a positive impact on others. For example, if a mother warns her children not to lie, as it is a sin, but often lies in front of them, her children are unlikely to act on her advice. A person's actions will always have more of an impact on others than their speech. It is important to note that this does not mean one needs to be perfect before advising others. It means they should sincerely strive to act on their own advice before advising others. The Holy Quran has made it clear in the following verse that Allah, the Exalted, hates this behavior. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, that the a person who commanded good but refrained from it themselves and prohibited evil yet acted on it themselves will be punished in severely hell. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3 Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. So it is vital for all Muslims to strive to act on their advice themselves, then advise others to do the same. Leading by example is the tradition of all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, and is the best way to affect others in a positive way. Finally, even though Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, was very young, yet as he was raised in the correct way of meaning, according to the teachings of Islam, he became a noble person and leader. Muslims must pay close attention to raising the youth according to the teachings of Islam, so that they ensure the next generation of Muslims become noble and praiseworthy. For example, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1952, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advise that the most virtuous gift a parent can give their child is to teach them good character. This narration reminds Muslims to be more concerned about the faith of their relatives, such as their children, over acquiring and imparting wealth and properties to them. It is important to understand, worldly legacies come and go. How many rich and powerful people have built massive empires, only for them to be torn apart and forgotten shortly after their death? The few signs left behind from some of these legacies only endure in order to warn people not to follow in their footsteps. An example is the great empire of Pharaoh. Unfortunately, many Muslims are so concerned about teaching their children how to build an empire and acquire much wealth and properties, that they neglect teaching them the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This includes good manners towards Allah, the Exalted, and the creation. A Muslim should not be fooled into believing they have plenty of time for teaching their children good manners, as their moment of death is unknown and often pounces on people unexpectedly. In addition, it is extremely difficult to teach good manners to children when they get older and become set in their ways. Today is the day a Muslim should truly reflect on the gift they wish to impart to their children and relatives. This is how a Muslim sends forward good to the hereafter, but also leaves good behind as a righteous child which supplicates for their deceased parent benefits them. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1376. It is hoped that the one who is surrounded by good in this way will be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted. Holding on to faith. Prior to the death of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, the false prophet Aswad al-Ansi began to spread his message and forced people to believe in him. Abu Muslim al kalani may Allah have mercy on him, remained firm on Islam, which resulted in Aswad ordering for him to be thrown into a large fire. To the amazement of the people, the fire did not harm Abu Muslim, may Allah have mercy on him. 
Aswad was then advised to exile him, before this miracle became a means for the people to reject him. Abu Muslim, may Allah have mercy on him, eventually reached Medina during the caliphate of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. After entering the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he was questioned about his identity by Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. As the latter was perceptive, he inquired if he was the man who Allah, the Exalted, protected from the fire. Abu Muslim, may Allah have mercy on him, was forced to admit the truth and as a result Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, proudly seated him in between himself and Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, praised Allah, the Exalted, for showing him a person who he protected from fire, just like he protected the Holy Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. Chapter 21 Al-Anbiya, verses 28 to 29. They said, Burn him, Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him, and support your gods, if you are to act. We Allah said, O fire, be coolness and safety upon Abraham. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 422 to 423. Generally speaking, this incident indicates the importance of holding on to one's faith in times of extreme difficulties. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7400, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who continues worshipping Allah, the Exalted, during widespread turmoil and seditions is like the one who has emigrated to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his lifetime. The reward of emigrating to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his lifetime was a great deed. In fact, it erased all of one's previous sins according to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 321. Worshipping Allah, the Exalted, means to continue sincerely obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It is obvious that the time mentioned in this narration has arrived. It has become very easy to become misguided from the teachings of Islam as worldly desires have opened up for the Muslim nation. Therefore, Muslims should not get distracted by them and avoid controversial issues and people, and instead remain obedient to Allah, the Exalted, in every aspect of their life if they desire to obtain the reward mentioned in this narration. Justice During the Caliphate of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, two Muslims requested him to give him a piece of swampy land which was not being used at all. They insisted they could cultivate the land, so some benefit could be derived from it. Initially, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, agreed after seeking counsel from the Muslims who were with him at that time. When Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed what occurred, he angrily destroyed the document which had this decision recorded on it, and told Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, it was not fair to give them the land as it belonged to the public. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, agreed with him and reversed his decision. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 149 to 150. Even though the decision of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was good as the land would have been used in a beneficial way, but Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, believed it was not correct to give them public land as it belonged to all the Muslims. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4721, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that those who acted with justice will be sitting on thrones of light close to Allah, the Exalted, on Judgment Day. This includes those who are just in their decisions, in respect to their families and those under their care and authority. It is important for Muslims to always act with justice in all occasions. One must show justice to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. They must use all the blessings they have been granted, in the correct way, according to the teachings of Islam. This includes being just to their own body and mind, by fulfilling their rights of food and rest, as well as using each limb according to its true purpose. 
Islam does not teach Muslims to push their body and minds beyond their limits, thereby causing them self-harm. One should be just in respect to people, by treating them how they wish to be treated by others. They should never compromise on the teachings of Islam, by committing injustice to people, in order to obtain worldly things. This will be a major cause of people entering hell, which has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. They should remain just even if it contradicts their desires and the desires of their loved ones. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, Allah is more worthy of both. Point one, so follow not personal inclination, lest you not be just. One must be just towards their dependents, by fulfilling their rights and necessities, according to the teachings of Islam, which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. They should not be neglected, nor handed over to others such as school and mosque teachers. A person should not take on this responsibility, if they are too lazy to act with justice in regards to them. To conclude, no person is free of acting with justice, as the minimum is acting with justice in respect to Allah, the exalted, and oneself. Gathering the Quran After the battle of Yamama, which led to many Muslim casualties, many of whom had memorized the Holy Quran, Umar ibn Qatab encouraged Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, to gather the Holy Quran in book form out of fear that the verses might become lost if the memorizers of the Holy Quran continued to die or be martyred during battles. Prior to this, the verses of the Holy Quran were not contained in a single book. Instead they were either memorized or written on various different objects, such as rocks, which were in the possession of different people. Initially, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, showed some hesitation, as he did not desire to do something the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not do. He was very strict in following the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But when Umar persisted eventually, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, understood that this was the best course of action in order to secure the verses of the Holy Quran for the future generations. Abu Bakr appointed Zayed bin Thabit, may Allah be pleased with them, for this momentous and difficult task. He worked tirelessly in order to gather the Holy Quran in book form. The copy remained with Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, until he died. Then it was passed on to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, and eventually to his daughter and the mother of the believers Hafsa bint Umar, may Allah be pleased with her. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7191. They worked tirelessly to ensure the Holy Quran reached the future Muslims. Therefore, Muslims must honor their noble legacy by fulfilling the rites of the Holy Quran, as this was the purpose of their sacrifices. In a narration found in Imam Munzari's Awareness and Apprehension, number 30, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him advise that the Holy Quran will intercede on Judgment Day. Those who follow it during their lives on earth will be led to paradise on Judgment Day. But those who neglect it during their lives on earth will find that it pushes them into hell on Judgment Day. The Holy Quran is a book of guidance. It is not merely a book of recitation. Muslims must therefore strive to fulfill all aspects of the Holy Quran to ensure that it guides them to success in both worlds. The first aspect is reciting it correctly and regularly. The second aspect is to understand it. And the final aspect is to act on its teachings according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Those who behave in such a manner are the ones who are given glad tidings of right guidance through every difficulty in this world and its intercession on the Day of Judgment. But as warned by this narration, the Holy Quran is only guidance and a mercy for those who correctly act on its aspects, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But those who misinterpret it and instead act according to their desires in order to gain worldly things, such as fame, will be deprived of this right guidance and its intercession on Judgment Day. 
In fact, their complete loss in both worlds will only increase until they sincerely repent. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Finally, it is important to understand that even though the Holy Quran is a cure for worldly problems, a Muslim should not only use it for this purpose. Meaning, they should not only recite it in order to fix their worldly problems thereby. Treating the Holy Quran like a tool which is removed during a difficulty and then placed back in a toolbox. The main function of the Holy Quran is to guide one to the hereafter safely. Neglecting this main function and only using it to fix one's worldly problems is not correct as it contradicts the behavior of a true Muslim. It is like the one who purchases a car with many different accessories, yet it possesses no engine. There is no doubt that this person is simply foolish. For the greater good. During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, sought the advice of the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in respect to nominating the next Caliph of Islam. Each companion, may Allah be pleased with them, who was consulted, confirmed that Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was the right man for the job, as he was undoubtedly the best of them, second only to Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 724 to 725. The first thing to note is that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was not considering the next caliph based on worldly reasons such as family ties, friendship, etc. He did not appoint a relative, like his son, desiring thereby to carry on his name. Unlike the leaders of today, his decision was solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, and based on who was best for the role. In addition, Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Fearing leadership when Abu Bakr made his decision to appoint Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with them, as the next caliph, the latter blankly refused out of fear for the trials leadership brings with it. But Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, insisted until he forced Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to agree. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 728. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2376, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that craving for wealth and status is more destructive to one's faith than the destruction caused by two hungry wolves which are set free on a herd of sheep. This shows that hardly any of a Muslim's faith remains secure if they crave after wealth and fame in this world, just as hardly any of the sheep will be saved from two hungry wolves. So this great similitude, contains a severe warning against the evil of craving after excess wealth and social status in the world. A person's craving for fame and status is arguably more destructive to one's faith than craving for excess wealth. A person will often spend their beloved wealth on obtaining fame and prestige. It is rare for someone to obtain status and fame and still remain firm on the correct path whereby they prioritize the hereafter over the material world. In fact, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6723, 
warns that a person who seeks status in society, such as leadership, will be left to deal with it themselves. But if someone receives it without asking for it, they will be aided by Allah, the Exalted, in remaining obedient to Him. This is the reason the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, would not appoint a person who requested to be appointed in a position of authority, or even showed desire for it. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6923. Another narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7148, warns that people will be keen to obtain status and authority, but it will be a great regret for them on the Day of Judgment. This is a dangerous craving as it forces one to strive intensely to obtain it, and then strive further in order to hold on to it, even if it encourages them to commit oppression and other sins. The worst type of craving for status is when one obtains this through religion. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2654, that this person will go to hell. Therefore, it is safer for a Muslim to avoid the craving for excess wealth and high social status, as they are two things which can lead to the destruction of their faith by distracting them from preparing adequately for the hereafter. Obeying in good things During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, publicly addressed the people of Medina and informed him of his decision to appoint Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, as the next Caliph of Islam. They all declared that they would listen and obey Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, page 728. According to one account, before naming Umar ibn Khattab, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with them, asked the people if they would be content with the person he chose. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, stood up and declared they would not be pleased unless it was Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al-Kulafa, page 71. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the leaders of society. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, narration number 20, fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note, this obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. Sending ahead good. During his final illness, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised his family to wash the clothes he was wearing and enshroud him in them, instead of buying a new garment as his shroud. When he was requested for permission to buy a new shroud, he replied that the living were more deserving of new garments than the dead. Even though Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was the caliph of the Muslim nation, yet he chose to lead a simple life, a life of poverty, just like the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He was too busy striving to benefit the people, to worry about his own needs. By sacrificing his own comfort, he aimed to make the lives of his people comfortable. The paltry salary he took from the treasury over his two years as caliph was also returned to the public treasury, 
thereby ensuring he served the Muslims solely for the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted. He took nothing from this world, and the world took nothing from him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, the biography of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, pages 734 to 735. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, concentrated more on preparing for his final journey to the hereafter than to accumulate, hoard, and enjoy the luxuries of this world. How far are the leaders of today and the common Muslims from this blessed attitude? In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6514, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that two things abandon a deceased at their grave and only one thing remains with them. The two things which abandon them are their family and wealth, and the only thing which remains with them are their deeds. Throughout history, people have always concentrated the majority of their efforts to obtaining wealth and a happy family. Even though Islam does not prohibit these things, as they may be required to fulfill one's responsibilities for example, wealth is required to support one's dependents. Islam only discourages Muslims from striving for them beyond their needs and prioritizing them over more important duties, such as performing righteous deeds. One must strive to obtain the needed wealth to fulfill their responsibilities, according to the teachings of Islam and obtain a family which will encourage them to prepare for the hereafter. These are both considered good deeds when utilized in such a manner. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6373. This is the sign of an intelligent person who gives priority to the thing which will endure and support them in their moment of need namely, righteous deeds. On the other hand, the one who allows their wealth and relatives to preoccupy them from fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, and refraining from his prohibitions, are described as losers in the Holy Quran. Chapter 63 Al-Munafikan, verse 9 O you who have believed, let not your wealth and your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah. And whoever does that, then those are the losers. Some may incorrectly believe they are close to Allah, the Exalted, as He has bestowed them with great wealth and family. But Allah, the Exalted, clears their confusion by declaring that the one who is dearer and nearer to Him are those who believe and perform righteous deeds. Chapter 34 Saba, verse 37 And it is not your wealth or your children that bring you nearer to us in position, but it is by being one who has believed and done righteousness. In another place of the Holy Quran Allah, the Exalted, warns mankind that their wealth and relatives will not benefit them in the hereafter unless they reach the hereafter with a sound heart. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verses 88 to 89 The day when there will not benefit anyone wealth or children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. The definition of the sound heart is lengthy simply put one cannot obtain it until they sincerely fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. One's wealth can only benefit them in the hereafter if they send it ahead of them by spending it on ongoing charity projects. This is confirmed by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1376. The same narration informs mankind that a righteous child praying for the forgiveness of their deceased parent will be accepted also. Unfortunately, in this day and age, many children are too busy seeking their inheritance to supplicate for their deceased parents. It is important to understand that raising a righteous child who supplicates for their deceased parent is not possible to achieve if the parents do not perform righteous deeds themselves during their lives. Secondly, it is not the way of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, or his companions, may Allah be pleased with them all, to abstain from performing righteous deeds and hope others will pray for them after they depart from this world. One should strive for righteous deeds while they are alive, and then hope others will pray for them after they pass away. It is important to understand that only the wealth one sends forward will benefit them. This can be achieved by spending on fulfilling one's responsibilities, such as the education of their children. 
All wealth spent incorrectly will become a burden for the owner and may well lead to their punishment. Those who withhold the obligatory charity out of greed have been warned of dreadful punishments. For example, a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1403, warns that a person who commits this grave sin on the day of judgment will encounter a huge poisonous snake which will wrap around them and bite them continuously. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 180 And let not those who greedily withhold what Allah has given them of his bounty ever think that it is better for them. Rather, it is worse for them. Their necks will be encircled by what they withheld on the day of resurrection. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1658, warns that on the day of judgment, the gold and silver a person owned will be heated up in the flames of hell, and their bodies will be branded with it if they fail to donate the obligatory charity due on it. Any wealth left behind by the deceased will be left to others to enjoy while the deceased is held accountable for collecting it. It is important to note, if a person knowingly leaves wealth to someone who is not fit to possess it, and thus misuses it, then the deceased may well be held accountable for this also. Conversely, if one leaves wealth behind to someone who spends it correctly, then the deceased will face much regret on the day of judgment when they observe the great reward given to the one who spent it correctly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7420, that in reality a person can only use their wealth in three ways. The first is the wealth which is spent on their food. The second is the wealth spent on their clothes, and the final wealth is what they spend in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. All other wealth is left behind for other people to enjoy, while the deceased is held accountable for collecting it. Hoarding and incorrectly spending wealth inspires one to love the material world and dislike the hereafter, as they dislike leaving their much-loved wealth behind, which will occur when they die. The one who dislikes the hereafter will not adequately prepare for it. In addition, if one desires to adopt true piety, then they must be ready to spend their wealth for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 3 Ali Imran, verse 92 Never will you attain the good reward until you spend in the way of Allah from that which you love. In reality, wealth is a strange companion as it only benefits someone when it leaves them meaning when it is spent in the correct way. A person would be labeled a fool if they went on a long trip without any provisions. Similarly, the one who does not send their wealth ahead in the form of provisions for their long journey to the hereafter is also foolish. There is no doubt that one of the greatest pains a person feels at the time of death is when they realize that they are leaving behind their hard-earned wealth and journeying towards the hereafter empty-handed. A Muslim should avoid this outcome at all costs. Performing righteous deeds is the only way one prepares for their grave as no other things of comfort will be found there. It is in fact the means for preparing one's eternal home in the hereafter. Therefore, this preparation should take priority over preparing for the temporal material world. A person would be labeled a fool if they had two homes and dedicated the majority of their efforts on beautifying the home which they will spend less time in. Similarly, if a Muslim dedicates more time and effort in beautifying their temporal home in this world over the eternal home of the hereafter, they too are simply foolish. This is the attitude of some, even though they admit and believe their stay in this world is short and for an unknown length whereas, their stay in the hereafter will be eternal. This attitude indicates a lack of certainty of faith, and it is therefore vital for anyone who shares this mentality to seek and act on Islamic knowledge in order to strengthen their certainty of faith before they reach the hereafter, bereft of all good. The one who prepares for their grave with sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience will find that their good deeds provide comfort for them, whereas, the sins they're accumulated will only make their stay in the dark grave worse. A Muslim should therefore perform good deeds during their strength and ability, before their time of weakness arrives. Each Muslim should recognize the reality indicated in the main narration and act correctly with their possessions before they reach a time when their request to be given more time to perform righteous deeds will be denied.
Chapter 63 al munafikin verses 10 to 11. And spend in the way of Allah, from what we have provided you before death approaches one of you, and he says, My Lord, if only you would delay me for a brief term so I would give charity and be of the righteous. But never will Allah delay a soul when its time has come. They should reflect now on their deeds, so that they can sincerely repent from sins and strive harder to perform righteous deeds before a day arrives when reflecting will not benefit them. Chapter 89 Al-Fajr, verse 23 And brought within view that day is hell, that day man will remember but how i.e. what good to him will be the remembrance. Let each one ponder over those who passed away before them, and their inability to perform more righteous deeds, to comfort them in their moment of need. Make haste before this time arrives, and prepare for the inevitable. Chapter 15 al hijjah verse 99 And worship your Lord until there comes to you the certainty, i.e., death. A final counsel. During his final illness, Abu Bakr summoned Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with them, and gave him some final advice, which has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's, Hilyat al awliya number 59. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, advised him to firstly fear Allah, the Exalted, at all times. Piety, fearing Allah, the Exalted, cannot be achieved without gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge so that one can fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon, advised that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Therefore, an aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things takes a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful, and the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, this occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life, as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech which is not classified sinful by Islam often leads to evil speech, such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoids the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they will undoubtedly avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him that Allah, the Exalted, had set obligations that must be fulfilled by day, which he will not accept if they are completed at night. And he had set obligations that must be fulfilled at night, which he will not accept if they are done during the day. And he does not accept voluntary deeds until the obligatory deeds are performed first. This advice indicates the importance of adhering to the teachings of Islam and avoiding charting one's own course in life. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4606, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that any matter which is not based on Islam will be rejected. If Muslims desire lasting success in both worldly and religious matters, they must strictly adhere to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Even though, certain actions which are not directly taken from these two sources of guidance, can still be considered a righteous deed, it is important to prioritize these two sources of guidance over all else. Because the fact is that the more one ACTS on things which are not taken from these two sources, even if it is a righteous deed, the less they will act on these two sources of guidance. An obvious example is how many Muslims have adopted cultural practices into their lives which do not have a foundation in these two sources of guidance. Even if these cultural practices are not sins, 
They have preoccupied Muslims from learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, as they feel satisfied with their behavior. This leads to ignorance of the two sources of guidance, which in turn will only lead to misguidance. This is why a Muslim must learn and act on these two sources of guidance, which have been established by the leaders of guidance, and only then act on other voluntary righteous deeds if they have the time and energy to do so. But if they choose ignorance and made up practices, even if they are not sins over learning and acting on these two sources of guidance, they will not achieve success. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him that a person's scales on judgment day will weigh heavy in their favor when they follow the truth in this world, even though it was heavy upon them to do so. And a person's scales on judgment day will be light in their favor when they follow falsehood in this world. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive, such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins, cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience, which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised him that a servant must be balanced between fear and hope, fear of hell, and hope of obtaining paradise. The servant should not consider their devotion as valuable, nor should they despair of the mercy and favor of Allah, the Exalted. In a long divine narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 7405, Allah, the Exalted, advises that he ACTS and treats his servant according to their perception of him. This means if a Muslim has good thoughts and expects good from Allah, the Exalted, he in turn will not disappoint them. Similarly, if a person harbors negative thoughts about Allah, the Exalted, such as believing they will not be forgiven, then Allah, the Exalted, may act according to their belief. It is important to note, there is a vast difference between true hope in Allah, the Exalted, which this narration refers to, and wishful thinking. Wishful thinking is when one fails to strive in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience, and then expects Allah, the Exalted, to forgive them. This is not true hope, it is merely wishful thinking. This is like a farmer who fails to plant any seeds, fails to water their crop, and still hopes to reap a large harvest. True hope is when one strives to obey Allah, the Exalted, and whenever they slip up they sincerely repent, and then hope for the mercy and forgiveness of Allah, the Exalted. This is like a farmer who plants seeds, waters their crop, dedicates effort to keeping the crop healthy, and then hopes for a large harvest. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
has summarized this explanation in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2459. Generally speaking, a Muslim should harbor more fear of Allah, the Exalted, during their life as it prevents sins which is superior to hope, which inspires one to perform righteous deeds especially, the voluntary type. But during periods of illness and difficulty, and especially at the time of death, a Muslim should have nothing but hope in the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, even if they have spent their life disobeying Him, as this has specifically been commanded by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2877. The Caliphate of Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him. A humble Caliph. When he became Caliph, Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, ascended the pulpit and was about to sit on the same level Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, used to sit on, which was one level below the seat the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, used to sit on. But Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, paused and commented that he did not desire Allah, the Exalted, to see him putting himself on the same level as Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him. He then sat one level below the level Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, would sit on. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 172. This is connected to chapter 25 al-Furqan, verse 63. And the servants of the most merciful are those who walk upon the earth easily. The servants of Allah, the Exalted, have understood that anything good they possess is solely because Allah, the Exalted, granted it to them. And any evil they are saved from is because Allah, the Exalted, protected them. Is it not foolish to be proud of something that does not belong to someone? Just like a person does not boast about a sports car, which does not belong to them, Muslims must realize nothing in reality belongs to them. This attitude ensures one remains humble at all times. The humble servants of Allah, the Exalted, fully believe in the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5673, which declares that the righteous deeds of a person will not take them to paradise. Only the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, can cause this to occur. This is because every righteous deed is only possible when Allah, the Exalted, provides one with the knowledge, strength, opportunity and inspiration to perform it. Even the acceptance of the deed is dependent on the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. When one bears this in mind, it saves them from pride and inspires them to adopt humility. One should always remember that being humble is not a sign of weakness, as Islam has encouraged one to defend themselves if necessary. In other words, Islam teaches Muslims to be humble without weakness. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029, that whoever humbles themselves before Allah, the Exalted, will be raised by him. So in reality, humility leads to honor in both worlds. One only needs to reflect on the most humble of the creation to understand this fact, namely, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah, the Exalted, has clearly ordered people by ordering the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to adopt this important quality. Chapter 26 Ash Shu'ara, verse 215. And lower your wing, i.e., show kindness to those who follow you of the believers. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, led a humble life. For example, he happily carried out the domestic duties at home, thereby proving these chores are gender neutral. This is confirmed in Imam Bukhari's Adab al Mufrad, number 538. Humility is an inner characteristic that manifests outwards, such as the way one walks. This is discussed in another verse, chapter 31, Luke Man, verse 18. And do not turn your cheek in contempt toward people, and do not walk through the earth exultantly. Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear that paradise is for the humble servants who possess no trace of pride. Chapter 28, al Qasas, verse 83. That home of the hereafter we assign to those who do not desire exaltedness upon the earth or corruption. And the best outcome is for the righteous. 
In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1998, that whoever possesses an atom's worth of pride will not enter paradise. Only Allah, the Exalted, has the right to be proud, as He is the Creator, Sustainer, and Owner of the entire universe. It is important to note, pride is when one believes they are superior to others and rejects the truth when it is presented to them, as they dislike accepting the truth when it comes from other than them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4092. A Humble Sermon Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following short sermon has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's, Hilyat al awliya number 96. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, first supplicated to Allah, the Exalted, that he was rough and asked him to make him soft. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2701, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, loves gentleness in all matters. This is an important characteristic which must be adopted by all Muslims. It should be used in all aspects of one's life. It is important to understand that being gentle benefits the Muslim themselves more than anyone else. Not only will they receive blessings and reward from Allah, the Exalted, and minimize the amount of sins they commit, as a gentle person is less likely to commit sins through their speech and actions, but it benefits them in worldly affairs also. For example, the person who treats their spouse gently will gain more love and respect in return than if they treated their spouse in a harsh manner. Children are more likely to obey and treat their parents with respect when they are treated gently. Colleagues at work are more likely to help the one who is gentle with them. The examples are endless. Only in very rare cases is a harsh attitude required. In most cases, gentle behavior will be much more effective than a harsh attitude. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, possesses countless good qualities yet, Allah, the Exalted, specifically highlighted his gentleness in the Holy Quran as it is a key ingredient required to affect others in a positive way. Chapter 3 Al-Imran, verse 159 So by mercy from Allah you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. A Muslim must remember that they will never be better than a holy prophet. Peace be upon them. Nor will the person they interact with be worse than Pharaoh yet. Allah, the Exalted, commanded the Holy Prophet Mosa and the Holy Prophet Harun, peace be upon them, to deal with Pharaoh in a kind manner. Chapter 20 Taha, verse 44 And speak to him with gentle speech that perhaps he may be reminded or fear Allah. Therefore, a Muslim should adopt gentleness in all affairs as it leads to much reward and affects others, such as one's family, in a positive way. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then supplicated to Allah, the Exalted, that he was stingy and asked him to make him generous. History clearly shows Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was generous yet desired to become more so. An aspect of hypocrisy is greed. Their extreme greed places them far from Allah, the Exalted, far from the people and close to hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1961. They dislike when others donate charity, as their greed becomes manifest to others. They also put people off from donating charity, as they dislike society, labeling others as generous. So they always try to put people off from donating charity, with poor reasons such as labeling charities as con artists. These people should be ignored as Allah, the Exalted, judges people on their intention, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. So even if their donated wealth does not reach the poor as long as a person donates through a trustworthy, well-known charity, they will receive their reward according to their intention. Chapter 9 at Torba, verse 67 The hypocrite men and hypocrite women are of one another. They enjoin what is wrong and forbid what is right and close their hands. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, 
then supplicated to Allah, the Exalted, that he was weak and asked him to make him strong. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4168, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the strong believer is more beloved to Allah, the Exalted, than a weaker believer. This does not necessarily refer to physical strength which one uses to perform righteous deeds. But it also refers to knowledge and acting on it. When one ACTS on their knowledge, it leads to certainty of faith. The one who possesses strong faith will fulfill their duties according to their knowledge and not blind imitation like the weak believer. A weak believer believes something based on hearsay, like if they were told a person is inside their house, whereas the strong believer believes an ACTS based on knowledge for example, if they saw the person inside their house through a window. The stronger one's faith the greater their obedience to Allah, the exalted, in the form of fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This in turn increases their success in both worlds. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53 We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves, until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. A beautiful sermon, number one. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 172. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that Allah, the Exalted, was testing him with the people by making him Caliph. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2409, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that each person is a guardian and responsible for the things under their care. The greatest thing a Muslim is a guardian of is their faith. Therefore, they must strive to fulfill its responsibility by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This guardianship also includes every blessing one has been granted by Allah, the Exalted, which includes external things such as wealth and internal things such as one's body. A Muslim must fulfill the responsibility of these things by using them in the way prescribed by Islam. For example, a Muslim should only use their eyes to look at lawful things and their tongue to utter only lawful and useful words. This guardianship also extends to others within one's life, such as relatives and friends. A Muslim must fulfill this responsibility by fulfilling their rights, such as providing for them and gently commanding good and forbidding evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should not cut off from others, especially over worldly issues. Instead, they should continue to treat them kindly, hoping they will change for the better. This guardianship includes one's children. A Muslim must guide them by leading by example, as this by far is the most effective way in guiding children. They must obey Allah, the Exalted, practically as discussed earlier, and teach their children to do the same. To conclude, according to this narration, everyone has some sort of responsibility they have been entrusted with. So they should gain and act on the relevant knowledge in order to fulfill them, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then said that Allah, the Exalted, was testing the people with him. The test for the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, was whether they would sincerely obey their leader in matters which were good or not. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the leaders of society. This includes kindly offering them the best advice and supporting them in their good decisions by any means necessary, such as financial or physical help. According to a narration found in Imam Malik's Mawata, book number 56, narration number 20, Fulfilling this duty pleases Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 59. O you who have believed, obey Allah and obey the Messenger and those in authority among you. This makes it clear that it is a duty to obey the leaders of society. But it is important to note 
This obedience is a duty as long as one does not disobey Allah, the Exalted. There is no obedience to the creation if it leads to the disobedience of the Creator. In cases like this, revolting against leaders should be avoided as it only leads to the harm of innocent people. Instead, the leaders should be gently advised good and forbidden evil according to the teachings of Islam. One should advise others to act accordingly and always supplicate for the leaders to remain on the correct path. If the leaders remain straight, the general public will remain straight also. To be deceitful towards the leaders is a sign of hypocrisy, which one must avoid at all times. Sincerity also includes striving to obey them in matters which unite society on good and warning against anything which causes disruption in society. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then said that he would not delegate a matter to anyone else when he could deal with it directly himself. This indicates the importance of being independent. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7432, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, loves the servant who is independent of the creation. This means that a Muslim should fully utilize the means they have been provided by Allah, the Exalted, such as their physical strength in order to fulfill their duties. They should not behave lazily and seek things from people, as this habit leads to dependence on them and reduces trusting in Allah, the Exalted. One should firmly believe that no matter what happens, whatever is destined to be their provision was allocated to them over 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6748. A Muslim should focus on their efforts and trust that Allah, the Exalted, will grant them what is best for them. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then said that he would only delegate a matter to someone else when he could not deal with it directly himself. He would select someone who was capable and trustworthy. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that betraying trusts is an aspect of hypocrisy. This includes all the trusts one possesses from Allah, the Exalted, and people. Every blessing one possesses has been entrusted to them by Allah, the Exalted. The only way to fulfill these trusts is by using the blessings in the way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This will ensure they gain further blessings as this is true gratitude. Chapter 14 Ibrahim verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. The trusts between people are important to fulfill also. The one who has been entrusted with someone else's belongings should not misuse them and only use them according to the wishes of the owner. One of the greatest trusts between people is keeping conversations secret unless there is some obvious benefit in informing others. Unfortunately, this is often overlooked amongst Muslims. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then said that he would reward his governors if they did well but punish them if they failed in their duties. One of the major reasons why society seems to be digressing is because people have abandoned acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6787, that previous nations were destroyed as the authorities would punish the weak when they broke the law, but would pardon the rich and influential. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, being the head of state even declared in this narration that if his own daughter committed a crime, he would enforce the full legal punishment on her. Even though members of the general public might not be in a position to advise their leaders to remain just in their actions, but they can influence them indirectly by acting justly in all their dealings and actions. For example, a Muslim must act justly in respect to their dependents, such as their children, by treating them equally. This has been specifically advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3544. They should act justly in all their business dealings irrespective of who they deal with. If people act with justice on an individual level, then communities can change for the better and in turn those who are in influential positions, such as politicians, 
will act justly whether they desire to or not. A beautiful sermon, number two. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 172 to 173. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people to regularly recite the Holy Quran and act upon it, so that they become among its people. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim number 196, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Islam is sincerity towards the Holy Quran. Sincerity towards the Holy Quran includes having deep respect and love for the words of Allah, the Exalted. This sincerity is proven when one fulfills the three aspects of the Holy Quran. The first is to recite it correctly and regularly. The second is to understand its teachings through a reliable source and teacher. The final aspect is to act on the teachings of the Holy Quran with the aim of pleasing Allah, the Exalted. The sincere Muslim gives priority to acting on its teachings over acting on their desires which contradict the Holy Quran. Modeling one's character on the Holy Quran is the sign of true sincerity towards the Book of Allah, the Exalted. This is the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, which is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 1342. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people to bring themselves to account before they are brought to account on Judgment Day. It is important for Muslims to regularly assess their own deeds, as no one except Allah, the Exalted, is better aware of them than themselves. When one honestly judges their own deeds, it will inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins and encourage them towards righteous deeds. But the one who fails to regularly assess their deeds will lead a life of heedlessness whereby they commit sins without sincerely repenting. This person will find the weighing of their deeds on the day of judgment extremely difficult. In fact, it may well cause them to be hurled into hell. A clever business owner will always regularly assess their accounts. This will ensure their business heads in the right direction and ensures they complete all the necessary accounts, such as a tax return correctly. But the foolish business owner will not regularly take accounts of their business. This will lead to a loss in profits and a failure in correctly preparing for their accounts. Those who fail to file their accounts correctly with the government face penalties, which only makes their lives more difficult. But the key thing to note is that the penalty of failing to correctly assess and prepare one's deeds for the scales of Judgment Day does not involve a monetary fine. Its penalty is more severe and truly unbearable. Chapter 99 as Zalala, verses 7 to 8. So whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people to prepare for the great parade on the day when they will be brought to judgment before Allah, the Exalted, and not a single secret will be hidden from him. Preparing for the day of judgment involves using the blessings one has been granted in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. In reality, in most cases nothing in this material world in itself is good or bad, such as wealth. What makes a thing good or bad is the way it is used. It is important to understand that the very purpose of everything which was created by Allah, the Exalted, was for it to be used correctly according to the teachings of Islam. When something is not used correctly, it in reality becomes useless. For example, Wealth is useful in both worlds when it is used correctly, such as being spent on the necessities of a person and their dependents. But it can become useless and even a curse for its bearer if it is not used correctly, such as being hoarded or spent on sinful things. Simply hoarding wealth causes wealth to lose value. How can paper and metal coins one tucks away be useful? In this respect, there is no difference between a blank piece of paper and a note of money. It is only useful when it is used correctly. So if a Muslim desires all their worldly possessions to become a blessing for them in both worlds, all they have to do 
is use them correctly, according to the teachings found in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. But if they use them incorrectly, then the same blessing will become a burden and curse for them in both worlds. It is as simple as that. One can adopt the correct attitude when they understand the purpose of these blessings. Every worldly blessing a Muslim possesses is only a means which should aid them in reaching the hereafter safely. It is not an end in itself. For example, wealth is a means one should use in order to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, fulfilling their necessities and the necessities of their dependents. It is not an end or an ultimate goal in itself. This not only aids a Muslim in maintaining their focus on the hereafter, but it also aids them whenever they lose worldly blessings. When a Muslim treats each worldly blessing, such as a child, as a means to please Allah, the Exalted, and reach the hereafter safely, then losing it will not have such a detrimental impact on them. They may become sad, which is an acceptable emotion, but they will not become grieved which leads to impatience and other mental problems, such as depression. This is because they firmly believe the worldly blessing they possessed was only a means, so losing it does not cause a loss in the ultimate goal namely, paradise, the loss of which is disastrous. Therefore, still possessing and concentrating on the ultimate goal will prevent them from becoming grieved. In addition, they will understand that just like the thing they lost was only a means they firmly believe, they will be provided with another means to reach and fulfill their ultimate goal by Allah, the Exalted. This will also prevent them from grieving. Whereas, the one who believes their worldly blessing is the end instead of a means will experience severe grief when losing it, as their whole purpose and objective has been lost. This grief will lead to depression and other mental issues. To conclude, Muslims should treat each blessing they possess as a means to reach the hereafter safely, not as an end in itself. This is how one can possess things without being possessed by them. This is how they can keep worldly things in their hands and not in their hearts. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people that there was no obedience to a person if it meant disobedience to Allah, the Exalted. Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away, and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later, they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune, only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. 
Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. A beautiful sermon, number three. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would give elegant, precise and useful sermons to the public, urging them towards success and peace in both worlds. The following sermon has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 173 to 174. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, advised the people that as he was appointed caliph over them, his harshness would only be applied to wrongdoers and oppressors. He would not allow anyone to transgress upon others, and he would force them to submit to the truth. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the characteristics which perfect a Muslim's faith. The first is to love for the sake of Allah, the exalted. This includes desiring what is best for others in both worldly and religious matters. This must be practically shown through one's actions meaning supporting others financially, emotionally and physically within one's means. Counting one's favors to others not only cancels the reward, but also proves their lack of love for the sake of Allah, the exalted, as this person only loves gaining praise and other forms of compensation from people. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 264 O you who have believed, do not invalidate your charities with reminders of it or injury. Any type of negative feelings towards others over worldly reasons, such as envy, contradicts loving others for the sake of Allah, the exalted, and must be avoided. To sum up, this noble quality includes loving for others what one loves for themselves through actions not just words. This is an aspect of being a true believer, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. The next characteristic mentioned in the main narration under discussion is to hate for the sake of Allah, the exalted. This means one should dislike the things Allah, the Exalted, dislikes such as his disobedience. It is important to note, this does not mean one should hate others as people can sincerely repent to Allah, the Exalted. Instead, a Muslim should dislike the sin itself, which is proven by them avoiding it and warning others against it also. Muslims should continue to advise others instead of breaking ties with them, as this act of kindness may well cause them to sincerely repent. This includes not disliking things based on one's own feelings, such as an action, which is lawful. Finally, the proof of one disliking for the sake of Allah, the exalted, is that when they show their dislike through their words and actions, it will never be in a way which contradicts the teachings of Islam. Meaning, their dislike for something will never cause them to commit a sin, as this would prove that their dislike for something is for their own sake. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, also advised the people that he would humble himself before those who are humble and modest. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person will be raised in rank when they live with humility for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. This occurs as humility is an important aspect of servanthood to Allah, the Exalted. The opposite of humility which is pride only belongs to the Master namely Allah, the Exalted, as everything which people possess was created and granted by Him. Understanding this reality ensures one avoids pride and instead shows humility by obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is true servanthood to Allah, the Exalted, and leads to true greatness in both worlds. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, promised the people that he would only take the wealth from them which Allah, the Exalted, had commanded him to take. It is a major sin to utilize the unlawful. This includes using unlawful wealth, using items which are unlawful, and eating unlawful foods. It is important to note that the specific things which have been labeled unlawful by Islam such as alcohol are not the only things which are unlawful. In fact, even lawful things can become unlawful if they have been gained through unlawful things. For example, a lawful food can become unlawful if it is bought with unlawful wealth. Therefore, it is important for Muslims to ensure they only deal with lawful things, as it only takes one element of the unlawful to ruin someone. 
In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2346, that the one who utilizes the unlawful will have all their supplications rejected. If their supplications are rejected by Allah, the exalted, can one expect any of their good deeds to be accepted? This in fact has been answered in another narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1410. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that Allah, the exalted, only accepts the lawful. Therefore, any deed which has a foundation in the unlawful, such as performing the holy pilgrimage with unlawful wealth, will be rejected. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3118, that this type of person will be sent to hell on Judgment Day. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 188 And do not consume one another's wealth unjustly or send it in bribery to the rulers in order that they might aid you to consume a portion of the wealth of the people in sin, while you know it is unlawful. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, promised the people that he would only take the wealth from them which Allah, the Exalted, had commanded him to take. He would then spend this wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. It is a shame how things have changed so much since the day of the righteous predecessors. In those days, when they became leaders, they in fact, became the servants of the people, and instead of spending the people's money on their own personal things, they would spend their own personal money on the people. Whereas, nowadays the leaders and royal families instead spend the wealth of the people and behave as if they are the masters of the nation. It is important for Muslims to select the righteous predecessors as their role models and adopt their characteristics. For example, Muslims must fulfill their duties towards all those under their care which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. This does not mean one should not care about themselves. It means they should fulfill their own personal duties and then strive to fulfill their duties in respect to their dependents without going overboard. They must first obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience and then fulfill the rights of people. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then reminded them all to fear Allah, the Exalted, at all times. Piety, fearing Allah, the Exalted, cannot be achieved without gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge so that one can fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon, advised that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Therefore, an aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things takes a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful, and the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, this occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech which is not classified sinful by Islam often leads to evil speech, such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoids the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they will undoubtedly avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him then reminded them of their duty to command good and forbid evil. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2686, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
warned that failing to fulfill the important duty of commanding good and forbidding evil can be understood with the example of a boat with two levels full of people. The people on the lower level keep disturbing the people on the upper level whenever they desire to access water. So they decide to drill a hole in the lower level so that they can access water directly. If the people on the upper level fail to stop them, they will all surely drown. It is important for Muslims to never give up commanding good and forbidding evil according to their knowledge in a gentle way. A Muslim should never believe that as long as they obey Allah, the exalted, other misguided people will not be able to affect them in a negative way. A good apple will eventually get affected when placed with rotten apples. Similarly, the Muslim who fails to command others to do good will eventually be affected by their negative behavior, whether it is subtle or apparent. Even if the wider society has become heedless, one should never give up advising their dependents, such as their family, as not only will their negative behavior affect them more, but this is a duty on all Muslims, according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Even if a Muslim is ignored by others, they should discharge their duty by persistently advising them in a gentle way, which is supported by strong evidence and knowledge. Only in this way will they be protected from their negative effects and pardoned on the Day of Judgment. But if they only care about themselves and ignore the actions of others, it is feared that the negative effects of others may well lead to their eventual misguidance. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then reminded them of their duty of giving him sincere advice. Generally speaking, it is important for Muslims to offer advice correctly and sincerely, as this is an aspect of Islam, according to a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. In lawful matters, an aspect of this is that a Muslim should give advice based on the character of the one seeking the advice, instead of basing it on their own character. This is in fact a tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who gave different advice when questioned about the same thing from different people. This is important as people are different and what one person finds bearable another might not, so it is best to give advice based on the questioner's character. This attitude will reduce the chances of one giving a biased opinion which is tailored to their own character and way of life. In addition, in lawful matters in most cases it is best not to directly advise people what to do, instead they should be advised and aided in putting together a list of pros and cons to each possible choice, and then make an informed decision based on this list. This will most likely lead to a better and satisfactory outcome, and it prevents a person blaming their advisor in the future, as they did not advise them directly by telling them to choose a specific option. Finally, a person should never be ashamed of admitting they are unsure about a matter, and should advise others to seek advice from someone more qualified if necessary. A simple life. After Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, became caliph, managing the affairs of the nation distracted him from earning a living for himself and his family. He was then allocated a paltry salary which included a single riding animal, a garment for the winter, a garment for the summer, sufficient food for his dependents, and the same sum which was allocated to any other Muslim in Medina. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 223. Similar to the politicians of today, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, could have demanded a luxurious wage, but he refrained from this and instead adopted a simple lifestyle, in emulation of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4118, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that simplicity is a part of faith. Islam does not teach Muslims to give up all their wealth and lawful desires, but it instead teaches them to adopt a simple lifestyle in all aspects of their life, such as their food, clothing, housing and business, so that it provides them free time to prepare for the hereafter adequately. This involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. 
This simple life includes striving in this world in order to fulfill one's needs and the needs of their dependents without excessiveness, waste or extravagance. A Muslim should understand that the simpler life they lead, the less they will stress over worldly things and therefore the more they will be able to strive for the hereafter thereby, obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. But the more complicated a person's life is, the more they will stress, encounter difficulties, and strive less for their hereafter, as their preoccupations with worldly things will never seem to end. This attitude will prevent them from obtaining peace of mind, body and soul. Simplicity leads to a life of ease in this world, and a straightforward accounting on the day of judgment. Whereas, a complicated and indulgent life will only lead to a stressful life and a severe and difficult accounting on the day of judgment. The Commander of the Faithful Initially, Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, would officially refer to himself as the Caliph of the Caliph, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. On one occasion, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, commanded the governor of Iraq to send him two Muslims who could inform him of the affairs of the people of Iraq. When they arrived they sought permission to meet Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, and referred to him as the commander of the faithful. After that he took on this title and so did those who succeeded him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 228-229. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, truly embodied and fulfilled this title as he led by example. It is important for all Muslims, especially parents, to act on what they advise to others. It is obvious if one turns the pages of history, that those who acted on what they preached, had a much more positive effect on others, compared to those who did not lead by example. The best example being the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who not only practiced what he preached, but adhered to those teachings more strictly than anyone else. Only with this attitude will Muslims especially, parents have a positive impact on others. For example, if a mother warns her children not to lie, as it is a sin, but often lies in front of them, her children are unlikely to act on her advice. A person's actions will always have more of an impact on others than their speech. It is important to note that this does not mean one needs to be perfect before advising others. It means they should sincerely strive to act on their own advice before advising others. The Holy Quran has made it clear in the following verse that Allah, the Exalted, hates this behavior. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3267, that the a person who commanded good but refrained from it themselves and prohibited evil yet acted on it themselves will be punished in severely hell. Chapter 61 Asaf, verse 3 Greatly hateful in the sight of Allah is that you say what you do not do. So it is vital for all Muslims to strive to act on their advice themselves, then advise others to do the same. Leading by example is the tradition of all the holy prophets, peace be upon them, and is the best way to affect others in a positive way. Guiding others Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that he would direct the people to the right path. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 174. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2674, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who guides others to something good will receive the same reward as those who act on their advice. And those who guide others to sins will be held accountable as if they committed the sins. It is important for Muslims to be careful when advising and guiding others. A Muslim should only advise others in matters of good so that they gain reward from it and avoid advising others to disobey Allah, the Exalted. A person will not escape punishment on Judgment Day by simply claiming they are only inviting others towards sins, even if they did not commit the sins themselves. Allah, the Exalted, will hold both the guide and the follower accountable for their actions. Muslims should therefore only advise others to do the things they would do themselves. 
If they dislike an action being recorded in their book of deeds, they should not advise others to perform that action. Because of this Islamic principle, Muslims should ensure they gain the adequate knowledge before advising others, as they can easily multiply their own sins if they incorrectly advise others. In addition, this principle is an extremely easy way for Muslims to gain reward for actions they cannot perform themselves due to a lack of means such as wealth. For example, a person who is not financially able to donate charity can encourage others to do so and this will result in them gaining the same reward as the one who gave charity. Mercy and Compassion One of the first things Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, did during his caliphate was to return the female prisoners who were captured during the apostate wars to their tribes who had repented and returned to the fold of Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 180. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, had the right not to do this, but decided to extend this act of kindness to the tribes who repented after apostatizing. This was his way of reminding the Muslims who remained firm on Islam during the apostate wars to let go of any ill feelings against those who repented from apostatizing. All Muslims hope that on Judgment Day Allah, the Exalted, will put aside, overlook and forgive their past mistakes and sins. But the strange thing is that most of these same Muslims who hope and pray for this, do not treat others in the same way. Meaning, they often latch on to the past mistakes of others and use them as weapons against them. This is not referring to those mistakes which have an effect on the present or future. For example, a car accident caused by a driver which physically disables another person is a mistake which will affect the victim in the present and future. This type of mistake is understandably difficult to let go and overlook. But many Muslims often latch on to the mistakes of others which do not influence the future in any way, such as a verbal insult. Even though the mistake has faded away, yet these people insist on reviving and using it against others when the opportunity presents itself. It is a very sad mentality to possess, as one should understand that people are not angels. At the very least a Muslim who hopes for Allah, the exalted, to overlook their past mistakes should overlook the past mistakes of others. Those who refuse to behave in this manner will find that the majority of their relationships are fractured as no relationship is perfect. They will always be a disagreement which can lead to a mistake in every relationship. Therefore, the one who behaves in this manner will end up lonely as their bad mentality causes them to destroy their relationships with others. It is strange that these very people hate to be lonely, yet adopt an attitude which drives others away from them. This defies logic and common sense. All people want to be loved and respected while they are alive and after they pass away, but this attitude causes the very opposite to occur. While they are alive, people become fed up with them and when they die, people do not remember them with true affection and love. If they do remember them, it is merely out of custom. Letting the past go does not mean one needs to be overly nice to others, but the least one can do is be respectful according to the teachings of Islam. This does not cost anything and requires little effort. One should therefore learn to overlook and let the past mistakes of people go. Perhaps then Allah, the Exalted, will overlook their past mistakes on the Day of Judgment. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. Blessing or a curse. Out of fear of the consequences, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that he was not sure if he was a caliph or a king. Someone replied that there was a difference between the two. A caliph only takes and uses the things which belong to the public in the correct manner. Whereas, a king misappropriates and misuses the things which belong to the people. He concluded that Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, behaved as a caliph and not a king. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 181. In reality, 
The difference between success and failure, blessings and a curse, is how one uses the worldly blessings they have granted control over. It is important for Muslims to understand that they should not define a situation as good or bad according to worldly definitions. For example, according to a worldly definition, being wealthy is good whereas being poor is bad. Instead, Muslims should ascribe good and bad to events and things according to the teachings of Islam. Meaning, anything which takes one closer to the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, in the form of fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience, is good even if it is seen as bad from a worldly point of view. And anything which takes one away from the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, is bad even if it appears good. There are many examples throughout the teachings of Islam which demonstrate this. For example, Karen was an extremely wealthy person who lived in the time of the Holy Prophet Mosa, peace be upon him. Many people then and now may consider his wealth to be a good thing, but as it led him to pride, it became a means of his destruction. So in his case being wealthy was a bad thing. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verses 79 to 81. So he came out before his people in his adornment. Those who desired the worldly life said, Oh, would that we had like what was given to Karen. Indeed, he is one of great fortune. But those who had been given knowledge said, Woe to you! The reward of Allah is better for he who believes and does righteousness. And none are granted it except the patient. And we caused the earth to swallow him and his home. And there was for him no company to aid him other than Allah, nor was he of those who could defend themselves. On the other hand, the third rightly guided caliph of Islam, Usman bin Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, was also wealthy, yet he used his wealth in the correct way. In fact, once after donating a large amount of wealth, he was told by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that nothing could harm his faith after that day. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3701. So in his case wealth was a good thing. To conclude, a Muslim should remember that every difficulty they face has wisdoms behind it, even if they do not observe them. So they should not believe something is good or bad from a worldly point of view. Meaning, if the thing encourages them towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, then it is good even if it looks bad. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 216 But perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you. And Allah knows while you know not. Consulting others Like his predecessors, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was always keen to consult others in respect to the affairs of the public. He once said that there was no good in a decision taken without consultation. He also once said that an individual opinion is like a single thread. Two opinions are like two interwoven threads and three cannot be broken. He would advise others to only consult those who feared Allah, the Exalted. He would even advise his military commanders to consult the senior members of his army, especially the companions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 182 to 183. Muslims should only consult a few people in respect to their affairs. They should select these few people according to the advice of the Holy Quran. Chapter 16 and now, verse 43. So, ask the people of the message if you do not know. This verse reminds Muslims to consult those who possess knowledge. As consulting an ignorant person only leads to further trouble. Just like a person would be foolish to consult a car mechanic over their physical health, a Muslim should only consult those who possess knowledge about it and the Islamic teachings linked to them. In addition, a Muslim should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This is because they will never advise others to disobey Allah the Exalted. Whereas, those who do not fear or obey Allah, the Exalted, might possess knowledge and experience, but they will easily advise others to disobey Allah, the Exalted, which only increases one's problems. 
In reality, those who fear Allah, the Exalted, possess true knowledge and only this knowledge will guide others through their problems successfully. Chapter 35 Fatir, verse 28 Only those fear Allah from among his servants who have knowledge. Good Companions Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, would advise others to only seek good companionship, as bad companionship leads to many problems in both worlds. He once ordered one of his governors, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas, may Allah be pleased with him, to adopt sincere friends and avoid liars as they cannot benefit him, even if they occasionally tell the truth. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Qatab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 184. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5534, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, described the difference between a good and bad companion. The good companion is like a person who sells perfume. Their companion will either obtain some perfume or at least be affected by the pleasant smell. Whereas a bad companion is like a blacksmith. If their companion does not burn their clothes, they will certainly be affected by the smoke. Muslims must understand that the people they accompany will have an effect on them, whether this affect is positive or negative, obvious or subtle. It is not possible to accompany someone and not be affected by it. A narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4833, confirms that a person is on their companion's religion. Meaning, a person adopts the characteristics of their companion. It is therefore important for Muslims to always accompany the righteous, as they will undoubtedly affect them in a positive way, meaning they will inspire them to obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. Whereas, bad companions will either inspire one to disobey Allah, the Exalted, or they will encourage a Muslim to concentrate on the material world over preparing for the hereafter. This attitude will become a great regret for them on Judgment Day, even if the things they strive for are lawful but beyond their needs. Finally, as a person will end up with those they love in the hereafter, according to the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, a Muslim must practically show they love for the righteous by accompanying them in this world. But if they accompany bad or heedless people, then it proves and indicates their love for them and their ultimate destination in the hereafter. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. The people of the Quran. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, would keep those who understood and acted on the Holy Quran close to him in order to seek their advice. He did not observe their age, social status, or any other worldly label. Because of this, many young people would regularly gather and converse with Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, over the affairs of the people. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 185. According to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, the people of the Holy Quran were not those who merely recited it, but those who understood and implemented its teachings. Muslims must strive to behave in this manner. In a narration found in Imam Manzari's Awareness and Apprehension, number 30, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the Holy Quran will intercede on Judgment Day. Those who follow it during their lives on earth will be led to paradise on Judgment Day. But those who neglect it during their lives on earth will find that it pushes them into hell on Judgment Day. The Holy Quran is a book of guidance. It is not merely a book of recitation. Muslims must therefore strive to fulfill all aspects of the Holy Quran to ensure that it guides them to success in both worlds. The first aspect is reciting it correctly and regularly. The second aspect is to understand it. And the final aspect is to act on its teachings according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Those who behave in such a manner are the ones who are given glad tidings of right guidance through every difficulty in this world and its intercession on the Day of Judgment. 
But as warned by this narration, the Holy Quran is only guidance and a mercy for those who correctly act on its aspects, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. But those who misinterpret it and instead act according to their desires in order to gain worldly things, such as fame, will be deprived of this right guidance and its intercession on Judgment Day. In fact, their complete loss in both worlds will only increase until they sincerely repent. Chapter 17 Al-Isra, verse 82 And we send down of the Quran that which is healing and mercy for the believers, but it does not increase the wrongdoers except in loss. Finally, it is important to understand that even though the Holy Quran is a cure for worldly problems, a Muslim should not only use it for this purpose. Meaning, they should not only recite it in order to fix their worldly problems thereby. Treating the Holy Quran like a tool which is removed during a difficulty and then placed back in a toolbox. The main function of the Holy Quran is to guide one to the hereafter safely. Neglecting this main function and only using it to fix one's worldly problems is not correct as it contradicts the behavior of a true Muslim. It is like the one who purchases a car with many different accessories yet it possesses no engine. There is no doubt that this person is simply foolish. Levels of Knowledge During his caliphate, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, worked tirelessly in administrating the affairs of the nation according to the correct levels of knowledge. Meaning, according to the Holy Quran, the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mutual consensus of the learned and in rare cases independent reasoning. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 186 to 188. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, would also place the verdicts of Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, above the level of mutual consensus and independent reasoning. This has been discussed in Imam Suyuti's Tariq al-Kulafa, page 20. This process has been explained in an event during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. In the tenth year after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina, he dispatched Mu'ath bin Jabal, may Allah be pleased with him, to govern a province of Yemen. When leaving the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, asked what he would do if he was brought a case to judge. Mu'ath, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that he would judge according to the Holy Quran. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, replied that what if he did not find the case and its judgment in the Holy Quran. He then replied he would judge according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then replied that what if he did not find the case and its judgment in his traditions. Mu'ath, may Allah be pleased with him, finally replied that he would use independent reasoning meaning, a judgment which runs in line with the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, praised Allah, the Exalted, for giving him a representative that pleased him. This has been discussed in Imam Ibn Katir's The Life of the Prophet, Volume 4, pages 140-141. Whenever a scholar masters the different sciences of Islam, they may reach a level called independent reasoning. This allows them to apply the teachings of the Holy Quran, the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, with their professional unbiased judgment, in order to derive a ruling within Islam. According to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4487, when this scholar makes an incorrect ruling, they will be rewarded a single time for their effort. If they make a correct ruling, they will be rewarded twice over. Justice for all. One of the important principles of Islam, which Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, always upheld, was justice for all, irrespective of their faith or background. For example, he once ruled in favor of a Jew against a Muslim. He did not observe the differences in their faith, and instead judged with justice according to the evidence. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 191.
Islam teaches Muslims that they should never compromise on their faith in order to gain something from the material world. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 135. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. As the material world is temporary, whatever one gains from it will eventually fade away and they will be held accountable for their actions and attitude in the hereafter. On the other hand, faith is the precious jewel which guides a Muslim through all difficulties in this world and in the hereafter safely. Therefore, it is plain foolishness to compromise the thing which is more beneficial and lasting for the sake of a temporary thing. Many people, especially women, will encounter moments in their lives where they will have to choose whether to compromise on their faith. For example, in some cases a Muslim woman may believe that if she removed her scarf and dressed a certain way, she would be more respected at work, and may even climb the corporate ladder more quickly. Similarly, in the corporate world, it is considered important to mingle with colleagues after work hours. So a Muslim might find themselves being invited to a pub or club after work. In times like this, it is important to remember that ultimate victory and success will only be granted to those who remain steadfast on the teachings of Islam. Those who act in this way will be granted worldly and religious success. But more importantly, their worldly success will not become a burden for them. In fact, it will become a means for Allah, the Exalted, to increase their rank and remembrance amongst mankind. Examples of this are the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. They did not compromise on their faith and instead remained steadfast throughout their lives and in return Allah, the Exalted, granted them a worldly and religious empire. All other forms of success are very temporal and sooner or later they become a difficulty for its bearer. One only needs to observe the many celebrities who compromised on their ideals and belief in order to obtain fame and fortune only for these things to become a cause of their sadness, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and even suicide. Reflect on these two paths for a moment and then decide which one should be preferred and chosen. Equality One of the important principles of Islam, which Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, always upheld was justice for all, irrespective of their faith or background. For example, a man from Egypt once came to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, complaining that his governor's son beat him unjustly while boasting about his own nobility. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, immediately summoned his governor of Egypt, Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him, and his son to Medina. When they arrived, he commanded the Egyptian to take his retribution from the governor's son. He then commanded him to even hit his governor, but the Egyptian man refused, as the only one who struck him was the son and not the father. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then criticized his governor, Amra, may Allah be pleased with him, who replied that he was not aware of the case as the Egyptian man did not complain to him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 191-192. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6543, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge people based on their outward appearance or their wealth. Instead, he observes and judges people's inward intention and their physical actions. The first thing to note is that a Muslim should always correct their intention when performing any deed, as Allah, the Exalted, will only reward them when they perform righteous deeds for his sake. Those who perform deeds for the sake of other people and things will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. In addition, this narration indicates the importance of equality in Islam. A person is not superior to others by worldly things such as their ethnicity or wealth. Even though, many Muslims have erected these barriers, such as social castes and sex thereby believing some are better than others, Islam has clearly rejected this concept and declared that in this respect all people are equal in the sight of Islam. 
The only thing which makes one Muslim superior to another is their piety meaning how much they fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. A Muslim should therefore busy themselves in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his rights and the rights of people, and not believe that something they possess or belong to will somehow save them from punishment. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, that the Muslim who lacks in righteous deeds meaning the obedience of Allah, the exalted, will not be increased in rank because of their lineage. In reality, this applies to all worldly things such as wealth, ethnicity, gender or social brotherhoods and castes. One body. During his caliphate, a famine struck Medina and its surrounding regions. That year became widely known as the year of ashes. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, vowed not to eat ghee, yogurt or milk until all the people could afford to eat these things. Even when a person presented these things to him, he refused to eat them and replied that how could he be concerned for the people when he was not experiencing what they were suffering. On another occasion, he was brought the best parts of a slaughtered camel but refused to eat it and replied that he would be a bad ruler if he ate the best parts while his people ate the worst parts. He instead ate some bread soaked in olive oil. He would even command his governors to eat the same quality of food the general public would eat. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 193 to 195. He always ensured his family lived in the same way as any other family. During the year of ashes, he prevented his son from eating watermelon and stated that how could he eat fruit when the followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, were starving. He was so concerned for the Muslims and imposed such restrictions on himself that the people feared that he would die. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 411 to 412. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that the Muslim nation is like one body. If any part of the body suffers pain, the rest of the body shares in its pain. This narration, like many others, indicates the importance of not becoming so self-absorbed into one's own life, thereby behaving as if the universe revolves around them and their problems. The devil inspires a Muslim to focus so much on their own life and their problems, that they lose focus on the bigger picture, which leads to impatience and causes them to become heedless of others, thereby failing their duty in supporting others according to their means. A Muslim should always bear this in mind and strive to aid others as much as they can. This extends to beyond financial help and includes all verbal and physical help such as good and sincere advice. Muslims should regularly observe the news and those who are in difficult situations all over the world. This will inspire them to avoid becoming self-centered and instead aid others. In reality, the one who only cares about themselves is lower in rank than an animal as even they care about their offspring. In fact, a Muslim should be better than animals by practically caring for others beyond their own family. Even though a Muslim cannot remove all the problems of the world, but they can play their part and help others according to their means, as this is what Allah, the Exalted, commands and expects. Nobility One of the important principles of Islam, which Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, always upheld, was justice for all, irrespective of their faith or background. During his caliphate, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, came to Mecca for the holy pilgrimage, Hajj, and was hosted by a resident of Mecca, Safwan ibn Umayyah, may Allah be pleased with him. The latter had some servants who, after serving food, remained standing and did not eat with them. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, asked why they did not join them, and Safwan, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that the food was only for them. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, angrily rebuked him and commanded the servants to eat while he refrained from eating. 
This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 194. On another occasion, a tribal leader from Ghassan accepted Islam and visited Medina, where Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, treated him with respect. This tribal leader then headed to Mecca, and while circumambulating the house of Allah, the exalted, the Kaaba, a poor Bedouin accidentally stepped on his lower garment, which resulted in the tribal leader hitting and breaking the nose of the Bedouin. The injured Bedouin complained to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. When he summoned the tribal leader and commanded him to either compensate the Bedouin or prepare for equal retribution, the tribal leader shockingly replied that he was a king and the Bedouin was a poor commoner. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, reminded him that in Islam they were equal. The tribal leader requested time to think and secretly fled Mecca and apostatized. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 197 to 198. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that nobility does not lie in one's lineage as all people are the descendants of the Holy Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and he was made of dust. Therefore, people should give up boasting about their relatives and lineage. It is important to understand that even though some ignorant Muslims have adopted the attitude of other nations by creating castes and sects thereby believing some people are superior to others, based on these groups, Islam declared a simple criterion for superiority, namely, piety. Meaning, the more a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience, the greater they are in rank in the sight of Allah, the exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This verse destroys all other standards which have been created by ignorant people such as one's race, ethnicity, wealth, gender or social status. In addition, if a Muslim is proud of a pious person in their lineage, they should correctly demonstrate this belief by praising Allah, the exalted, and following in their footsteps. Boasting about others without following in their footsteps will not help someone in either this world or the next. This has been made clear in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2945. Finally, the one who is proud of others but fails to follow in their footsteps is indirectly dishonoring them as the outside world will observe their bad character and assume their righteous ancestor behaved in the same manner. These people should therefore strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, because of this reason. These are like those people who adopt the outward traditions and advice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf yet, fail to adopt his inner character. The outside world will only think negatively about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when they observe the bad character of these Muslims. The law applies to all. The governor of Egypt, Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him, implemented the legal punishment for drinking alcohol to Abdur Rahman, the son of Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. Normally, these legal punishments are carried out publicly in order to deter others from such crimes, but in this case, the punishment was carried out in his own home. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed, he wrote a letter to his governor harshly criticizing and threatening him for not carrying out the legal punishment correctly, according to his orders. He reminded him that he should never show any preferential treatment to people when it comes to the law of Allah, the exalted. He then commanded him to send his son to Medina, where he publicly carried out the legal punishment on him again. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 196 to 197. One of the major reasons why society seems to be digressing is because people have abandoned acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6787, that previous nations were destroyed as the authorities would punish the weak when they broke the law, but would pardon the rich and influential. 
The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, being the head of state even declared in this narration that if his own daughter committed a crime, he would enforce the full legal punishment on her. Even though members of the general public might not be in a position to advise their leaders to remain just in their actions, but they can influence them indirectly by acting justly in all their dealings and actions. For example, a Muslim must act justly in respect to their dependents, such as their children, by treating them equally. This has been specifically advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3544. They should act justly in all their business dealings irrespective of who they deal with. If people act with justice on an individual level, then communities can change for the better, and in turn those who are in influential positions, such as politicians, will act justly whether they desire to or not. Removing Bad Elements Even though Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, ensured religious freedom for the non-Muslims living in Islamic land, nonetheless, he did not allow anyone to break their agreements with him. The non-Muslims living in Khyber and Najran did not adhere to the conditions they agreed to, and because of their evil motives Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, expelled them from their lands. For example, Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was once attacked and severely injured when he visited his property at Khyber. The rest of the non-Muslims who did not take part in their plans were left in peace. Even when he expelled them, he ensured they were compensated with wealth and new properties. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 206-208. Removing bad elements from the community is essential for the safety of the community. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2686, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that failing to fulfill the important duty of commanding good and forbidding evil can be understood with the example of a boat with two levels full of people. The people on the lower level keep disturbing the people on the upper level whenever they desire to access water. So they decide to drill a hole in the lower level so that they can access water directly. If the people on the upper level fail to stop them, they will all surely drown. It is important for Muslims to never give up commanding good and forbidding evil according to their knowledge in a gentle way. A Muslim should never believe that as long as they obey Allah, the exalted, other misguided people will not be able to affect them in a negative way. A good apple will eventually get affected when placed with rotten apples. Similarly, the Muslim who fails to command others to do good will eventually be affected by their negative behavior, whether it is subtle or apparent. Even if the wider society has become heedless, one should never give up advising their dependents, such as their family, as not only will their negative behavior affect them more, but this is a duty on all Muslims, according to a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. Even if a Muslim is ignored by others, they should discharge their duty by persistently advising them in a gentle way, which is supported by strong evidence and knowledge. Only in this way will they be protected from their negative effects and pardoned on the Day of Judgment. But if they only care about themselves and ignore the actions of others, it is feared that the negative effects of others may well lead to their eventual misguidance. Importance of Education Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that he did not appoint governors over the people so that they harm them, slander their honor, or seize their wealth. Rather, he appointed them so they teach the people the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 210. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 219, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that learning one verse of the Holy Quran is better than offering 100 cycles of voluntary prayer. And learning a topic of Islamic knowledge, even if one does not act on it, is better than offering 1000 cycles of voluntary prayer. Learning a verse includes studying and more importantly, practically implementing its teachings in one's life. 
And it is important to note, a Muslim will only gain this reward when they sincerely strive to act on the topic of knowledge they have learned and practically implement it when the opportunity presents itself. Only when one does not gain the opportunity to act on their topic of Islamic knowledge will they gain the reward of offering 1,000 cycles of prayer, even if they do not actually act on it. This is because Allah, the Exalted, judges and rewards people based on their intention and will therefore grant reward to those who would sincerely act when given the opportunity. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number one. Finally, as indicated by the main narration under discussion, gaining and acting on knowledge is far superior to voluntary worship. This is because the majority do not understand the Arabic language and are therefore less likely to change their behavior and obedience to Allah, the Exalted, in a positive way, as they do not understand the language they use to worship Allah, the Exalted. Whereas, learning and acting on knowledge is much more likely to inspire one to change for the better. This is the reason why some Muslims spend decades performing voluntary worship yet, do not improve their behavior towards Allah, the Exalted, or people in the slightest. This by far is not the best course of action. Protecting others. Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that he did not appoint governors over the people so that they harm them, slander their honor or seize their wealth. Rather, he appointed them so they teach the people the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. He concluded that if any person was wronged by their governor, they should come to him and he would settle the matter. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 210. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, understood the importance of protecting the people, their wealth and honor. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 67, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that the blood, property and honor of a Muslim are sacred in Islam. This narration, like many others, teaches Muslims that success can only be obtained when one fulfills the rights of Allah, the Exalted, such as the obligatory prayers and the rights of people. One without the other is not good enough. A true believer and Muslim is the one who keeps their verbal and physical harm away from the self and possessions of others. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4998. Therefore, it is vital for Muslims not to harm others through their actions or words. A Muslim must respect the possessions of others and not try to wrongfully acquire them, for example, in a legal case. A narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 353, warns that someone who does this will go to hell even if the thing they acquired was as insignificant as a twig of a tree. Muslims should only use the possessions of others according to their wishes and return them in a way pleasing to its owner. The honor of a Muslim should not be violated through actions or speech, such as backbiting or slander. A Muslim should instead defend the honor of others, whether in their presence or absence, as this will lead to their protection from the fire of hell. This has been advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1931. To conclude, one should avoid wronging the self, possessions or honor of others by treating others exactly how they desire others to treat them. Just like one loves this for themselves, they should love it for others and prove this through their actions and speech. This is the sign of a true believer, according to a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. Fair treatment. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, would ensure all people were treated fairly, even those who were suspected of committing crimes by the authority. He once commented that a person may well confess to a crime they did not commit if they are frightened, detained and starved. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 210. Generally speaking, Muslims must ensure they extend fair treatment to all others. In a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 4998, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the signs of a true Muslim and a true believer. A true Muslim is the one who keeps their verbal and physical harm away from others. 
This in fact, includes all people irrespective of their faith. It includes all types of verbal and physical sins which can cause harm or distress to another. This can include failing to give the best advice to others, as this contradicts sincerity towards others which has been commanded in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 4204. It includes advising others to disobey Allah, the exalted, thereby inviting them towards sins. A Muslim should avoid this behavior as they will be taken account for every person who ACTS on their bad advice. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2351. Physical harm includes causing problems for other people's livelihood, committing fraud, conning others and physical abuse. All of these characteristics contradict Islamic teachings and must be avoided. A true believer, according to the main narration under discussion, is the one who keeps their harm away from the lives and property of others. Again, this applies to all people irrespective of their faith. This includes stealing, misusing or damaging the property and belongings of others. Whenever one is entrusted with someone else's property, they must ensure they only use it with the owner's permission and in a way which is pleasing and agreeable to the owner. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 5421, that whoever illegally takes someone else's property through a false oath, even if it is as small as a twig of a tree will go to hell. To conclude, a Muslim must support their verbal declaration of belief with actions, as they are the physical proof of one's belief which will be needed in order to obtain success on the Day of Judgment. In addition, a Muslim should fulfill the characteristics of true belief in respect to Allah, the Exalted, and people. An excellent way of achieving this in respect to people is to simply treat others how they wish to be treated by people, which is with respect and peace. Freedom of Expression Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, ensured people could voice their opinions, irrespective of who they were. He urged it so much that once he publicly announced to the people that if they observed any deviation from him, they should speak up and straighten him out. A man stood and declared that they would straighten him out even with their swords. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then praised Allah, the Exalted, for being surrounded by such people. On another occasion, he commented that the most dearest to him was the one who pointed out his faults. He also once said that he feared that he would make a mistake in judgment, and no one would correct him out of respect for him. Once a man told Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to fear Allah, the Exalted. The people wanted to silence him, yet Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, commented that there was no good in people who did not say what was good, and no good in people who do not listen to what is good. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 213 to 214. If one studies the lives of the righteous predecessors, they will observe many differences between them and the Muslims of today. One big difference is the way people respond to those who command good and forbid evil, which is a duty on all Muslims according to their knowledge. It is important for Muslims to understand this behavioral change, as it can prevent many arguments and enmity growing between people. In the past Muslims loved those who advised them to do good and warned them against bad things. In fact, they did not consider someone a sincere friend until they behaved in this manner with them. They actually even loved those who advised them on things which were not considered sins in Islam, but were only disliked things. This is the major change which has occurred. Many Muslims nowadays dislike being constructively criticized in this manner. In cases where unlawful things are occurring, it is a duty on a Muslim to gently and kindly warn against it according to the teachings of Islam, even if others dislike their behavior. But in most cases where others are not committing a sin but are merely committing things which are disliked, it is better for a Muslim not to criticize them over them, as it will only lead to enmity, arguments and it can even cause one to give up advising others because of the negative response they receive. The exception is when the one being advised likes being advised in such a manner. 
Therefore, a Muslim who desires to fulfill their duty and avoid arguments with others should command good and warn against the unlawful, but leave aside things which do not fall within these two categories. Equal treatment. While giving a sermon, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, told the people to listen and obey those in authority. A man stood up and replied that they would not listen or obey. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, calmly asked him to explain himself. The man stated that every person had been given a single garment from the public treasury, while Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was wearing two garments. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, summoned his son, who testified that he had given his father his single garment as a gift. When the people were satisfied, the man then replied that they would hear and obey him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 214 to 215. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, adopted the principle of treating everyone equally, unless there was some obvious reason why some should get preferential treatment, such as disabled people. One can adopt this mindset by treating others how they desire to be treated by people. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 13, that a person cannot become a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. This does not mean a Muslim will lose their faith if they fail to adopt this characteristic. It means that a Muslim's faith will not be complete until they act on this advice. This narration also indicates that a Muslim will not perfect their faith until they also dislike for others what they dislike for themselves. This is supported by another narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586. It advises that the Muslim nation is like one body. If one part of the body is in pain, the rest of the body shares the pain. This mutual feeling includes loving and hating for others what one loves and hates for themselves. A Muslim can only achieve this status when their heart is free from evil traits, such as envy. These evil traits will always cause one to desire better for themselves. So in reality, this narration is an indication that one should purify their heart by adopting good characteristics, such as being forgiving, and eliminate evil traits, such as envy. This is only possible through learning and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. It is important for Muslims to understand that desiring good for others will cause them to lose out on good things. The treasury of Allah, the exalted, has no limits, so there is no need to adopt a selfish and greedy mentality. Desiring good for others includes striving to aid others in any way one can, such as financial or emotional support, in the same way a person would desire others to aid them in their moment of need. Therefore, this love must be shown through actions, not just words. Even when a Muslim forbids evil and offers advice which contradicts the desire of others, they should do so gently, just like they would want others to advise them kindly. As mentioned earlier, the main narration under discussion indicates the importance of eliminating all bad characteristics which contradict mutual love and care, such as envy. Envy is when a person desires to possess a specific blessing, which is only obtainable when it is taken away from someone else. This attitude is a direct challenge to the distribution of blessings chosen by Allah, the Exalted. This is why it is a major sin and leads to the destruction of the envious good deeds. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903. If a Muslim must desire the lawful things others possess, they should wish and supplicate to Allah, the Exalted, to grant them the same or similar thing without the other person losing the blessing. This type of jealousy is lawful and is praiseworthy in aspects of religion. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Muslims should only be jealous of a wealthy person who uses their wealth correctly, and be jealous of a knowledgeable person who uses their knowledge to benefit themselves and others. A Muslim should not only love for others to obtain lawful worldly blessings, but also for them to gain religious blessings in both worlds. In fact, 
When one wishes this for others, it encourages them to strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This type of healthy competition is welcomed in Islam. Chapter 83 al mutafifun verse 26 So for this let the competitors compete. This encouragement will also inspire a Muslim to assess themselves in order to find and eliminate any faults in their character. When these two elements combine meaning, striving in sincere obedience to Allah, the Exalted, and purifying one's character, it leads to success in both worlds. A Muslim must therefore not only claim to love for others what they desire for themselves verbally, but show it through their actions. It is hoped that the one who is concerned for others in this way will receive the concern of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1930. Accepting the Truth Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, would submit to the truth irrespective of where or who it came from. He once observed how people were giving large amounts of dowries to their brides, and feared that this would make it harder for people to get married. As a result, he resolved to put a limit on it. During a sermon, he expressed his opinion and stated that if anyone gave above the limit he set, he would seize the extra amount and put it in the public treasury. A woman then stood up and objected to his decision by quoting a verse of the Holy Quran which indicates one can give whatever dowry they desire. Chapter 4 and Nisa, verse 20 But if you want to replace one wife with another, and you have given one of them a great amount in dowry, do not take back from it anything. Would you take it in injustice and manifest sin? Even though this verse does not encourage one to give a large dowry, Nonetheless, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, accepted that he was wrong and the woman was right and therefore publicly reversed his initial judgment. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 215. Rejecting the truth out of stubbornness is a sign of pride. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a person who possesses even an atom's worth of pride in their heart will not enter paradise. He clarified that pride is when a person rejects the truth and looks down on others. No amount of good deeds will benefit someone who possesses pride. This is quite obvious when one observes the devil and how his countless years of worship did not benefit him when he became proud. In fact, the following verse clearly connects pride with disbelief, so a Muslim must avoid this evil characteristic at all costs. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 34 And mention when we said to the angels prostrate before Adam, so they prostrated except for Iblis. He refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. The proud is the one who rejects the truth when it is presented to them simply because it did not come from them and as it challenges their desires and mentality. The proud person also believes they are superior to others, even though they are unaware of their own ultimate end and the ultimate end of others. This is plain ignorance. In reality, it is foolish to be proud of anything, seeing as Allah, the Exalted, created and granted everything a person owns. Even the righteous deeds one performs are only due to the inspiration, knowledge and strength granted by Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, being proud of something which does not innately belong to them is plain foolishness. This is just like a person who becomes proud over a mansion they do not even own or live in. This is the reason why pride belongs to Allah, the Exalted, as He alone is the Creator and innate owner of all things. The one who challenges Allah, the Exalted, in pride will be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4090. A Muslim should instead follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and adopt humility. The humble truly recognize that all the good they possess and all the evil they are protected from comes from no one except Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, humility is more fitting for a person than pride. 
A person should not be fooled into believing humility leads to disgrace, as no one has been more honored than the humble servants of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has guaranteed an increase in status for the one who adopts humility for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029. Hate versus freedom of expression. Unlike many people today, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, understood the difference between freedom of expression and spreading hate within society. Freedom of expression allows one to voice their constructive criticism in a peaceful and respectful way without the fear of persecution. Whereas, spreading hate involves unconstructively criticizing and insulting people and their beliefs. The aim of freedom of expression is to destroy the boundaries between communities and to instead strengthen the bonds between them so that everyone benefits. Whereas, spreading hate does the opposite meaning, it creates divisions between communities and leads to disunity. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, upheld the Islamic principles of freedom of expression and standing against the spread of hate. For example, he once imprisoned a person for openly and persistently slandering a Muslim. He eventually freed the person when he promised not to spread such hate within the society. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 217. Overpraising A man once said to Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, after observing his poverty, that as he was the caliph, he was the most entitled to the best of foods, a fine mount and fine clothing. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, criticized him as he only desired to please him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 224. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2662, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned against over-praising others. This is a disliked deed, as it firstly can be sinful if the praise is based on falsehood. Even if it is true over-praising people especially, the ignorant can cause them to become proud. This is an evil characteristic, as an atom's worth of it is enough to take one to hell. This has been warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265. Overpraising can even cause the praised person to believe they have fulfilled their potential in obeying Allah, the Exalted, and therefore do not need to strive harder in his obedience. A Muslim should not be fooled by the praise of others, as they know their actions and inner hidden character better than any other person. Reflecting on this and the countless times Allah, the Exalted, has concealed their faults from people, should prevent them from becoming proud. In addition, they should remember that the praised quality they possess was granted to them by none other than Allah, the Exalted, therefore all praise belongs to Him. Finally, a Muslim should become more grateful to Allah, the Exalted, by using the blessings they possess in ways pleasing to Him. They should instead advise others about this narration and warn them not to over-praise others. Only in certain cases is praising others acceptable and must include not over-praising them, sticking with the truth and it should be done in order to encourage them to do more good. This especially applies to children such as praising them in respect to their school work, good behavior and fulfilling the duties of Islam. Trustworthy Umar ibn Khattab May Allah be pleased with him, once explained to a man who urged him to adopt a more luxurious life, that his example with the people was of a group of people who set out on a journey. The people gave their wealth to a single person and told him to spend on them when it was needed. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then commented that it would not be right for this person to spend that wealth on himself and neglect the others. This was the example of him and his people. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 224. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2749, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that betraying trusts is an aspect of hypocrisy. This includes all the trusts one possesses from Allah, the Exalted, and people. Every blessing one possesses has been entrusted to them by Allah, the Exalted. 
The only way to fulfill these trusts is by using the blessings in the way which is pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. This will ensure they gain further blessings, as this is true gratitude. Chapter 14 Ibrahim, verse 7 And remember when your Lord proclaimed, If you are grateful, I will surely increase you in favor. The trusts between people are important to fulfill also. The one who has been entrusted with someone else's belongings should not misuse them and only use them according to the wishes of the owner. One of the greatest trusts between people is keeping conversations secret unless there is some obvious benefit in informing others. Unfortunately, this is often overlooked amongst Muslims. The Islamic Calendar once Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, received a document which only had the month written on it. Therefore, he could not work out the year the document referred to. He then gathered the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in order to create an Islamic calendar. Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, suggested that their calendar should start from when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, migrated to Medina. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 225 to 227. This was another act of unity, which was administered by Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, as the people of that time would judge time based on past events, some of which were connected to the pre-Islamic days of ignorance. Introducing the Islamic calendar avoided this and instead unified the Muslims. Muslims must take all the steps to create unity amongst them. A narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6541, discusses some aspects of creating unity within society. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, firstly advised Muslims not to envy each other. This is when a person desires to obtain the very blessing someone else possesses meaning. They desire for the owner to lose the blessing. And it involves disliking the fact that the owner was given the blessing by Allah, the Exalted, instead of them. Some only desire this to occur in their hearts without showing it through their actions or speech. If they dislike their thought and feeling, it is hoped that they will not be held accountable for their envy. Some exert efforts through their speech and actions in order to confiscate the blessing from the other person, which is undoubtedly a sin. The worst kind is when a person strives to remove the blessing from the owner, even if the envier does not obtain the blessing. Envy is only lawful when a person does not act on their feelings, dislikes their feeling, and if they strive to obtain a similar blessing without the owner losing the blessing they possess. Even though this type is not sinful yet, it is disliked if the envy is over a worldly blessing and only praiseworthy if it involves a religious blessing. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned two examples of the praiseworthy type in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The first is when a person envies the one who acquires and spends lawful wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. The second is when a person envies the one who uses their wisdom and knowledge in the correct way and teaches it to others. The evil type of envy, as mentioned earlier, directly challenges the choice of Allah, the Exalted. The envious person behaves as if Allah, the Exalted, made a mistake giving a particular blessing to someone else instead of them. This is why it is a major sin. In fact, as warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903, envy destroys good deeds just like fire consumes wood. An envious Muslim must strive to act on the narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. It advises that a person cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. An envious Muslim should therefore strive to remove this feeling from their heart by showing good character and kindness towards the person they envy, such as praising their good qualities and supplicating for them until their envy becomes love for them. Another thing advised in the main narration quoted at the beginning is that Muslims should not hate each other. This means one should only dislike something if Allah, the Exalted, dislikes it. 
This has been described as an aspect of perfecting one's faith in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. A Muslim should therefore not dislike things or people according to their own desires. If one dislikes another according to their own desires, they should never allow it to affect their speech or actions, as it is sinful. A Muslim should strive to remove the feeling by treating the other according to the teachings of Islam meaning, with respect and kindness. A Muslim should remember that other people are not perfect, just like they are not perfect. And if others possess a bad characteristic, they will undoubtedly possess good qualities also. Therefore, a Muslim should advise others to abandon their bad characteristics, but continue to love the good qualities they possess. Another point must be made on this topic. A Muslim who follows a particular scholar who advocates a specific belief should not act like a fanatic and believe their scholar is always right thereby hating those who oppose their scholar's opinion. This behavior is not disliking something someone for the sake of Allah, the exalted. As long as there is a legitimate difference of opinion amongst the scholars, a Muslim following a particular scholar should respect this and not dislike others who differ from what the scholar they follow believes. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Muslims should not turn away from each other. This means they should not sever ties with other Muslims over worldly issues, thereby refusing to support them according to the teachings of Islam. According to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6077, it is unlawful for a Muslim to sever ties with another Muslim over a worldly issue for more than three days. In fact, the one who severs ties for more than a year over a worldly issue is considered like the one who has killed another Muslim. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4915. Severing ties with others is only lawful in matters of faith. But even then, a Muslim should continue to advise the other Muslim to sincerely repent and only avoid their company if they refuse to change for the better. They should still support them on lawful things when they are requested to do so, as this act of kindness may inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins. Another thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Muslims are commanded to be like brothers to one another. This is only achievable if they obey the previous advice given in this narration and strive to fulfill their duty towards other Muslims according to the teachings of Islam, such as helping others in matters of good and warning them from evil matters. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1240, advises that a Muslim should fulfill the following rights of other Muslims. They are to return the Islamic greeting of peace, to visit the sick, to take part in their funeral prayers, and to reply to the sneezer who praises Allah, the exalted. A Muslim must learn and fulfill all the rights other people, especially other Muslims, have over them. Another thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that a Muslim should not wrong, forsake or hate another Muslim. The sins a person commits should be hated, but the sinner should not be as they may sincerely repent at any time. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4884, that whoever humiliates another Muslim Allah, the exalted, will humiliate them. And whoever protects a Muslim from humiliation will be protected by Allah, the Exalted. The negative characteristics mentioned in the main narration quoted at the beginning can develop when one adopts pride. According to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, pride is when one looks down on others in contempt. The proud person sees themselves as perfect while seeing others as imperfect. This prevents them from fulfilling the rights of others and encourages them to dislike others. Another thing mentioned in the main narration is that true piety is not in one's physical appearance, such as wearing beautiful clothes, but it is an internal characteristic. This internal characteristic manifests outwardly in the form of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, 
has declared in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4094, that when the spiritual heart is purified the whole body becomes purified, but when the spiritual heart is corrupt the whole body becomes corrupt. It is important to note that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge based on outward appearances, such as wealth, but He considers the intentions and actions of people. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6542. Therefore, a Muslim must strive to adopt internal piety through learning and acting on the teachings of Islam, so that it manifests outwardly in the way they interact with Allah, the Exalted, and the Creation. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that it is a sin for a Muslim to hate another Muslim. This hatred applies to worldly things and not disliking others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, loving and hating for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of perfecting one's faith. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. But even then, a Muslim must show respect to others in all cases and dislike only their sins without actually hating the person. In addition, their dislike must never cause them to act against the teachings of Islam, as this would prove their hatred is based on their own desires and not for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The root cause of despising others for worldly reasons is pride. It is vital to understand that an atom's worth of pride is enough to take one to hell. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265. The next thing mentioned in the main narration is that a Muslim's life, property and honor are all sacred. A Muslim must not violate any of these rights without a just reason. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan and Nasar, number 4998, that a person cannot be a true Muslim until they protect other people, including non-Muslims, from their harmful speech and actions. And a true believer is the one who keeps their evil away from the lives and property of others. Whoever violates these rights will not be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted, until their victim forgives them first. If they do not, then justice will be established on Judgment Day, whereby the good deeds of the oppressor will be given to the victim, and if necessary, the sins of the victim will be given to the oppressor. This may cause the oppressor to be hurled into hell. This is warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should treat others exactly how they want people to treat them. This will lead to much blessings for an individual and create unity within their society. Fear of the Last Day Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would constantly reflect on the Day of Judgment and strived hard to practically prepare for it. A Bedouin once asked for some wealth from him and reminded him that he would be questioned about his leadership on the Day of Judgment, a day which there was no other destinations except paradise and hell. This made Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, weep. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 230. One must emulate the attitude of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him so that they practically prepare for Judgment Day before their time runs out. The trumpet blast will lead to the death of the creation. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 7381. The important thing to learn is that this is a call which no one can or will reject responding to. It will lead to the resurrection and final judgment. Therefore, Muslims should respond to the call of Allah, the Exalted, through the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, through sincere obedience by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 8 and Anval, verse 24. O you who have believed, respond to Allah and to the Messenger when he calls you to that which gives you life. Whoever responds to this call in this world will find the final call easy to endure and respond to. Whereas, the one who lives heedless to the call of Allah, the Exalted, in this world will not find peace in it, and they will be forced to answer the call of the trumpet which will be a great burden for them to endure and respond to. 
A person can only ignore the call of Allah, the Exalted, for so long as the final call will occur, sooner or later, and no one will be able to avoid or ignore it. If this is inevitable, it makes sense that one respond to it now, today, instead of living in heedlessness. If one hears the trumpet blast while heedless, no action or regret will benefit them, and what comes after for this person will be even more terrifying. Taking stock of oneself. Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, had the habit of constantly reflecting on his actions and rectifying them. He once walked through the market and asked someone to move out of his way, and prodded the edge of his garment with his stick. The following year, he saw the same man and inquired if he was going to perform the holy pilgrimage. When the man replied in the positive, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, took him back to his home and gave him 600 silver coins, and told him to spend them on his needs and commented that this wealth was for what occurred the previous year in the market. The man replied he completely forgot what had occurred and Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, finally replied that he never forgot. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 231 to 232. Even though Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, did not harm the man, yet he corrected his action when the opportunity presented itself. He understood that the most dangerous deed, after disbelief, is wronging others. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the bankrupt Muslim is the one who accumulates many righteous deeds, such as fasting and prayer. But as they mistreated people, their good deeds will be given to their victims, and if necessary, their victim sins will be given to them on judgment day. This will lead to them being hurled into hell. It is important to understand that a Muslim must fulfill two aspects of faith in order to achieve success. The first are the duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, such as the obligatory prayer. The second aspect is in respect to people, which includes treating them kindly. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 4998, that a person cannot be a true believer until they keep their physical and verbal harm away from the life and possessions of others. It is important to understand that Allah, the Exalted, is infinitely forgiving meaning. He will forgive those who sincerely repent to Him. But He will not forgive the sins which involve other people until the victim forgives first. As people are not so forgiving, a Muslim should be fearful that those who they have wronged will exact revenge on them by taking away their precious good deeds on Judgment Day. Even if a Muslim fulfills the rights of Allah, the Exalted, they may still end up in hell simply because they have wronged others. It is therefore important for Muslims to strive to fulfill both aspects of their duties in order to obtain success in both worlds. The Scales Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was always frightened about his accountability on the Day of Judgment. He once commented that if a lamb was to die on the banks of the Euphrates, the edge of the Islamic nation, he feared that Allah, the Exalted, would hold him accountable for it. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 232. It is important for Muslims to regularly assess their own deeds as no one except Allah, the Exalted, is better aware of them than themselves. When one honestly judges their own deeds, it will inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins and encourage them towards righteous deeds. But the one who fails to regularly assess their deeds will lead a life of heedlessness whereby they commit sins without sincerely repenting. This person will find the weighing of their deeds on the Day of Judgment extremely difficult. In fact, it may well cause them to be hurled into hell. A clever business owner will always regularly assess their accounts. This will ensure their business heads in the right direction and ensures they complete all the necessary accounts, such as a tax return correctly. But the foolish business owner will not regularly take accounts of their business. This will lead to a loss in profits and a failure in correctly preparing for their accounts. Those who fail to file their accounts correctly with the government face penalties, which only makes their lives more difficult. But the key thing to note 
is that the penalty of failing to correctly assess and prepare one's deeds for the scales of judgment day does not involve a monetary fine. Its penalty is more severe and truly unbearable. Chapter 99 as Zalala, verses 7 to 8. So whoever does an atom's weight of good will see it. And whoever does an atom's weight of evil will see it. Avoiding the fire. In order to remind himself of hell and striving to practically avoid it, Umar ibn al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would light a fire and place his hand over it and ask himself whether he could tolerate that. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 234. The thing to remember is that in reality each person who will end up in hell takes the fire which they will encounter in hell with them from this world in the form of their sins. When a Muslim engraves this reality into their mind, they will observe each sin, major or minor, as a piece of unbearable fire. The same way a person avoids fire in this world, they should avoid sins as in reality sins are like hidden fire which will be shown to them in the hereafter. In addition, a Muslim should not live in heedlessness and believe they can simply claim love for Allah, the Exalted, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, without supporting this verbal declaration with actions. If this was true, then the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, would not have strived so hard in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, and they undoubtedly understood Islam and Judgment Day better than the people after them. Simply put, a declaration of love without actions will not save one from hell. In fact, it has been made clear that some Muslims will enter hell on Judgment Day. The Muslim who abandons acting on Islamic teachings should understand that their attitude may cause them to lose their faith before their death, so that they enter Judgment Day as a non-Muslim, which is the greatest loss. The same way one would not enter a battle without armor and a shield, a Muslim should not enter Judgment Day without the armor and shield of righteous deeds. Otherwise, the same way the soldier who has no protection will most likely be harmed, so will a Muslim who reaches Judgment Day without the protection provided by the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. A Muslim should remember that the luxuries and pleasures of the material world they enjoyed will not make them feel better if they end up in hell. In fact, it will only make them feel worse. The Correct Perception Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once passed a trash dump and stood there, pondering. When he noticed his companions disliked what he was doing, he commented that this was the outcome of the world they cared so much for and loved to hoard. This was the outcome of what they trusted most and relied upon for their needs. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya number 72. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, understood the difference between the eternal hereafter and the transient material world as he adopted the correct perception. It is important for Muslims to develop the correct perception so that they can increase their obedience to Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience. This is what the righteous predecessors possessed, and it encouraged them to avoid the excess luxuries of the material world and instead prepare for the hereafter. This is an important characteristic to possess and it can be explained with a worldly example. Two people are extremely thirsty and come across a cup of murky water. They both desire to drink it even though it is not pure and even if it means they have to argue over it. As their thirst grows the more focused on the cup of murky water they become, to the point they lose focus on everything else. But if one of them shifted their focus and observed a river of pure water which was only a short distance ahead, they would immediately lose focus on the cup of water to the point they would no longer care about it and no longer argue over it. And instead they would endure their thirst patiently knowing a river of pure water is close. The person who is unaware of the river would probably believe the other person is crazy after observing their change in attitude. This is the case of the two types of people in this world. One group greedily focuses on the material world. The other group has shifted their focus to the hereafter 
and the pure and eternal blessings therein. When one shifts their focus to the bliss of the hereafter, worldly problems do not seem like such a big deal. Therefore, patience becomes easier to adopt. But if one keeps their focus on this world, then it will seem like everything to them. They will argue, fight, love and hate for it. Just like the person in the example mentioned earlier, who only focuses on the cup of murky water. This correct perception is only achieved through gaining and acting on Islamic knowledge found within the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Chapter 41 Fusilat, verse 53. We will show them our signs in the horizons and within themselves until it becomes clear to them that it is the truth. Temporary versus Eternal Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised that he reflected and realized that if he desired comfort in this world, he would harm his lasting comfort in the next world. And if he desired the hereafter, he must renounce the excess comfort in this world. Therefore, he decided to renounce the temporary abode. He concluded that it was surely better to endure a little discomfort in this life, for the sake of the permanent hereafter. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hiliyat al Aulia, number 79. When people, irrespective of their faith, go on holiday, they only pack the things they need and maybe a little extra, but they try to avoid overpacking. Even the amount of money they take with them, they limit in respect to their stay abroad. When they arrive, they often stay in a hotel, which usually has the main necessities of living with a few extras. If they believe they will never return to the same destination in the future, they will never buy a house, as they will claim they stay is short and they will not return. They do not get a job during their holiday, claiming that they stay is short, so they do not need to earn more money. They do not get married, nor have children, claiming the holiday destination is not their homeland, where they would get married and have children. Generally speaking, this is the attitude and mindset of holiday makers. It is strange how Muslims truly believe they will depart from this world soon, meaning, they stay in the world is temporary, just like being on holiday, and they believe their stay in the hereafter will be permanent, yet, they do not adequately prepare for it. If they truly realize the short time they have, similarly to a holiday, they would not dedicate too much effort on their homes, and instead be content with a simple home, just like the traveler who is content with a simple hotel. So in reality, this world is like the holiday destination in the example yet, Muslims do not treat it like one. Instead, they dedicate the majority of their efforts in beautifying their world while neglecting the eternal hereafter. It is sometimes hard to believe some Muslims actually believe in the permanent hereafter when one observes the amount of effort they dedicate to the temporal world. Muslims should therefore strive in preparing for the hereafter by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience while being pleased with obtaining and utilizing the necessities of this world. It is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised Muslims to live in this world as travelers in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6416. They should not take this world as a permanent home and instead treat it like a holiday destination. The Shade of a Tree Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, once set out to perform the holy pilgrimage, Hajj. During his travels, no tent was set up for him, and he instead put a cloak or a mat on a tree and shaded himself beneath it. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Qatab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 237. He truly lived as a traveler in this material world, just like his predecessors before him. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2377, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared that he was not concerned over the excess of this material world, and his example in this world is of a rider who takes a short rest under the shade of a tree and then leaves it behind by moving on. In reality, each person is a traveler who stays in this world for a very limited time compared to where they came from, meaning, the world of the souls, and to where they are heading, which is the eternal hereafter. In fact, this world in comparison is like waiting at a bus stop. 
In this narration, this world has been compared to a shadow. This is because a shadow does not last long and fades away quickly without people even taking notice, which is exactly how a person's days and nights pass away. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not mention a traveler's inn or a hotel, as these are solid structures which indicate permanence. A fading shadow better describes this material world. This is because no matter how old a person is, they always admit that their life flashed by and felt like a moment. Chapter 79 and Naziet, verse 46. It will be, on the day they see it, judgment day, as though they had not remained in the world, except for an afternoon or a morning thereof. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, indicated a rider not someone walking, as the one who is walking would rest more under the shade of the tree than a rider. This further indicates the limited time people spend in this world. Taking a rest in the shade indicates the importance of one correctly using the material world in order to obtain the provisions they need, just like the rider takes the provision they need namely, rest. A Muslim should therefore prepare for their immediate departure from this world by preparing for the hereafter, by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions, and by facing destiny with patience. This does not mean one should abandon this world, as this narration clearly indicates one should make use of the material world in order to prepare for the hereafter. The rider takes a rest and Muslims must gather the things which will benefit them in the hereafter, instead of dedicating their time to unnecessary things which will leave them empty-handed on Judgment Day. Chapter 89 Al-Faha, verses 23 to 24 And brought within view that day is hell, that day man will remember but how i.e. what good to him will be the remembrance. He will say, Oh I wish I sent ahead some good for my life. Company of the Greats Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was once advised to lead a more comfortable life. He replied by mentioning the difficult and simple lives of the holy Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, who had already passed away, and then commented that he said to himself that if he could share some of their hardships in this world, then perhaps he could share some of their comforts in the hereafter. This has been discussed in Imam al-Asfahani's Hiliyat al awliya number 74. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, understood that if he chose a path other than theirs, he would not end up with them in the hereafter. Every Muslim openly declares that they desire the companionship of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, the other Holy Prophets, peace be upon him then, and the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, in the hereafter. They often quote the narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 3688, which advises that a person will be with those they love in the hereafter. And because of this, they openly declare their love for these righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted. But it is strange how they desire this outcome and claim love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Yet they barely know him as they are too busy to study his life, character and teachings. This is foolish, as how can one truly love someone they do not even know? In addition, when these people are asked for proof of their love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, on Judgment Day, what will they say? What will they present? The proof of this declaration is studying and acting on the life, character and teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. A declaration without this evidence will not be accepted by Allah, the Exalted. This is quite obvious, as no one understood Islam better than the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, did, and this was not their attitude. They declared love for the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and supported their claim through actions by following in his footsteps. This is why they will be with him in the hereafter. Those who believe love is in the heart and does not require it to be shown through actions, is as foolish as the student who hands back a blank exam paper to their teacher, claiming that knowledge is in their mind, so they do not need to practically write it down on paper, and then still expects to pass. The one who behaves in such a manner does not love the righteous servants of Allah, the Exalted, only their own desires, and they have undoubtedly been fooled by the devil. Finally, it is important to note that members of other religions also claim love for their holy prophets, 
peace be upon them. But as they fail to follow in their footsteps and act on their teachings, they will certainly not be with them on judgment day. This is quite obvious if one ponders over this fact for a moment. The best. A senior companion, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that even though Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, was not the first of them to migrate to Medina, nor was he the first to accept Islam, yet he was the best of them because he was the most detached from the material world. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 238. This is further supported by another senior companion, Abdullah bin Masazud, may Allah be pleased with him, who once indicated that the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were the best group, after the holy prophets, peace be upon them, because they were the most detached from the material world than anyone else and more desirous of the hereafter than anyone else. This has been discussed in Imam Abu Naim al-Asfahani's Hilyat al awliya W.A. Tabaka al Asfiya, narration 278. Umar and the rest of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, adopted the correct mindset in respect to this material world and the hereafter. A mindset which allowed them to detach from the material world and concentrate all their efforts on the eternal hereafter, by using their worldly blessings in ways pleasing to Allah, the Exalted. In a narration found in Sunan ibn Majah, number 4108, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the material world compared to the hereafter is like a drop of water compared to an ocean. In reality, this parable was given in order for people to understand how small the material world is compared to the hereafter. But in reality, they cannot be compared as the material world is temporal, whereas the hereafter is eternal. Meaning, the limited cannot be compared to the unlimited. The material world can be split into four categories, fame, fortune, authority, and one social life, such as their family and friends. No matter what worldly blessing one obtains which falls within these groups, it will always be imperfect, transient, and death will cut a person off from the blessing. On the other hand, the blessings in the hereafter are lasting and perfect. So in this respect, the material world is no more than a drop compared to an endless ocean. In addition, a person is not guaranteed to experience a long life in this world, as the time of death is unknown. Whereas, everyone is guaranteed to experience death and reach the hereafter. So it is foolish to strive for a day, such as one's retirement, which they may never reach over striving for the hereafter which they are guaranteed to reach. This does not mean one should abandon the world, as it is a bridge which must be crossed in order to reach the hereafter safely. Instead, a Muslim should take from this material world enough to fulfill their necessities and the necessities of their dependents, according to the teachings of Islam, without waste, excessiveness or extravagance. And then dedicate the rest of their efforts in preparing for the eternal hereafter by fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted refraining from his prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience according to the teachings of Islam. An intelligent person will not prioritize the drop of water over an endless ocean, and an intelligent Muslim would not prioritize the temporal material world over the eternal hereafter. Becoming Pious Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would only eat from his own wealth even though he was entitled to eat from the public treasury, just like the other Muslims would. He once commented that he was afraid that the food from the public treasury would become fire in his stomach in the hereafter. On another occasion, a servant once gave him some milk. After tasting it, he questioned its origins. The servant told him that as his camel had run out of milk, he milked one of the camels belonging to the public treasury and gave that to him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, became upset and only drank it when he gained permission from some of the senior companions, may Allah be pleased with them. On another occasion, after falling sick, he was advised to take honey. Some honey was in the public treasury, but he abstained taking it until he publicly gained permission from the people to use it. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 238 to 240. 
He protected himself from the unlawful by abstaining from the lawful. This attitude leads to piety. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2451, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon, advised that a Muslim cannot become pious until they avoid something which is not harmful to their religion, out of caution that it will lead to something which is harmful. Piety can be summed up to mean fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from his prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This includes treating others how one desires to be treated by people. An aspect of piety is to avoid things which are doubtful, not just unlawful. This is because doubtful things take a Muslim one step closer to the unlawful. And the closer one is to the unlawful, the easier it is to fall into it. It is why a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1205, advises that the one who avoids unlawful and doubtful things and only uses lawful things will protect their religion and honor. If one observes those who have become misguided in society, in most cases, it occurred gradually, not in one sudden step. Meaning, the person first indulged in doubtful things before falling into the unlawful. This is the reason why Islam stresses the need to avoid unnecessary and vain things in one's life, as they can lead them to the unlawful. For example, vain and useless speech meaning, speech which derives no benefit, nor is it a sin, often leads to evil speech such as backbiting, lying and slander. If a person avoided the first step by not indulging in vain speech, they would avoid evil speech. This process can be applied to all things which are vain, unnecessary, and especially, doubtful. Therefore, a Muslim should strive to adopt piety as described earlier a branch of which is to avoid vain and doubtful things out of fear they will lead to the unlawful. The Slave of Allah, the Exalted Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, was once walking in the heat of the sun, and a young man passed him riding a donkey. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, asked to ride behind the man, but he instead unmounted and offered the ride to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. But Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, insisted that the young man ride the mount with him in the front, superior position, while he rode at the back. The people witnessed him entering Medina, in this state. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 241. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, understood that as riding a donkey in those days was a standard practice, he did not shy away from behaving like everyone else and doing what they did. He understood that behaving in this manner did not reduce his status in any way. He was a slave of Allah, the exalted, not a slave of worldly luxuries. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 2886, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, criticized the slaves of wealth and fine clothing. These people are pleased when they receive these things and become displeased when they do not. In reality, this applies to all non-essential worldly things. This criticism is not directed at those who strive in the material world in order to fulfill their needs and the needs of their dependents, as this is a part of obeying Allah, the Exalted. But it is directed at those who either pursue the unlawful in order to obtain wealth and other worldly things in order to satisfy their desires and the desires of others. And it is directed at those who pursue non-essential lawful things in such a way that it causes them to neglect obeying Allah, the Exalted, correctly. This obedience involves fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and facing destiny with patience according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This prevents them from preparing adequately for the hereafter and their final judgment. In addition, this criticism is for those who are impatient when they do not obtain their unnecessary desires in this world. This attitude can cause a Muslim to obey Allah, the Exalted, on the edge. Meaning, they obey Him when they obtain their desires, but when they do not, they angrily turn away from His obedience. The Holy Quran has warned of a severe loss in both worlds for the one who adopts this attitude. Chapter 22 Al-Hajj, verse 11 and of the people is he who worships Allah on an edge.
If he is touched by good, he is reassured by it. But if he is struck by trial, he turns on his face to unbelief. He has lost this world and the hereafter. That is what is the manifest loss. Muslims should instead learn to be patient and content with what they possess, as this is true richness, according to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 2420. In reality, the person full of desires is needy meaning, poor even if they possess much wealth. A Muslim should know Allah, the Exalted, grants people what is best for them and not according to their desires, as this in most cases would lead to their destruction. Chapter 42 Ash-Shirah, verse 27 And if Allah had extended excessively provision for his servants, they would have committed tyranny throughout the earth but he sends it down in an amount which he wills. Indeed he is of his servants, aware and seeing. Serving the people During a hot day, a delegation from Iraq visited Umar ibn Qatar. May Allah be pleased with him. They found him tending to the camels of the public treasury, which were being prepared to serve the widows, orphans and the needy. Someone commented that he should let the servants deal with the camels, but Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that, who was a greater servant of the people than him. He concluded, that the one who is appointed in charge of the affairs of the Muslims, is in the position of a servant to a master. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 241-242. It is a shame how things have changed so much since the day of the righteous predecessors. In those days, when they became leaders, they in fact, became the servants of the people, and instead of spending the people's money on their own personal things, they would spend their own personal money on the people. Whereas, nowadays the leaders and royal families instead spend the wealth of the people, and behave as if they are the masters of the nation. It is important for Muslims to select the righteous predecessors as their role models and adopt their characteristics. For example, Muslims must fulfill their duties towards all those under their care which has been advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2928. This does not mean one should not care about themselves. It means they should fulfill their own personal duties and then strive to fulfill their duties in respect to their dependents without going overboard. They must first obey Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience, and then fulfill the rights of people. Self-Reflection Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would often reflect on his state and actions. He was once heard rebuking himself and reminding himself to fear Allah, the Exalted, otherwise he would punish him. This has been discussed in a narration found in Mawata Malik, Book 56, Narration Number 24. Merely performing worship will not raise someone to the highest levels of faith. Muslims can only reach this level by purifying their inner beings. This is achieved by removing the negative characteristics they possess and replacing them with good characteristics. But this is only achieved through serious reflection and self-assessment. When one recognizes their own reality, this will encourage them to live like a servant and fulfill the purpose of their creation. This will lead them to recognizing Allah, the Exalted, as their Lord, which is the ultimate goal. Chapter 51 ad Dariat, verse 56 And I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me. This self-assessment is vital for triggering one to take the steps needed to purify their character and soul of evil characteristics, which is the path of success in both worlds. Some are so lost in the material world, they never perform this important deed, and therefore decades pass by without them changing one single bit. Muslims must use the time of strength they have been given in order to self-assess and change for the better before they reach the final stage of weakness. At this point they will desire to change, but they will not possess the intelligence or strength to do so. This has been indicated in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6412. One only needs to turn the pages of history to observe those who were given great power and wealth, but eventually a time came when their moment of strength ran out, and because of their persistent disobedience they were destroyed. 
Those who use their moments of strength in the correct way by pleasing Allah, the Exalted, will be blessed by Him in such a way that even after departing from this world, they will still be honored by society. As the majority of Muslims do not understand the Arabic language, an abundant amount of worship will not trigger this inner purification. One can only reach it by reflecting on this material world, death, the grave and hell. Because of this, a single moment of reflection can become better than 60 years of voluntary worship. Those who live without wisdom or reflection habitually make mistakes which only lead to constant stress. It is these people who lead an aimless life with no higher aspirations and move through each day without understanding their true purpose. The pious always take time out of their day to reflect on their aims, what actions they have performed and whether they have pleased Allah, the exalted or not. This mentality will ensure that one avoids sins, performs righteous deeds and if they happen to commit sins to sincerely repent. This mentality fits the advice given by the second rightly guided Caliph of Islam, Omar bin Khattab. May Allah be pleased with him, which is recorded in Imam Asfahani's Hilyat al Uliya, number 98. He advised that one should judge their own actions before someone else judges them, namely, Allah, the Exalted, on the Day of Judgment. This self-assessment is the key which inspires one to sincerely repent and change for the better. This is the best stage compared to the stage where one only realizes their mistakes when another points it out to them. But even this stage requires one to possess good friends and relatives who are wise and sincerely concerned over their eternal welfare, instead of only being concerned with the material world. A truly blessed Muslim is the one who possesses these types of relatives and friends who aid them to adopt piety. Reflecting at the start of one's day also ensures a person prioritizes their daily tasks and saves time by avoiding those tasks which should be delayed. The following verse describes the state of successful Muslims. They reflect on and are deeply affected by the teachings of Islam and strive to implement them in their lives. If one is affected in this way they should be grateful to Allah, the Exalted, and show no signs of pride. But if one is not affected in this way, they must repent and change before it is too late. Chapter 5 al maida verse 83 And when they hear what has been revealed to the Messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears because of what they have recognized of the truth. A lack of self-reflection has caused Muslims to become lost in the material world, even though Islamic knowledge is more readily available than it ever was. Voluntary worship will only take one so far, but to reach the height of faith they must reflect and assess their character. This will inspire them to abandon their evil traits and replace them with good ones. The vital ingredient needed to stimulate this self-assessment and reflection is Islamic knowledge which must be obtained from a reliable source. This is one of the reasons the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, declared in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 224, that obtaining this type of knowledge is obligatory on all Muslims. Acknowledging Others A group of people once commented that they never observed someone who judged more fairly, spoke the truth more plainly and was more harsh with dealing with hypocrisy than Umar Ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him. They concluded that they believed he was the best man after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. A companion, A.W.F. Ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, interjected and criticized them for their error in judgment. He reminded them that Abu Bakr was better than Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, and the most virtuous after the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him then commented that he had spoken the truth and that Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, was better than the scent of musk while he was still more misguided than his people's camel, before he accepted Islam. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 242 to 243. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, would always honor those who possessed the fear of Allah, the Exalted, and would never deem himself better than others, as this is an aspect of pride. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
peace and blessings be upon him, warned that a person who possesses even an atom's worth of pride in their heart will not enter paradise. He clarified that pride is when a person rejects the truth and looks down on others. No amount of good deeds will benefit someone who possesses pride. This is quite obvious when one observes the devil and how his countless years of worship did not benefit him when he became proud. In fact, the following verse clearly connects pride with disbelief, so a Muslim must avoid this evil characteristic at all costs. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 34 And mention when we said to the angels prostrate before Adam, so they prostrated except for Iblis. He refused and was arrogant and became of the disbelievers. The proud is the one who rejects the truth when it is presented to them, simply because it did not come from them and as it challenges their desires and mentality. The proud person also believes they are superior to others, even though they are unaware of their own ultimate end and the ultimate end of others. This is plain ignorance. In reality, it is foolish to be proud of anything, seeing as Allah, the Exalted, created and granted everything a person owns. Even the righteous deeds one performs are only due to the inspiration, knowledge and strength granted by Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, being proud of something which does not innately belong to them is plain foolishness. This is just like a person who becomes proud over a mansion they do not even own or live in. This is the reason why pride belongs to Allah, the Exalted, as He alone is the Creator and innate owner of all things. The one who challenges Allah, the Exalted, in pride will be thrown into hell. This has been confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4090. A Muslim should instead follow in the footsteps of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and adopt humility. The humble truly recognize that all the good they possess and all the evil they are protected from comes from no one except Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, humility is more fitting for a person than pride. A person should not be fooled into believing humility leads to disgrace, as no one has been more honored than the humble servants of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has guaranteed an increase in status for the one who adopts humility for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029. Taking revenge. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was once accused by an ignorant man of being miserly by not allocating enough wealth to him and of failing to judge with justice amongst the people. The man's nephew, who was educated in the Holy Quran, reminded Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, of the following verse of the Holy Quran. Chapter 7 at Torba, verse 199. Take to forgiveness, enjoin what is good, and turn away from the ignorant. Even though Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was angered by the man's comments, once he heard the Quranic verse, he reflected on it and calmed down. He then refrained from criticizing the man. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4642. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6853, advises that the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, never took revenge for himself but instead pardoned and overlooked. Muslims have been given permission to defend themselves in a proportionate and reasonable way when they are left with no other options. But they should never step over the line, as this is a sin. Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 190 Fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. As stepping over the mark is difficult to avoid, a Muslim should therefore adhere to patience, overlook and forgive others, as it is not only the tradition of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but also leads to Allah, the Exalted, forgiving their sins. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 22. And let them pardon and overlook. Would you not like that Allah should forgive you? Forgiving others is also more effective in changing the character of others in a positive way, which is the purpose of Islam, 
and a duty on Muslims, as taking revenge only leads to further enmity and anger between the people involved. Finally, those who have the bad habit of not forgiving others and always hold on to grudges, even over minor issues, may well find that Allah, the Exalted, does not overlook their faults and instead scrutinizes each of their small sins. A Muslim should learn to let things go, as this leads to forgiveness and peace of mind in both worlds. Sincerity to Allah, the Exalted Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once commented that the people would be honest with their ruler, as long as the ruler is honest, sincerely obeys with Allah, the Exalted. If the ruler was dishonest with Allah, the Exalted, then the people would become dishonest also. In addition, whenever Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, forbade the people from something, he would remind his family that if they were caught doing that deed, he would punish them twice over, as they were his family and therefore had more of a responsibility to sincerely obey Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 246. One of the major reasons why society seems to be digressing is because people have abandoned acting justly. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once warned in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6787, that previous nations were destroyed as the authorities would punish the weak when they broke the law, but would pardon the rich and influential. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, being the head of state even declared in this narration that if his own daughter committed a crime, he would enforce the full legal punishment on her. Even though members of the general public might not be in a position to advise their leaders to remain just in their actions, but they can influence them indirectly by acting justly in all their dealings and actions. For example, a Muslim must act justly in respect to their dependents, such as their children, by treating them equally. This has been specifically advised in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 3544. They should act justly in all their business dealings irrespective of who they deal with. If people act with justice on an individual level, then communities can change for the better, and in turn those who are in influential positions, such as politicians, will act justly whether they desire to or not. No advantage. Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, forbade his family from making use of publicly available resources out of fear they would be given preferential treatment. For example, his son Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, once used public land to graze his camels which he later intended to sell. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, found out, he commanded him to sell the camels and give the profits to the public treasury. He feared that his camels would be given preferential treatment, as he was the son of the Caliph. On another occasion, Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, bought some war booty with the intention to sell it for profit. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, found out, he told him he would allow him to keep a fraction of the profits he made, as he feared the booty was sold to him for a cheap price, as he was the son of the Caliph. After selling it, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, allowed him to keep 80,000 silver coins and donated the remaining 320,000 silver coins to the poor and needy. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 246 to 247. He even prevented his wife from measuring perfume in order to divide it amongst the people, as he feared she might rub some on herself thereby taking a greater share than the other Muslims. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 250. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, upheld the important Islamic principle of equality. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6543, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge people based on their outward appearance or their wealth. Instead, he observes and judges people's inward intention and their physical actions. The first thing to note is that a Muslim should always correct their intention when performing any deed, as Allah, the Exalted, will only reward them when they perform righteous deeds for his sake. 
Those who perform deeds for the sake of other people and things will be told to gain their reward from those who they acted for on Judgment Day, which will not be possible. This has been warned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3154. In addition, this narration indicates the importance of equality in Islam. A person is not superior to others by worldly things such as their ethnicity or wealth. Even though many Muslims have erected these barriers such as social castes and sex thereby believing some are better than others, Islam has clearly rejected this concept and declared that in this respect all people are equal in the sight of Islam. The only thing which makes one Muslim superior to another is their piety meaning how much they fulfill the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrain from his prohibitions and face destiny with patience. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. A Muslim should therefore busy themselves in obeying Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his rights and the rights of people, and not believe that something they possess or belong to will somehow save them from punishment. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has made it clear in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, that the Muslim who lacks in righteous deeds meaning the obedience of Allah, the exalted, will not be increased in rank because of their lineage. In reality, this applies to all worldly things such as wealth, ethnicity, gender or social brotherhoods and castes. Love for the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Even though many ignorant people have attempted to create wedges between Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him and the family of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. It is clear from their interactions and conduct towards one another that there was nothing but love and respect between them. Any ill feelings between them would only indicate selfishness and greed, negative characteristics they were all free from. For example, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would give priority to those who were closer and more beloved to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and those who sacrificed more for the sake of Islam in matters which did not contradict justice. For example, he once allocated Usama bin Zayd, may Allah be pleased with him, more wealth from the public treasury than his own son, Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. When his son questioned this, he replied that Usama's father, Zayd bin Haritha, may Allah be pleased with them, was more beloved to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, than his father, meaning Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, and Usama, may Allah be pleased with him, was more beloved to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him than him, meaning Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 248 to 249. On another occasion, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, invited the son of Ali and the grandson of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Hussein bin Ali, may Allah be pleased with them, to spend time with him. When he arrived at his home, he observed how Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was not given permission to see Umar who was with Mu'awiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, may Allah be pleased with them, and so he turned back without seeking permission to enter upon Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, eventually found out what occurred, he told Hussein bin Ali, may Allah be pleased with him that he had more of a right to enter upon him than his own son, Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. He then commented that the blessings the people were granted, was granted by Allah, the Exalted, because of the family of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 256. Even when Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, decided on how much regular wealth would be given to the people from the public treasury. He allocated the people according to their relationship with the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, even though he was advised to begin with himself and his own family. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 257. The family of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him, loved and respected, all the companions, including Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with them. 
Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, even gave his daughter Umm Kulthum. May Allah be pleased with her, the granddaughter of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in marriage to Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, even named his children after the first three caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman, may Allah be pleased with them. Would any sane person behave in this manner with someone they did not like or get on with? This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 258. Umar once kissed the head of Ali ibn Abu Talib, may Allah be pleased with them, and supplicated that may Allah, the exalted, not keep him in a land where Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, was absent. A sign of truly loving Allah, the exalted, and the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is to love all those who love Allah, the exalted, and the holy prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, for the sake of Allah, the exalted, even if this contradicts one's personal opinion about them. This love includes those who proclaim love through their words and more importantly, through their actions. For example, it is obvious to all that all the household of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may Allah be pleased with them, all the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, and the righteous predecessors possess this true love. So loving each of them is a duty upon the one who claims love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This has been proven through many narrations, such as the one found in Sahih Bukhari, number 17. It advises that love for the helpers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, meaning the residents of the holy city of Medina is a part of faith and hatred for them is a sign of hypocrisy. In another narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 3862, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has clearly warned Muslims not to criticize any of the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, as loving them is a sign of loving the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and hating them is a sign of hating the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and Allah, the Exalted. This person will not succeed unless they sincerely repent. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned a similar statement regarding his blessed household, may Allah be pleased with them, in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 143. If a Muslim unjustifiably criticizes any Muslim who demonstrates their love for Allah, the Exalted, it proves their lack of love for Allah, the Exalted. If a Muslim commits a sin, other Muslims should hate the sin, but they should, for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, still have love for the sinful Muslim, because of their love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The sign of loving others is to treat them kindly and respectfully. Simply put, one should treat others how they wish people to treat them. In addition, a Muslim should dislike all those who show dislike for those who love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him, irrespective of if the person is a relative or a stranger. A Muslim's feelings should never prevent them from fulfilling this sign of true love for Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. This does not mean they should harm them, but they should make it clear to them that hating those who love Allah, the Exalted, and the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, is unacceptable. If they persist on this deviant attitude, then one should separate from them until they sincerely repent. Respect for Knowledge Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, would keep those who possessed Islamic knowledge close to him, irrespective of their age or social background. A companion, may Allah be pleased with him, once criticized the presence of Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, in one of the gatherings of Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, as he felt he was too young to sit with them. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, once asked for the interpretation of chapter 110 and Nasa of the Holy Quran. Some people from the gathering gave their opinions, while others remained silent. When he asked Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave a different interpretation which Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, agreed with. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 4294. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, 
had a deep appreciation for the people of knowledge and always sought their companionship. Muslims must strive to become one of these people. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that whoever follows a path seeking knowledge, Allah, the Exalted, will make the path to paradise easy for them. This indicates both a physical path someone takes seeking knowledge, such as attending lectures and classes, and a path whereby someone seeks knowledge without a physical journey. It encompasses all forms of knowledge, such as listening, reading, studying, and writing about knowledge. The path to paradise has many obstacles, preventing a Muslim from reaching it. Only the one who possesses knowledge of them, and how to overcome them, will reach paradise safely. In addition, it easily understood that a person cannot reach a city in this world without knowledge of its location, and the route which leads to it. Similarly, Paradise cannot be obtained without knowing these things about it, such as the path leading to it. But the important thing to note is that a Muslim's intention to seek and act on knowledge must be to please Allah, the Exalted. Whoever seeks religious knowledge for a worldly reason, such as showing off, will end up in hell if they fail to sincerely repent. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Ibn Majah, number 253. In addition, a Muslim must strive to act on their knowledge, as knowledge without action is of no value or benefit. This is like the one who possesses knowledge of a path to safety, but does not take it, and instead remains in an area full of dangers. This is why knowledge can be split into two categories. The first is when one ACTS on their knowledge, which leads to piety and an increase in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. The second is when one fails to act on their knowledge. This type will not increase one's obedience to Allah, the Exalted, in fact, it will only increase them in arrogance believing they are superior to others, even though they are like donkeys which carry books that do not benefit it. Chapter 62 Al-Jumu'ah, verse 5 And then did not take it on, did not act on their knowledge, is like that of a donkey who carries volumes of books. Honoring Women Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, always upheld the important Islamic principle of honoring women. He worked tirelessly to ensure they received their rights and were never wronged within the society. He once commented that if he lived long enough, he would ensure that no widow living in Iraq, the furthest land of the Islamic empire at that time, would need the support of anyone else. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 294. On another occasion, a man who was close to dying divorced his wives in order to avoid them inheriting any part of his wealth. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed, he threatened the man and warned him that if he did not take back his wives he would forcefully take his wealth after he died and give each of them their share of the inheritance. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 531 to 532. On a general note, before Islam, in the age of ignorance, it was common practice for women to be equated with articles of home use. They would be bought and sold like cattle. A woman had no rights in respect to marriage. Far from being entitled to some share in the inheritance from her relatives, she herself was treated as a piece of the inheritance like other household items. She was considered as something owned by men while she was allowed to own nothing. And she could only spend according to the wishes of a man. Whereas, the man could spend any wealth which should belong to her, like wages, according to his desires. She did not even have the right to question this method. Some groups from Europe even considered women not to be a human, and equated her with an animal. Women had no place in religion. They were considered unfit for worship. Some even declared women to possess no souls. It was considered completely normal for a father to kill his newborn or young daughter, as they were seen as a shame on the family. Some even believed that no act of justice would be taken against the one who killed a woman. Some customs even killed the wife of a dead husband, 
as she was not seen fit enough to live without him. Some even declared that the purpose of women was only to serve men. But Allah, the Exalted, through the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, taught man to respect all people, made justice and equity the law, and men were made responsible for fulfilling the rights of women parallel to their own rights on them. Women were made free and independent. She became the owner of her own life and property, just like men. No man can force a woman to marry someone. If she is forced to, without her consent, then it becomes her choice to continue the marriage or annul it. No man has a right to spend anything from what belongs to her, without her consent and approval. After the death of her husband or after divorce, she becomes independent and she cannot be compelled by anyone to do anything. She gets a share in the inheritance, like men, according to the responsibilities given to her by Allah, the Exalted. To spend on women and treat them well has been declared an act of worship by Allah, the Exalted. All these rights and more have been given to women by none other than Allah, the Exalted. It is strange how those who stand up for women's rights today, criticize Islam even though it gave women rights centuries earlier. Accepting Advice and Criticism Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, would accept constructive criticism and advice from anyone, irrespective of their level of knowledge or social background. For example, he once was stopped by an elderly woman, Kaula bint Talibah, may Allah be pleased with her, outside the mosque of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. She constructively advised him at length. When someone rebuked her for being harsh and taking much of his time, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, criticized him and added that he would stay standing listening to her for as long as she kept talking, as she was the one whose complaint was heard and responded to by Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 58 Al-Mujadila, verses 1-4 to of the Holy Quran were revealed because of her. Those who pronounce zihar among you to separate from their wives, they are not consequently their mothers. Their mothers are none but those who gave birth to them. And indeed, they are saying an objectionable statement and a falsehood. But indeed, Allah is pardoning and forgiving, and for the disbelievers is a painful punishment. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 265-266. Generally speaking, a Muslim should always remember that there are two types of people. The first are rightly guided, as their criticism of others is based on the criticism and advice found in the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This type will always be constructive and guide one to blessings and the pleasure of Allah, the Exalted, in both worlds. These people will also refrain from over or under praising others. Overpraising others can cause them to become proud and arrogant. Underpraising others can lead them to becoming lazy and put them off from doing good. This reaction is often observed in children. Praising according to the teachings of Islam will inspire others to strive harder in both worldly and religious matters, and it will prevent them from becoming arrogant. Therefore, the praise and constructive criticism of this person should be accepted and acted upon, even if it comes from a stranger. The second type of person criticizes based on their own desires. This criticism is mostly unconstructive and only shows one's bad mood and attitude. These people often over and under praise others as they act based on their own desires. The negative effects of these two were mentioned earlier. Therefore, the criticism and praise of this person should be ignored in the majority of cases, even if it comes from a loved one, as it will only cause one to become unnecessarily sad in cases of criticism and arrogant in cases of praise. It is important to remember that a person who over-praises others will often over-criticize them too. The rule one should always follow is that they should only accept the criticism and praise based on the teachings of Islam. All other things should be ignored and not taken personally. Protecting the rights of women Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once proposed marriage to the daughter of Abu Bakr, Um Kulthum, may Allah be pleased with them. She refused as he led a hard life and feared his strictness. 
Amra ibn al-As subtly told Umar, May Allah be pleased with them, her response, and he accepted her decision without complaining or pressuring her into accepting, a behavior which was very common in the pre-Islamic days of ignorance. In addition, Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, once warned people not to force their daughters to marry unattractive men, as they like in their spouses what men like in their spouses. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 268 to 269. Generally speaking, as indicated by the warning given by Umar, may Allah be pleased with him. One can protect the rights of others if they strive to treat others how they desire to be treated by people. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 13, that a person cannot become a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. This does not mean a Muslim will lose their faith if they fail to adopt this characteristic. It means that a Muslim's faith will not be complete until they act on this advice. This narration also indicates that a Muslim will not perfect their faith until they also dislike for others what they dislike for themselves. This is supported by another narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6586. It advises that the Muslim nation is like one body. If one part of the body is in pain, the rest of the body shares the pain. This mutual feeling includes loving and hating for others what one loves and hates for themselves. A Muslim can only achieve this status when their heart is free from evil traits such as envy. These evil traits will always cause one to desire better for themselves. So in reality, this narration is an indication that one should purify their heart by adopting good characteristics such as being forgiving and eliminate evil traits such as envy. This is only possible through learning and acting on the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. It is important for Muslims to understand that desiring good for others will cause them to lose out on good things. The treasury of Allah, the exalted, has no limits, so there is no need to adopt a selfish and greedy mentality. Desiring good for others includes striving to aid others in any way one can, such as financial or emotional support, in the same way a person would desire others to aid them in their moment of need. Therefore, this love must be shown through actions not just words. Even when a Muslim forbids evil and offers advice which contradicts the desire of others, they should do so gently, just like they would want others to advise them kindly. As mentioned earlier, the main narration under discussion indicates the importance of eliminating all bad characteristics which contradict mutual love and care, such as envy. Envy is when a person desires to possess a specific blessing which is only obtainable when it is taken away from someone else. This attitude is a direct challenge to the distribution of blessings chosen by Allah, the Exalted. This is why it is a major sin and leads to the destruction of the envious good deeds. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903. If a Muslim must desire the lawful things others possess, they should wish and supplicate to Allah, the Exalted, to grant them the same or similar thing without the other person losing the blessing. This type of jealousy is lawful and is praiseworthy in aspects of religion. This has been advised in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Muslims should only be jealous of a wealthy person who uses their wealth correctly, and be jealous of a knowledgeable person who uses their knowledge to benefit themselves and others. A Muslim should not only love for others to obtain lawful worldly blessings, but also for them to gain religious blessings in both worlds. In fact, when one wishes this for others, it encourages them to strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling His commands, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This type of healthy competition is welcomed in Islam. Chapter 83 Al-Mutafafan, verse 26 So for this let the competitors compete. This encouragement will also inspire a Muslim to assess themselves in order to find and eliminate any faults in their character. 
When these two elements combine meaning, striving in sincere obedience to Allah, the exalted, and purifying one's character, it leads to success in both worlds. A Muslim must therefore not only claim to love for others what they desire for themselves verbally, but show it through their actions. It is hoped that the one who is concerned for others in this way will receive the concern of Allah, the exalted, in both worlds. This has been indicated in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1930. Reasons for Marriage A man once told Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, that he desired to divorce his wife as he did not love her. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, replied that not all houses are built on love, and he should consider loyalty and appreciation before making a hasty decision. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 270. Even though Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, did not indicate that feelings of love was not important in a marriage, but as love is a fickle emotion, one must not base their decisions completely on it. A freed slave once proposed marriage to a woman from the most noblest of tribes, the Quraysh, but her brother refused his proposal. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, then spoke to the brother and advised him to accept the proposal, as he was a righteous man who would benefit his family in both worlds, as long as his sister was pleased to accept. They all agreed and the marriage took place. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 281. Generally speaking, one should search for a spouse based on the teachings of Islam and not fickle emotions or worldly reasons, as this will increase the chance of a successful marriage. In a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5090, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that a person is married for four reasons, their wealth, lineage, beauty, or for their piety. He concluded by warning that a person should marry for the sake of piety, otherwise they will be a loser. It is important to understand that the first three things mentioned in this narration are very transient and imperfect. They may give someone temporary happiness, but ultimately these things will become a burden for them as they are linked to the material world and not to the thing which grants ultimate and permanent success, namely, faith. One only needs to observe the rich and famous in order to understand that wealth does not bring happiness. In fact, the rich are the most unsatisfied and unhappy people on earth. Marrying someone for the sake of their lineage is foolish, as it does not guarantee the person will make a good spouse. In fact, if the marriage does not work out it destroys the family bond the two families possessed before the marriage. Marrying only for the sake of beauty meaning, love is not wise, as this is a fickle emotion which changes with the passing of time and with one's mood. How many couples, supposedly drowned in love, ended up hating each other? But it is important to note, that this narration does not mean one should find a spouse who is poor, as it is important to get married to someone who can financially support a family. Neither does it mean one should not be attracted to their spouse, as this is an important aspect of a healthy marriage. But this narration means that these things should not be the main or ultimate reason someone gets married. The main and ultimate quality a Muslim should look for in a spouse is piety. This is when a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience. Put simply, the one who fears Allah, the Exalted, will treat their spouse well in both times of happiness and difficulty. On the other hand, those who are irreligious will mistreat their spouse whenever they are upset. This is one of the main reasons why domestic violence has increased amongst Muslims in recent years. Finally, if a Muslim desires to get married, they should firstly obtain the knowledge associated with it, such as the rights they owe their spouse, the rights they are owed from their spouse, and how to correctly deal with one spouse in different situations. Unfortunately, ignorance of this leads to many arguments and divorces as people demand things which their spouse is not obliged to fulfill. Knowledge is the foundation of a healthy and successful marriage. Judging others Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once warned that a person should not be deceived by the fasting or prayer of another. Instead, they should observe their reason and honesty. 
This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 272. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1971, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, discussed the importance of truthfulness and avoiding lies. The first part advises that truthfulness leads to righteousness, which in turn leads to paradise. When a person persists on truthfulness, they are recorded by Allah, the Exalted, as a truthful person. It is important to note that truthfulness has three levels. The first is when one is truthful in their intention and sincerity. Meaning, they act only for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, and do not benefit others for an ulterior motive such as fame. This in fact is the foundation of Islam, as every action is judged on one's intention. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1. The next level is when one is truthful through their words. This in reality means they avoid all types of verbal sins, not just lies. As the one who indulges in other verbal sins, cannot be a real truthful person. An excellent way of achieving this is by acting on a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2317, which advises that a person can only make their Islam excellent when they avoid getting involved in the things which do not concern them. The majority of verbal sins occur because a Muslim discusses something which does not concern them. The final stage is truthfulness in actions. This is achieved through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted, by fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and being patient with destiny, according to the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, without cheery picking or misinterpreting the teachings of Islam which suit one's desires. They must adhere to hierarchy and priority order set by Allah, the Exalted, in all actions. The consequences of the opposite of these levels of truthfulness, namely, lying, according to the main narration under discussion, is that it leads to disobedience which in turn leads to the fire of hell. When one persists on this attitude, they will be recorded as a great liar by Allah, the Exalted. Honoring Others The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, to ask a man named Uwais ibn Amir, may Allah have mercy on him, to pray for their forgiveness if they ever met him. Uways, may Allah have mercy on him, lived in the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, but did not have the chance to meet him. Years later, during his caliphate, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, met Uways, may Allah have mercy on him, and asked him to pray for his forgiveness. This has been discussed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6492. Even though Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was more virtuous than Uways, may Allah have mercy on him. Yet this did not prevent him from asking him to supplicate on his behalf. This is an indication of the great humility Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, possessed. This is connected to chapter 25 Al-Furqan, verse 63. And the servants of the most merciful are those who walk upon the earth easily. The servants of Allah, the Exalted, have understood that anything good they possess is solely because Allah, the Exalted, granted it to them. And any evil they are saved from is because Allah, the Exalted, protected them. Is it not foolish to be proud of something that does not belong to someone? Just like a person does not boast about a sports car which does not belong to them, Muslims must realize nothing in reality belongs to them. This attitude ensures one remains humble at all times. The humble servants of Allah, the Exalted, fully believe in the narration of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, found in Sahih Bukhari, number 5673, which declares that the righteous deeds of a person will not take them to paradise. Only the mercy of Allah, the Exalted, can cause this to occur. This is because every righteous deed is only possible when Allah, the Exalted, provides one with the knowledge, strength, opportunity and inspiration to perform it. Even the acceptance of the deed is dependent on the mercy of Allah, the Exalted. When one bears this in mind, it saves them from pride and inspires them to adopt humility. One should always remember that being humble is not a sign of weakness, 
as Islam has encouraged one to defend themselves if necessary. In other words, Islam teaches Muslims to be humble without weakness. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2029, that whoever humbles themselves before Allah, the Exalted, will be raised by him. So in reality, humility leads to honor in both worlds. One only needs to reflect on the most humble of the creation to understand this fact, namely, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Allah, the Exalted, has clearly ordered people by ordering the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, to adopt this important quality. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara, verse 215 And lower your wing, i.e., show kindness to those who follow you of the believers. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, led a humble life. For example, he happily carried out the domestic duties at home, thereby proving these chores are gender neutral. This is confirmed in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 538. Humility is an inner characteristic that manifests outwards, such as the way one walks. This is discussed in another verse, chapter 31, Luke Man, verse 18. And do not turn your cheek in contempt toward people, and do not walk through the earth exultantly. Allah, the Exalted, has made it clear that paradise is for the humble servants who possess no trace of pride. Chapter 28 al Qasas, verse 83 That home of the hereafter we assign to those who do not desire exaltedness upon the earth or corruption. And the best outcome is for the righteous. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1998, that whoever possesses an atom's worth of pride will not enter paradise. Only Allah, the Exalted, has the right to be proud, as He is the Creator, Sustainer, and Owner of the entire universe. It is important to note, pride is when one believes they are superior to others and rejects the truth when it is presented to them, as they dislike accepting the truth when it comes from other than them. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4092. Seeking Good Companionship Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised people to seek good companions. He told them to look for sincere companions, as they keep others happy, and they will be a source of pleasure in times of ease and a support during times of difficulty. They should always think positively about others, until they do something that justifies keeping away from them. They should keep away from their enemies and beware of others, except those who are trustworthy. And no one was trustworthy unless they feared Allah, the Exalted. They should not keep the company of an evil doer, otherwise they will be negatively influenced. They should not tell them their secrets, and they should only consult those who fear Allah, the Exalted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 277 to 278. Muslims should note that a major sign of true love is when one directs their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, which involves fulfilling his commands, refraining from his prohibitions, and facing destiny with patience. This is because obedience leads to success and safety in both this world and in the hereafter. A person who does not desire safety and success for a person can never truly love them irrespective of what they claim or how they treat the other person. The same way a person becomes happy when their beloved obtains worldly success, like a job, they will also desire their beloved to obtain success in the hereafter. If a person does not care about another obtaining safety and success especially in the next world, then they do not love them. A true lover could not bear knowing and seeing their beloved facing difficulties and punishment in this world or in the next. This is only avoidable through the sincere obedience of Allah, the Exalted. Therefore, they would always direct their beloved towards the obedience of Allah, the Exalted. If a person directs another towards their own selfish interest or the interest of others instead of the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. This applies to all relationships, such as friendships and relatives. 
Therefore, a Muslim should assess whether those in their life direct them towards Allah, the Exalted, or not. If they do, then it is a clear sign of their love for them. If they do not, then it is a clear sign that they do not truly love them. Chapter 43 as Zukruf, verse 67. Close friends that day will be enemies to each other, except for the righteous. Nobility lies in faith. Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, would give priority to those who served Islam longer and sacrificed more for it, even if this meant he gave priority to serving and fulfilling the needs of former slaves over the noble Arab men. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 278-279. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 5116, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, clearly warned that nobility does not lie in one's lineage as all people are the descendants of the Holy Prophet Adam, peace be upon him, and he was made of dust. Therefore, people should give up boasting about their relatives and lineage. It is important to understand that even though some ignorant Muslims have adopted the attitude of other nations by creating castes and sects thereby believing some people are superior to others, based on these groups, Islam, declared a simple criterion for superiority, namely, piety. Meaning, the more a Muslim fulfills the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refrains from his prohibitions and faces destiny with patience, the greater they are in rank in the sight of Allah, the Exalted. Chapter 49 Al-Hajarat, verse 13 Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. This verse destroys all other standards which have been created by ignorant people such as one's race, ethnicity, wealth, gender or social status. In addition, if a Muslim is proud of a pious person in their lineage, they should correctly demonstrate this belief by praising Allah, the Exalted, and following in their footsteps. Boasting about others without following in their footsteps will not help someone in either this world or the next. This has been made clear in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2945. Finally, the one who is proud of others but fails to follow in their footsteps is indirectly dishonoring them as the outside world will observe their bad character and assume their righteous ancestor behaved in the same manner. These people should therefore strive harder in the obedience of Allah, the Exalted, because of this reason. These are like those people who adopt the outward traditions and advice of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, such as growing a beard or wearing a scarf yet fail to adopt his inner character. The outside world will only think negatively about the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, when they observe the bad character of these Muslims. Mistreating others Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was always keen to ensure no one was mistreated. For example, he once warned one of his employees not to harm any Muslim and to fear the supplication of the oppressed, as it is always accepted. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al Qatab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 284-285. In a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, warned that the bankrupt Muslim is the one who accumulates many righteous deeds, such as fasting and prayer. But as they mistreated people, their good deeds will be given to their victims, and if necessary, their victims' sins will be given to them on Judgment Day. This will lead to them being hurled into hell. It is important to understand that a Muslim must fulfill two aspects of faith in order to achieve success. The first are the duties in respect to Allah, the Exalted, such as the obligatory prayer. The second aspect is in respect to people, which includes treating them kindly. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan an nasai number 4998, that a person cannot be a true believer until they keep their physical and verbal harm away from the life and possessions of others. It is important to understand that Allah, the Exalted, is infinitely forgiving meaning. He will forgive those who sincerely repent to Him. But He will not forgive the sins which involve other people until the victim forgives first. 
As people are not so forgiving a Muslim should be fearful that those who they have wronged will exact revenge on them by taking away their precious good deeds on Judgment Day. Even if a Muslim fulfills the rights of Allah, the exalted, they may still end up in hell simply because they have wronged others. It is therefore important for Muslims to strive to fulfill both aspects of their duties in order to obtain success in both worlds. Helping the needy A slave once asked his owner to create a contract for manumission, freedom, but the owner refused. The slave complained to Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, who summoned the owner and commanded him to obey the Holy Quran and to create the contract. Chapter 24 and Nur, verse 33 and those who seek a contract for eventual emancipation, from among whom your right hands possess, then make a contract with them if you know there is within them goodness. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 285. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, could have honored the owner and dismissed the slave, yet his obedience to the Holy Quran guided him to act justly. Generally speaking, in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6853, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, that whoever relieves the distress of a Muslim Allah, the exalted, will relieve a hardship from them on the day of judgment. This shows that a Muslim is treated by Allah, the exalted, in the same way they act. There are many examples of this within the teachings of Islam. For example, chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 152. So remember me, I will remember you. Another example is mentioned in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 1924. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that the one who shows mercy to others will receive mercy from Allah, the Exalted. A distress is anything which causes someone to fall into anxiety and difficulty. Therefore, the one who eases such a distress for another, whether worldly or religious for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, will be protected from a hardship on Judgment Day by Allah, the Exalted. This has been indicated in different ways in many narrations. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Advised in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2449, that the one who feeds a hungry Muslim will be fed the fruits of paradise on the day of judgment. And the one who gives a drink to a thirsty Muslim will be given a drink from paradise by Allah, the exalted, on the day of judgment. As the difficulties of the hereafter are much greater than those found in the world, this reward is held back for a Muslim until they reach the hereafter. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Allah, the Exalted, will continue helping a Muslim as long as they are helping others. A Muslim must understand that when they strive for something or are aided by another person to complete a particular task, the outcome may be successful or end in failure. But when Allah, the Exalted, helps someone with anything, a successful outcome is guaranteed. Therefore, Muslims should, for their own sake, strive to help others in all good things so that they receive the help of Allah, the Exalted, in both worldly and religious matters. Balanced Diet Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once advised others to adopt a healthy diet. He told them to beware of overeating, for it causes laziness in prayer and leads to sickness. He warned them that Allah, the Exalted, hates the overweight person. They should be moderate in their eating, for that is closer to righteousness and further removed from extravagance and builds up strength for worship. He concluded that a person will be doomed when they give precedence to their desires over their religious commitment. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 288 to 289. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, Number 2380, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised the importance of a balanced diet. He advised that one should split their stomach into three parts. The first part is for food, the second part is for drink, and the last part should be left empty for breathing. This can be achieved when one stops eating before they reach their fill. This was the behavior of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, 
Peace and blessings be upon him and his companions, may Allah be pleased with them. If people were to act on this advice, they would be safe from both physical and mental illnesses. In fact, according to many knowledgeable people, one of the main causes of illness is indigestion. In respect to the heart, little food leads to a soft heart, humility of self and weakness of desires and anger. A full stomach results in laziness which prevents worship and other righteous deeds. It induces sleep which causes one to miss out on the voluntary and even the obligatory night prayers. It prevents reflection which is the key to assessing one's deeds and therefore changing one's character for the better. The one with a full stomach forgets the poor and is therefore less likely to help them. All these negative effects lead to a hard heart. The one who possesses a hard heart will not be safe on the day of judgment. Chapter 26 Ash-Shu'ara verses 88 to 89 The day when there will not benefit anyone well for children, but only one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. The one who is only concerned about their stomach becomes distracted from more important things, such as learning and acting on religious knowledge. Muslims should know that the most fed in this world will be the hungriest on the day of judgment. This is confirmed in a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2478. Therefore, Muslims should strive to obtain a balanced diet, so that they avoid the negative effects discussed, which will undoubtedly hinder their success in both this world and the next. Encouraging Exercise Umar ibn Qatab, may Allah be pleased with him, was concerned about the physical health of others, as well as their spiritual health. He would advise others to teach their children swimming, archery, and horse riding. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabi's Umar ibn al-Qatab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 289. The Holy Quran has advised against those activities which provide no benefit in this world and in the next. But all other activities, even if they appear worldly, such as exercise, are lawful. For example, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, were encouraged to practice horse riding and archery by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in a narration found in Sunan and Nasai, number 3608, as these are a form of exercise and self-defense training. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, once advised in a narration found in Imam Asfahani's, Hiliyat al Aulia, number 420, that one of best physical activities is swimming which modern science also testifies to. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even gave permission to a companion, may Allah be pleased with him, to race against another person in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4678, thereby proving such sports are lawful in Islam. According to the wife of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, even they raced each other on two occasions. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, won the first race and the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, won the second. This has been recorded in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 2578. Finally, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, even took part in a wrestling match when he was challenged by a local wrestler which the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, won. This incident has been recorded in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4078. All the activities which derive a benefit to someone's physical, mental or social state are lawful in Islam as long as the conditions set by Islam are fulfilled. This mentality has been summed up in a single narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 43, where the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that he disliked the one who was too strict in their voluntary ACTS of worship. Unfortunately, some incorrectly claim that Islam is a tough religion. This can occur when uneducated people misinterpret the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. According to a narration found in Imam Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad, number 287, Allah, the Exalted, loves a simple religion. This statement can also be observed in the Holy Quran where it clearly declares that Allah, the Exalted, does not desire hardship for mankind. 
Chapter 2 Al-Baqarah, verse 185 Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for you hardship. Islam advises Muslims to live in such a way so that this material world and their faith walk hand in hand. Unfortunately, some have twisted this philosophy to suit their own desires. They take part in many pointless things and claim they are living up to this mentality. They fail to recognize that only those things in the material world which provide genuine benefit in this world or in the next fall within this statement. For example, playing sports is a form of exercise which is beneficial for the body. Working to earn lawful provision is useful as one can fulfill their needs through it. Playing with one's children helps to strengthen the bond of love with them. All these are worldly ACTS which provide some benefit and thus fall under the statement mentioned earlier, as long as they are done moderately meaning in a balanced way. But those ACTS that provide no benefit in this world or in the next are not included in this statement. One needs to learn from the teachings of the Holy Quran and the traditions of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, in order to determine the balance they should adopt in this world so that they can gain success in both worlds. Gentleness in all matters Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once inquired about a man who he had not seen for a while. He was told that he had become addicted to alcohol and therefore stayed away from him. Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, wrote a letter to him and quoted the following verses and prayed for his repentance. Chapter 40 Gafur, verses 1 to 3. Hameen. The revelation of the book, the Quran, is from Allah, the exalted in might, the knowing, the forgiver of sin, acceptor of repentance, severe in punishment, owner of abundance. There is no deity except him, to him is the destination. After receiving his letter, the man recited the verses repeatedly and eventually repented from his sins. When Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was informed, he told others that one should be soft with others by correcting them, praying for them, and avoid aiding the devil against them, by pushing them further away from Islam through harshness. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, pages 289 to 290. In a narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2701, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, advised that Allah, the Exalted, loves gentleness in all matters. This is an important characteristic which must be adopted by all Muslims. It should be used in all aspects of one's life. It is important to understand that being gentle benefits the Muslim themselves more than anyone else. Not only will they receive blessings and reward from Allah, the Exalted, and minimize the amount of sins they commit, as a gentle person is less likely to commit sins through their speech and actions, but it benefits them in worldly affairs also. For example, the person who treats their spouse gently will gain more love and respect in return than if they treated their spouse in a harsh manner. Children are more likely to obey and treat their parents with respect when they are treated gently. Colleagues at work are more likely to help the one who is gentle with them. The examples are endless. Only in very rare cases is a harsh attitude required. In most cases, gentle behavior will be much more effective than a harsh attitude. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, possesses countless good qualities yet, Allah, the Exalted, specifically highlighted his gentleness in the Holy Quran as it is a key ingredient required to affect others in a positive way. Chapter 3 Al-Imran, verse 159 so by mercy from Allah, you were lenient with them. And if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. A Muslim must remember that they will never be better than a holy prophet. Peace be upon them. Nor will the person they interact with be worse than Pharaoh yet. Allah, the Exalted, commanded the holy prophet Mosa and the holy prophet Harun, peace be upon them, to deal with Pharaoh in a kind manner. Chapter 20 Taha, verse 44 And speak to him with gentle speech that perhaps he may be reminded or fear Allah. Therefore, a Muslim should adopt gentleness in all affairs as it leads to much reward and affects others, such as one's family, 
in a positive way. Avoiding disunity. Umar ibn Qatar, may Allah be pleased with him, would take steps to ensure unity amongst the Muslims. For example, he once advised people not to hold regular private meetings as this may cause people to form groups and factions. This would lead to disunity amongst the Muslims. Instead, they should make their gatherings open for everyone so that love spreads within the society. This has been discussed in Imam Muhammad as Salabis, Umar ibn al-Khattab, His Life and Times, Volume 1, page 291. Muslims must strive to take steps to avoid disunity within society. A narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6541, discusses some aspects of creating unity within society. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, firstly advised Muslims not to envy each other. This is when a person desires to obtain the very blessing someone else possesses meaning. They desire for the owner to lose the blessing. And it involves disliking the fact that the owner was given the blessing by Allah, the exalted, instead of them. Some only desire this to occur in their hearts without showing it through their actions or speech. If they dislike their thought and feeling, it is hoped that they will not be held accountable for their envy. Some exert efforts through their speech and actions in order to confiscate the blessing from the other person, which is undoubtedly a sin. The worst kind is when a person strives to remove the blessing from the owner, even if the envier does not obtain the blessing. Envy is only lawful when a person does not act on their feelings, dislikes their feeling, and if they strive to obtain a similar blessing without the owner losing the blessing they possess. Even though this type is not sinful yet, it is disliked if the envy is over a worldly blessing and only praiseworthy if it involves a religious blessing. For example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, mentioned two examples of the praiseworthy type in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 1896. The first is when a person envies the one who acquires and spends lawful wealth in ways pleasing to Allah, the exalted. The second is when a person envies the one who uses their wisdom and knowledge in the correct way and teaches it to others. The evil type of envy, as mentioned earlier, directly challenges the choice of Allah, the Exalted. The envious person behaves as if Allah, the Exalted, made a mistake giving a particular blessing to someone else instead of them. This is why it is a major sin. In fact, as warned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad, Peace and blessings be upon him. In a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4903, envy destroys good deeds just like fire consumes wood. An envious Muslim must strive to act on the narration found in Jamie at Termidi, number 2515. It advises that a person cannot be a true believer until they love for others what they love for themselves. An envious Muslim should therefore strive to remove this feeling from their heart by showing good character and kindness towards the person they envy, such as praising their good qualities and supplicating for them until their envy becomes love for them. Another thing advised in the main narration quoted at the beginning is that Muslims should not hate each other. This means one should only dislike something if Allah, the exalted, dislikes it. This has been described as an aspect of perfecting one's faith in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. A Muslim should therefore not dislike things or people according to their own desires. If one dislikes another according to their own desires, they should never allow it to affect their speech or actions, as it is sinful. A Muslim should strive to remove the feeling by treating the other according to the teachings of Islam meaning, with respect and kindness. A Muslim should remember that other people are not perfect, just like they are not perfect. And if others possess a bad characteristic, they will undoubtedly possess good qualities also. Therefore, a Muslim should advise others to abandon their bad characteristics, but continue to love the good qualities they possess. Another point must be made on this topic. A Muslim who follows a particular scholar who advocates a specific belief should not act like a fanatic and believe their scholar is always right thereby hating those who oppose their scholar's opinion. This behavior is not disliking something someone for the sake of Allah, the exalted. 
As long as there is a legitimate difference of opinion amongst the scholars, a Muslim following a particular scholar should respect this and not dislike others who differ from what the scholar they follow believes. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Muslims should not turn away from each other. This means they should not sever ties with other Muslims over worldly issues, thereby refusing to support them according to the teachings of Islam. According to a narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 6077, it is unlawful for a Muslim to sever ties with another Muslim over a worldly issue for more than three days. In fact, the one who severs ties for more than a year over a worldly issue is considered like the one who has killed another Muslim. This has been warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4915. Severing ties with others is only lawful in matters of faith. But even then, a Muslim should continue to advise the other Muslim to sincerely repent and only avoid their company if they refuse to change for the better. They should still support them on lawful things when they are requested to do so, as this act of kindness may inspire them to sincerely repent from their sins. Another thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that Muslims are commanded to be like brothers to one another. This is only achievable if they obey the previous advice given in this narration and strive to fulfill their duty towards other Muslims according to the teachings of Islam, such as helping others in matters of good and warning them from evil matters. Chapter 5 al maida verse 2 And cooperate in righteousness and piety, but do not cooperate in sin and aggression. A narration found in Sahih Bukhari, number 1240, advises that a Muslim should fulfill the following rights of other Muslims. They are to return the Islamic greeting of peace, to visit the sick, to take part in their funeral prayers, and to reply to the sneezer who praises Allah, the exalted. A Muslim must learn and fulfill all the rights other people, especially other Muslims, have over them. Another thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that a Muslim should not wrong, forsake or hate another Muslim. The sins a person commits should be hated, but the sinner should not be as they may sincerely repent at any time. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has warned in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4884, that whoever humiliates another Muslim Allah, the exalted, will humiliate them. And whoever protects a Muslim from humiliation will be protected by Allah, the Exalted. The negative characteristics mentioned in the main narration quoted at the beginning can develop when one adopts pride. According to a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265, pride is when one looks down on others in contempt. The proud person sees themselves as perfect while seeing others as imperfect. This prevents them from fulfilling the rights of others and encourages them to dislike others. Another thing mentioned in the main narration is that true piety is not in one's physical appearance, such as wearing beautiful clothes, but it is an internal characteristic. This internal characteristic manifests outwardly in the form of fulfilling the commands of Allah, the Exalted, refraining from His prohibitions and by facing destiny with patience. This is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 4094, that when the spiritual heart is purified the whole body becomes purified, but when the spiritual heart is corrupt the whole body becomes corrupt. It is important to note that Allah, the Exalted, does not judge based on outward appearances such as wealth, but He considers the intentions and actions of people. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6542. Therefore, a Muslim must strive to adopt internal piety through learning and acting on the teachings of Islam, so that it manifests outwardly in the way they interact with Allah, the Exalted, and the Creation. The next thing mentioned in the main narration under discussion is that it is a sin for a Muslim to hate another Muslim. This hatred applies to worldly things and not disliking others for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. In fact, loving and hating for the sake of Allah, the Exalted, is an aspect of perfecting one's faith. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sunan Abu Dawood, number 4681. 
But even then, a Muslim must show respect to others in all cases and dislike only their sins without actually hating the person. In addition, their dislike must never cause them to act against the teachings of Islam, as this would prove their hatred is based on their own desires and not for the sake of Allah, the Exalted. The root cause of despising others for worldly reasons is pride. It is vital to understand that an atom's worth of pride is enough to take one to hell. This is confirmed in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 265. The next thing mentioned in the main narration is that a Muslim's life, property and honor are all sacred. A Muslim must not violate any of these rights without a just reason. In fact, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, has declared in a narration found in Sunan and Nasa, number 4998, that a person cannot be a true Muslim until they protect other people, including non-Muslims, from their harmful speech and actions. And a true believer is the one who keeps their evil away from the lives and property of others. Whoever violates these rights will not be forgiven by Allah, the Exalted, until their victim forgives them first. If they do not, then justice will be established on Judgment Day, whereby the good deeds of the oppressor will be given to the victim, and if necessary, the sins of the victim will be given to the oppressor. This may cause the oppressor to be hurled into hell. This is warned in a narration found in Sahih Muslim, number 6579. To conclude, a Muslim should treat others exactly how they want people to treat them. This will lead to much blessings for an individual and create unity within their society.